Chapter One of Diana of the Crossways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter One of Diaries and Diarists Touching the Heroine. Among the diaries beginning with the second quarter of our century, there is frequent mention of a lady becoming famous for her beauty and her wit, an unusual combination, in the deliberate syllables of one of the writers, who is, however, not disposed to personal irony when speaking of her. It is otherwise in his case, and a general fling at the sex we may deem pardonable, for doing as little harm to womankind as the stone of an urchin cast upon the bosom of Mother Earth though men must look some day to have it returned to them which is a certainty and indeed full surely will our idle-handed youngster too in his riper season be heard complaining of a strange assault of wanton missiles coming on him he knows not whence for we are all of us distinctly marked to get back what we give even from the thing named inanimate nature the leaves from the diary of henry wilmers are studded with examples of the dinner-table wit of the time not always worth quotation twice for some remarks have their measured distances, many requiring to be a brulee poor point, or within throw of the pistol, to make it hit. In other words, the majority of them are addressed directly to our muscular system, and they have no effect when we stand beyond the range. On the contrary, they reflect somberly on the springs of hilarity in the generation preceding us, with due reserve of credit, of course, to an animal vivaciousness that seems to have wanted so small an incitement. Our old yeomanry farmers, returning to their beds over ferny commons under bright moonlight from a neighbor's harvest home, eased their bubbling breasts with a ready roar not unakin to it. Still, the promptness to laugh is an excellent progenitorial foundation for the wit to come in people, and undoubtedly the diorial record of an imputed piece of wit is witness to the spouting of laughter. This should comfort us while we skim the sparkling passages of the leaves. When a nation has acknowledged that it is as yet but in the fisticuff stage of the art of condensing our purest sense to golden sentences, a readier appreciation will be extended to the gift, which is to strike not the dazzled eyes, the unanticipating nose, the ribs, the sides, and stun us, twirl us, hoodwink, mystify, tickle, and twitch, by dexterities of lingual sparring and shuffling, but to strike roots in the mind, the hesperides of good things. We shall then set a price on the unusual combination. A witty woman is a treasure, a witty beauty is a power. Has she actual beauty, actual wit? Not simply a title material beauty that passes current any pretty flippancy or staggering pretentiousness? Grant the combination, she will appear a veritable queen of her period, fit for homage, at least meriting a disposition to believe the best of her, in the teeth of foul rumor because the well of true wit is truth itself, the gathering of the precious drops of right reason, wisdom's lightning, and no soul possessing and dispensing it can justly be a target for the world, however well armed the world confronting her. Our temporary world, that old credulity and stone-hurling urchin in one, supposes it possible for a woman to be mentally active up to the point of spiritual clarity, and also fleshly vile, a guide to life and a biter at the fruits of death, both open mind and hypocrite. It has not yet been taught to appreciate a quality certifying to sound citizenship as authoritatively as acres of land in the fee simple, or coffers of bonds, shares, and stocks, and a more imperishable guarantee. The multitude of evil reports which it takes for proof are marshaled against her without question of the nature of the victim, her temptress beauty being a sufficiently presumptive delinquent. It does not pretend to know the whole, or naked body, of the facts. It knows enough for its furry dubiousness, and, excepting the sentimental of men, a rocket-headed horde, ever at the heels of fair faces for ignition, and up-starring away at a hint of tearfulness, excepting further by chance a solid champion man, or some generous woman capable of faith in the pelted solitary of her sex, our temporary world blows direct east on her shivering person. The scandal is warrant for that. The circumstances of the scandal emphasize the warrant. And how clever she is! Cleverness is an attribute of the selector missionary lieutenants of Satan. 
We pray to be defended from her cleverness. She flashes bits of speech that catch men in their unguarded corner. The wary stuff their ears, the stolid bid her best sayings rebound on her reputation. Nevertheless, the world, as Christian, remembers its professions, and a portion of it joins the burly in morals by extending to her a rough old charitable mercifulness, better than sentimental ointment, but the heaviest blow she has to bear to a character swimming for life. That the lady in question was much quoted, the diaries and memoirs testify. Hearsay, as well as hearing, was at work to produce the abundance, and it was a novelty in England where, in company, the men are the pointed talkers, and the women conversationally fair Circassians. They are, or they know that they should be. It comes to the same. Happily our civilization has not prescribed the veil to them. The mutes have here and there a sketch or label attached to their names. They are strikingly handsome. They are very good-looking. Occasionally they are noted as extremely entertaining. In what manner is inquired by a curious posterity that in so many matters is left unendingly to jump the empty and gaping figure of interrogation over its own full stop? Great ladies must they be at the web of politics for us to hear them cited discoursing. Henry Wilmers is not content to quote the beautiful Mrs. Warwick. He attempts a portrait. Mrs. Warwick is quite Grecian. She might pose for a statue. He presents her in carpenter's lines, with a dab of school-box colors, effective to those whom the keepsake fashion can stir. She has a straight nose, red lips, raven hair, black eyes, rich complexion, a remarkably fine bust, and she walks well and has an agreeable voice. Likewise, delicate extremities. The writer was created for popularity, had he chosen to bring his art into our literary market. Perry Wilkinson is not so elaborate. He describes her in his recollections as a splendid brune, eclipsing all the blondes coming near her, and, what is more, the beautiful creature can talk. He wondered, for she was young, new to society. Subsequently he is rather ashamed of his wonderment, and accounts for it by not having known she was Irish. She turns out to be Dan Marion's daughter. We may assume that he would have heard if she had any whiff of a brogue. Her sounding of the letter R a trifle scrupulously is noticed by Lady Pennon. And last, not least, the lovely Mrs. Warwick, twenty minutes behind the dinner hour, and really fearing she was late. After alluding to the soft influence of her beauty and ingenuousness on the vexed hostess, the kindly old Marchioness adds that it was no wonder she was late, for just before starting from home she had broken loose from her husband for good, and she entered the room absolutely homeless. She was not the less astonishingly brilliant. Her observations were often so unexpectedly droll I laughed till I cried. Lady Pennon became in consequence one of the staunch supporters of Mrs. Warwick. Others were not so easily won. Perry Wilkinson holds a balance when it goes beyond a question of her wit and beauty. Henry Wilmers puts the case aside and takes her as he finds her. His cousin, the clever and cynical Dorset Wilmers, whose method of conveying his opinions without stating them was famous, repeats on two occasions when her name appears in his pages, handsome, lively, witty, and the stressed repetition of calculated brevity while a fiery scandal was abroad concerning the lady implies weighty substance. The reservation of a constable's truncheon that could legally have knocked her character down to the pavement we have not to ask what he judged. But Dorset Wilmers was a political opponent of the eminent peer who yields the second name to the scandal, and politics in his day flushed the conceptions of men. His short references to that Warwick Dannisburg affair are not verbally malicious. He gets wind of the terms of Lord Dannisburg's will and testament, noting them without comment. The oddness of the instrument in one respect may have served his turn. We have no grounds for thinking him malignant. The death of his enemy closes his allusions to Mrs. Warwick. He was growing ancient, and gout narrowed the circle he whirled in. Had he known this handsome, lively, witty apparition as a woman having political and social views of her own, he would not, one fancies, have been so stingless. Our England exposes a sorry figure in his reminiscences. He struck heavily round and about him, wherever he moved. He had by nature a tarnishing eye that cast discoloration. His unadorned, harsh, substantive statements, 
excluding the adjectives, gave his memoirs the appearance of a body of facts, attractive to the historic muse, which has learnt to esteem those brawny, sturdy giants marching club on shoulder, independent of henchmen, in a preference to your panoplied knights with their puffy squires, once her favourites, and wind filling to her columns, ultimately found indigestible. His exhibition of his enemy Lord Dannisburgh is one of the class of noble portraits we see swinging over inn portals, grossly unlike in likeness. The possibility of the man's doing or saying this, and that adumbrates the improbability. He had something of the character capable of it, too much good sense for the performance. We would think so, and still the shadow is round our thoughts. Lord Dannisburgh was a man of ministerial tact, official ability, pagan morality, an excellent general manager, if no genius in statecraft. But he was careless of social opinion, unbuttoned, and a laugher. We know that he could be chivalrous towards women, notwithstanding the perplexities he brought on them, and this the Dorset diary does not show. His chronicle is less mischievous as regards Mrs. Warwick than the paragraphs of Perry Wilkinson, a gossip presenting an image of perpetual chatter, like the waxen face street advertisements of light and easy dentistry. He has no belief, no disbelief, names the pro-party and the con, recites the case and discreetly, over-discreetly, and pictures the trial, tells the list of witnesses, records the verdict. So the case went, and some thought one thing, some another thing. Only it is reported for positive that a miniature of the incriminated lady was cleverly smuggled over to the jury, and juries sitting upon these eases, ever since their bedazzlement by firing, as you know. And then he relates an anecdote of the husband, said to have been not a bad fellow before he married his Diana. And the naming of the goddess reminds him that the second person in the indictment is now everywhere called the elderly shepherd. But immediately after the bridal bells this husband became sour and insupportable, and either she had the trick of putting him publicly to the wrong, or he lost all shame in playing the churlish domestic tyrant. The instances are incredible of a gentleman. Perry Wilkinson gives us two or three, one on the authority of a personal friend who witnessed the scene, at the Warwick whist table, where the fair Diana would let loose her silvery laugh in the intervals. She was hardly out of her teens, and should have been dancing instead of fastened to a table. A difference of fifteen years in the ages of the wedded pair accounts poorly for the husband's conduct, however solemn a business the game of whist. We read that he burst out at last, with bitter mimicry, yang, 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 and killed the bright laugh, shot it dead. She had outraged the decorum of the square table only while the cards were making. Perhaps her too dead ensuing silence, as of one striving to bring back the throbs up to a slain bird in her bosom, allowed the gap between the wedded pair to be visible, for it was dated back to prophecy as soon as the trumpet proclaimed it. But a multiplication of similar instances, which can serve no other purpose than that of an apology, is a miserable vindication of innocence. The more we have of them, the darker the inference. In delicate situations the chatterer is noxious. Mrs. Warwick had numerous apologists. Those trusting to her perfect rectitude were rarer. The liberty she allowed herself in speech and action must have been trying to our defenders in a land like ours. For here, and able to throw its shadow on our giddy upper circle, the rigor of the game of life, relaxed though it may sometimes appear, would satisfy the statist whist player. She did not wish it the reverse, even when claiming a space for laughter, the breath of her soul, as she called it, and as it may be felt in the early youth of a lively nature. She especially, with her multitude of quick perceptions and imaginative avenues, her rapid summaries, her sense of the comic, demanded this aerial freedom. We have it from Perry Wilkinson that the union of the divergent couple was likened to another union always in a court of law. There was a distinction. Most analogies will furnish one. And here we see England and Ireland changing their parts, until later after the breach, when the Englishman and the Irishwoman resumed a certain resemblance to the yoked islands. Henry Wilmers, I have said, deals exclusively with the wit and the charm of the woman. He treats the scandal as we might do in like manner if her story had not to be told. But these are not reporting columns. Very little of it shall trouble them. The position is faced, and that is all. The position is one of the battles incident to women, their hardest. It asks for more than justice from men, for generosity, our civilization not being yet of the purest. That cry of hounds at her disrobing by law is instinctive. She runs, and they give tongue. She is a creature of the chase. 
let her escape unmangled it will pass in the record that she did once publicly run and some old dogs will persist in thinking her cunninger than the virtuous which would never put themselves in such positions but ply the distaff at home never should reputation of women trail ascent how true and true also that the women of waxwork never do and that the women of happy marriages do not nor the women of holy nunneries nor the women lucky in their arts it is a test of the civilized to see and hear and add no yapping to the spectacle thousands have reflected on a diarist's power to cancel our burial service not alone the cleric's good work is upset by him but the sexton's as well he hawks the grave and transforms the quiet worms busy on a single poor peaceable body into winged serpents that disorder sky and earth with a deadly flight of zigzags like military rockets among the living and if these are given to cry too much to have their tender sentiments considered it cannot be said that history requires the flaying of them a gouty diarist a sheer gossip diarist may thus in the bequest of a trail of reminiscences explode our temples for our very temples have powder in store our treasuries our homesteads alive with dynamitic stuff nay disconcert our inherited veneration dislocate the intimate connection between the tugged flaxen forelock and a title no similar blame is incurred by henry wilmers no blame whatever one would say if he had been less copious or not so subservient in recording the lady's utterances for though the wit of a woman may be terse quite spontaneous as this lady's assuredly was here and there she is apt to spin it out of a museful mind at her toilette or by the lonely fire and sometimes it is imitative admirers should beware of holding it up to the withering glare of print she herself quoting an obscure maximonger says of these lapidary sentences that they have merely the value of chalk eggs which lure the thinker to sit and tempt the vacuous to strain for the like one might add besides flattering the world to imagine itself richer than it is in eggs that are golden henry wilmers notes a multitude of them the talk fell upon our being creatures of habit and how far it was good she said it is there that we see ourselves crutched between love grown old and indifference aging to love critic ears not present at the conversation catch an echo of maxims and aphorisms over channel notwithstanding a feminine thrill in the irony of aging to love the quotation ranks rather among the testimonies to her charm she is fresher when speaking of the war of the sexes for one sentence out of many though we find it to be but the clever literary clothing of a common accusation men may have rounded seraglio point they have not yet doubled cape turk it is war and on the male side ottoman war her experience reduced her to think so positively her main personal experience was in the social class which is primitively venatorial still canine under its polish she held a brief for her beloved ireland she closes a discussion upon irish agitation by saying rather neatly you have taught them it is english as well as common nature to feel an interest in the dog that has bitten you the dog periodically puts on madness to win attention we gather then that england in an angry tremor tries him with water gruel to prove him sane of the irish priest and she was not of his retinue when he was deemed a revolutionary henry wilmers notes her saying be in tune with him he is in the keynote for harmony he is shepherd doctor nurse comforter anecdotist and fun maker to his poor flock and you wonder why they see the burning gateway of their heaven in him conciliate the priest it has been partly done done late when the poor flock have found their doctoring and shepherding at other hands their bulb food and fiddle that she petitioned for to keep them from a complete shaving off their patch of bog and scrub soil without any perception of the tremulous transatlantic magnification of the fiddle and the splitting discord of its latest inspiriting jig and she will not have the consequence of the weariful old irish duel between honor and hunger judged by bread and butter juries she had no need to be beautiful to be tolerable in days when englishmen stood more openly for the strong arm to maintain the union her troop of enemies was of her summoning ordinarily her topics were of wider range and those of a woman who mixed hearing with reading and observation with her musings she has no doleful ejaculatory notes of the kind peculiar to women at war containing one-third of speculative substance and two of sentimental a feminine plea for comprehension and a squire and it was probably the reason 
as there is no reason to suppose an emotional cause, why she exercised her evident sway over the mind of so plain and straightforward an Englishman as Harry Wilmers. She told him that she read rapidly, a great deal at one gulp, and thought in flashes, away with the makers of phrases. She wrote, she confessed, laboriously. The desire to prune, compress, overcharge was a torment to the nervous woman writing under a sharp necessity for payment. Her songs were shot off on the impulsion. Prose was the heavy task. To be pointedly rational, she said, is a greater difficulty for me than a fine delirium. She did not talk as if it would have been so, he remarks. One is not astonished at her appearing an actress to the flat-minded. But the basis of her woman's nature was pointed flame. In the fullness of her history we perceive nothing histrionic. Capricious or enthusiastic in her youth, she never trifled with feeling, and if she did so with some showy phrases and occasionally proffered commonplaces in guilt, as she was much excited to do, her moods of reflection were direct, always large and honest, universal as well as feminine. Her saying that, a woman in the pillory restores the original bark of brotherhood to mankind, is no more than a cry of personal anguish. She has golden apples in her apron. She says of life, when I fail to cherish it in every fiber, the fires within are waning, and that drives like rain to the roots. She says of the world generously, if with tapering idea, from the point of vision of the angels, this ugly monster, only half out of slime, must appear our one constant hero. It can be read maliciously, but abstain. She says of romance, The young who avoid that region escape the title of fool at the cost of a celestial crown. Of poetry, those that have souls meet their fellows there. But she would have us away with sentimentalism. Sentimental people, in her phrase, fiddle harmonics on the strings of sensualism, to the delight of a world gaping for marvels of musical execution rather than for music. For our world is all but a sensational world at present, in maternal travail of a soberer, a braver, a brighter-eyed. Her reflections are thus to be interpreted, it seems to me. She says, the vices of the world's nobler half in this day are feminine. We have to guard against half-conceptions of wisdom, hysterical goodness, and impatient charity, against the elementary state of the altruistic virtues, distinguishable as the sickness and writhings of our egoism to cast its first slough. Idea is there. The funny part of it is our finding it in books of fiction composed for payment. Manifestly, this lady did not chameleon her pen from the color of her audience. She was not of the uniform rank and file marching to drum and fife as gallant interpreters of popular appetite, and going or gone to soundlessness and the icy shades. Touches inward are not absent. To have the sense of the eternal in life is a short flight for the soul. To have had it is the soul's vitality. And also, palliation of a sin is the hunted creature's refuge and final temptation. Our battle is ever between spirit and flesh. Spirit must brand the flesh that it may live. You are entreated to repress alarm. She was by preference light-handed, and her saying of oratory that, it is always the more impressive for the spice of temper which renders it untrustworthy, is light enough. On politics she is rhetorical and swings. She wrote to spur a junior politician, it is the first business of men, the school to mediocrity, to the covetously ambitious a sty, to the dullard his amphitheater, arms of titans to the desperately enterprising, Olympus to the genius. What a woman thinks of women is the test of her nature. She saw their existing posture clearly, yet believed, as men disinclined to do, that they grow. She says that, in their judgments upon women, men are females, voices of the present sexual dilemma. They desire to have a still woman who can make a constant society of her pins and needles. They create, by stoppage, a volcano, and are amazed at its eruptiveness. We live alone, and do not much feel it till we are visited. Love is presumably the visitor. Of the greater loneliness of women, she says, it is due to the prescribed circumspection of their minds, of which they become aware in agitation. Were the walls about them beaten down, they would understand that solitariness is a common human fate, and the one chance of growth like space for timber. As to the sensations of women after the beating down of the walls, she owns that the multitude of timorous would yearn in shivering affright for the old prison nest, according to the sage prognostic of men. 
but the flying of a valiant few would form a vanguard and we are informed that the beginning of a mode of life with women must be in the head equally with men by no means a truism when she wrote also that men do not so much fear to lose the hearts of thoughtful women as their strict attention to their graces the present market is what men are for preserving an observation of still reverberating force generally in her character of the feminine combatant there is a turn of phrase like a dimple near the lips showing her knowledge that she was uttering but a tart measure of the truth she always had too much lambent humor to be the dupe of the passion wherewith as she says we lash ourselves into the persuasive speech distinguishing us from the animals the instances of her drollery are rather hinted by the diarists for the benefit of those who had met her and could inhale the atmosphere at a word drolleries humors reputed witticisms are like odors of roast meats passed with the picking of the joint idea is the only vital breath they have it rarely or it eludes the chronicler to say of the great erratic and forsaken lady a after she had accepted the consolations of bacchus that her name was properly signified in asterisk as she was now nightly an eridane in heaven through her god sounds to us a roundabout with wit somewhere and fun nowhere sitting at the roast we might have thought differently perry wilkinson is not happier in citing her reply to his compliment on the reviewer's unanimous eulogy of her humor and pathos the merry clown and poor pantaloon demanded of us in every work of fiction she says lamenting the writer's compulsion to go on producing them for applause until it is extremist age that knocks their knees we are informed by lady pennon of the most amusing description of the first impressions of a pretty english simpleton in paris and here is an opportunity for ludicrous contrast of the french and english styles of pushing flatteries piping to the charmed animal as mrs warwick terms it in another place but lady pennon was acquainted with the silly woman of the piece and found her amusement in the wonderful truth of that representation diarists of amusing passages are under an obligation to paint us a realistic revival of the time or we miss the relish the odor of the roast and more a slice of it is required unless the humorous thing be preternaturally spirited to walk the earth as one immortal among a number less numerous than the mythic gods he gives good dinners a candid old critic said when asked how it was that he could praise a certain poet in an island of chills and fogs colium sabris in bibris ac nebulis foedem the comic and other perceptions are dependent on the stirring of the gastric juices and such a revival by any of us would be impolitic were it a possible attempt before our systems shall have been fortified by philosophy then may it be allowed to the diarist simply to relate and we can copy from him then ah then moreover will the novelist's art now neither blushless infant nor executive man have attained its majority we can then be voraciously historical honestly transcriptive rose pink and dirty drab will alike have passed away philosophy is the foe of both and their silly cancelling contest perpetually renewed in a shuffle of extremes as it always is where a phantasm falseness reigns will no longer baffle the contemplation of natural flesh smother no longer the soul issuing out of our incessant strife philosophy bids us to see that we are not so pretty as rose pink not so repulsive as dirty drab and that instead of everlastingly shifting those barren aspects the sight of ourselves is wholesome bearable fructifying finally a delight do but perceive that we are coming to philosophy the stride toward it will be a giant's a century a day and imagine the celestial refreshment of having a pure decency in the place of sham real flesh a soul born active wind-beaten but ascending honorable will fiction then appear honorable a fount of life an aid to life quick with our blood why when you behold it you love it and you will not encourage it or only when presented by dead hands worse than that alternative dirty drab your recurring rose pink is rebuked by hideous revelations of the filthy fowl for nature will force her way and if you try to stifle her by drowning she comes up not the fairest part of her uppermost peruse your realists rally your castigators for not having yet embraced philosophy as she grows in the flesh when discreetly tended nature is unimpeachable flower eke yet not too decoratively a flower you must have her with the stem the thorns the roots and the fat bedding of roses 
in this fashion she grew says historical fiction thus does she flourish now would say the modern transcript reading the inner as well as exhibiting the outer and how may you know that you have reached to philosophy you touch her skirts when you share her hatred of the sham decent her derision of sentimentalism you are one with her when but i would not have you a thousand years older get to her if in no other way by the sentimental route that very winding path which again and again brings you round to the point of original impetus where you have to be unwound for another whirl your point of original impetus being the grossly material not at all the spiritual it is most true that sentimentalism springs from the former merely and badly aping the latter fine flower or pinnacle flame spire of sensualism that it is could it do other and accompanying the former it traverses tracts of deserts here and there couching in a garden catching with one hand at fruits with another at colors imagining a secret ahead and goaded by an appetite sustained by sheer gratifications fiddle in harmonics as it may it will have these gratifications at all costs should none be discoverable at once you are at the cave of despair beneath the funereal orb of glaucoma in the thick midst of poignarded slit throat rope dependent figures placarded across the bosom disillusioned infidel agnostic miserimus that is the sentimental route to advancement spirituality does not light it evanescent dreams are its oil lamps often with wick askant in the socket a thousand years you may count full many a thousand by this route before you are one with divine philosophy whereas a single flight of brains will reach and embrace her give you the savor of truth the right use of the senses reality's infinite sweetness for these things are in philosophy and the fiction which is the summary of actual life the within and without of us is prose or verse plodding or soaring philosophy's elect handmaiden to such an end let us bend our aim to work knowing that every form of labor even this flimsiest as you esteem it should minister to growth if in any branch of us we fail in growth there is you are aware an unfailing aboriginal democratic old monster that waits to pull us down certainly the branch possibly the tree and for the welfare of life we fall you are acutely conscious of yonder old monster when he is mouthing at you in politics be wary of him in the heart especially be wary of the disrelish of brain stuff you must feed on something matter that is not nourishing to brains can help constitute nothing but the bodies which are pitched on rubbish heaps brain stuff is not lean stuff the brain stuff of fiction is internal history and to suppose it dull is the profoundest of errors how deep you will understand when i tell you that it is the very football of the holiday afternoon imps below they kick it for pastime they are intelligences perverted the comic of it the adventurous the tragic they make devilish to kindle their oigian hilarity but sharply comic adventurous instructively tragic it is in the interwinding with human affairs to give a flavor of the modern day reviving that of our poet between whom and us yawn time's most hollow jaws surely we owe a little to time to cheer his progress a little to posterity and to our country dozens of writers will be in at yonder yawning breach if only perusers will rally to the philosophic standard they are sick of the woodeny puppetry they dispense as on a race course to the roaring frivolous while if not dozens half dozens gallant pens are alive one can speak of them in the plural i venture to say that they would be satisfied with a dozen for audience for a commencement they would perish of inanition unfed unapplauded amenable to the laws perchance for an assault on their last remaining pair of ears or heels to hold them fast but the example is the thing sacrifices must be expected the example might one hopes create a taste a great modern writer of clearest eye and head now departed capable in activity of presenting thoughtful women thinking men groaned over his puppetry that he dared not animate them flesh though they were with the fires of positive brain stuff he could have done it and he is of the departed had he dared he would for he was titan enough have raised the art and dignity on a level with history to an interest surpassing the narrative of public deeds as vividly as man's heart and brain in their union excel his plain lines of action to eruption the everlasting pantomime suggested by mrs warwick in her exclamation to perry wilkinson is derided not unrighteously by our graver seniors 
They name this art the pasture of idiots, a method for idiotizing the entire population which has taken to reading, and which soon discovers that it can write likewise, that sort of stuff at least. The forecast may be hazarded that if we do not speedily embrace philosophy in fiction, the art is doomed to extinction, under the shining multitude of its professors. They are fast capping the candle, instead, therefore, of obdurating the timid intrusions of philosophy. Invoke her presence, I pray you. History without her is the skeleton map of events. Fiction, a picture of figures modeled on no skeleton anatomy. But each, with philosophy and aid, blooms and is humanly shapely. To demand of us truth to nature, excluding philosophy, is really to bid a pumpkin caper. As much as legs are wanted for the dance, philosophy is required to make our human nature credible and acceptable. Fiction implores you to heave a bigger breast and take her in with this heavenly preservative helpmate, her inspiration and her essence. You have to teach your imagination of the feminine image you have set up to bend your civilized knees to, that it must temper its fastidiousness, shun the grossness of the overdainty, or, to speak in the philosophic tongue, you must turn on yourself, resolutely track and seize that burrower, and scrub and cleanse him, by which process, during the course of it, you will arrive at the conception of the right heroical woman for you to worship, and if you prove to be of some spiritual stature, you may reach to an ideal of the heroical feminine type for the worship of mankind, an image as yet in poetic outline only, on our upper skies. So well do we know ourselves that we one and all determine to know a purer, says the heroine of my columns. Philosophy and fiction tells, among various other matters, of the perils of this intimate acquaintance with a flattering familiar in the purer, a person who more than ceases to be of else to us after his ideal shall have led up men from their flint and arrowhead caverns to intercommunicative daylight. For when the fictitious creature has performed that service of helping to civilize the world, it becomes the most dangerous of delusions, causing first the individual to despise the mass, and then to join the mass in crushing the individual. Wherewith led us to our story, the froth being out of the bottle. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Diana of the Crossways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter Two An Irish Ball. In the assembly rooms of the capital city of the sister island, there was a public ball to celebrate the return to Erin of a British hero of Irish blood after his victorious Indian campaign. A mighty struggle, splendidly ended, and truly it could be said, that all Erin danced to meet him. But this was the pick of the dancing, past dispute, the pick of the supping. Outside those halls, the supping was done in Lazarus fashion, mainly through an excessive straining of the organs of hearing and vision, which imparted the readiness for more, declared by physicians to be the state inducing to sound digestion. Some one spied the figure of the hero at the window and was fed, some only to hear the tale chewed the cut of it, some told of having seen him mount the steps, and sure it was that at an hour of the night, no matter when, and never mind a drop or two of cloud, he would come down them again, and have an Irish cheer to freshen his pillow." for tis Ireland gives England her soldiers, her generals too. Farther away, over field and bog land, the whiskies did their excellent ancient service of watering the dry and drying the damp, to the toast of Lord Larry and God bless him, he's an honor to the old country, and a bit of a sigh to follow. Hints of a story and loud laughter, a drink, a deeper sigh, settling into conversation about the brave Lord Larian's deeds in an Irish regiment he favored, had no taste for the enemy without the backing of his boys, not he. Why, he'd never march to battle, and they not handy, because when he struck, he struck hard, he said, and he has a wound on the right hip and two fingers off his left hand, has bled for England to show her what Irishmen are when they're well treated. The fine old warrior standing at the upper end of the long saloon, tall, straight, gray-haired, 
Marshall, in his aspect and decorations, was worthy to be the flagpole for enthusiasm. His large gray eyes lightened from time to time as he ranged them over the floating couples and dropped a word of inquiry to his aide, Captain Sir Lucan Dunstane, a good model of a cavalry officer, though somewhat a giant, equally happy with his chief in passing the troops of animated ladies under review. He named as many as were known to him, reviewing women exquisitely attired for inspection, all variously and charmingly smiling, is a relief after the monotonous regiments of men. Ireland had done her best to present the hero of her blood an agreeable change, and he too expressed a patriotic satisfaction on hearing that the faces most admired by him were of the native isle. He looked upon one that came whirling up to him on a young officer's arm and swept off into the crowd of tops for a considerable while before he put his customary question. She was returning on the spin when he said, Who is she? Sir Lucan did not know. She's a new bird. She nodded to my wife. I'll ask. He maneuvered a few steps cleverly to where his wife reposed. The information he gathered for the behoof of his chief was that the handsome creature answered to the name of Miss Marion, Irish, aged somewhere between eighteen and nineteen, a dear friend of his wife's, and he ought to have remembered her, but she was a child when he saw her last. Dan Marion died, I remember, about the day of my sailing for India, said the general. She may be his daughter. The bright sinisher rounded up to him in the web of the waltz with her dark eyes for Lady Dunstane and vanished again amongst the twisting columns. He made his way handsomely bumped by an apologetic pair to Lady Dunstane, beside whom a seat was vacated for him, and he trusted she had not over-fatigued herself. Confess, she replied, you are perishing to know more than Lucan has been able to tell you. Let me hear that you admire her. It pleases me, and you shall hear what will please you as much, I promise you, General. I do. Who wouldn't? said he frankly. She crossed the channel expressly to dance here tonight at the public ball in honor of you. Where she appears, the first person falls to second rank and accepts it humbly. That is grandly spoken. She makes everything in the room dust round a blazing jewel. She makes a poet of a soldier, well that you may understand how pleased I am. She is my dearest friend, though she is younger than I, as may be seen. She is the only friend I have. I nursed her when she was an infant. My father and Mr. Dan Marion were chums. We were parted by my marriage and the voyage to India. We have not yet exchanged a syllable. She was snapped up, of course, the moment she entered the room. I knew she would be a taking girl. How lovely, I did not guess. You are right, she extinguishes the others. She used to be the sprightliest of living creatures, and to judge by her letters, that is not faded. She's in the market, General. Lord Larian nodded to everything he heard, concluding with a mock doleful shake of the head. My poorest subaltern, he sighed, in the theatrical but cordially melancholy style of Green Age viewing Cytheria's market. His poorest subaltern was richer than he in the wherewithal to bid for such prizes. What is her name in addition to Marion? Diana Antonia Marion. Tony to me, Diana to the world. She lives over there? In England or anywhere, wherever she is taken in. She will live, I hope, chiefly with me. An honest Irish? Oh, she's Irish. Ah, the general was Irish to the heels that night. Before further could be said, the fair object of the dialogue came darting on a trip of little runs, both hands out, all her face, one tender sparkle of a smile, and her cry proved the quality of her blood. Emmy, Emmy, my heart, my dear Tony, I should not have come but for the hope of seeing you here. Lord Larian rose and received a hurried acknowledgment of his courtesy from the usurper of his place. Emmy, we might kiss and hug. We're in Ireland. I burn to, but you're not still ill, dear. Say no. That Indian fever must have gone. You do look a dash pale, my own. You're tired. One dance has tired me. Why were you so late? 
to give the others a chance, to produce a greater impression by suspense? No, and no, I wrote you, I was with the Pettigrews. We caught the coach, we caught the boat. We were only two hours late for the ball, so we did wonders. And good Mrs. Pettigrew is pining somewhere to complete her adornment. I was in the crush, spying for Emmy, when Mr. Mayer informed me it was the duty of every Irish woman to dance her toes off if she'd be known for what she is, and twirl, a man had me by the waist, and I dying to find you. Who was the man? Not to save these limbs from the lighted stake, could I tell you. You are to perform a ceremonious bow to Lord Larian? Chatter first a little. The plea for chatter was disregarded. It was visible that the hero of the night hung listening and in expectation. He and the beauty were named to one another, and they chatted through a quadrille. Sir Lucan introduced a fellow Herovian of the old days, Mr. Thomas Redworth, to his wife. Our weather prophet, meteorologist, he remarked, to set them going, you remember in India, my pointing to you his name in a newspaper, letter on the subject? He was generally safe for the cricketing days. Lady Dunstane kindly appeared to call it to mind, and she led upon them, queried at times by an abrupt, hm, and I beg pardon, for manifestly his gaze and one of his ears, if not the pair, were given to the young lady discoursing with Lord Larian. Beauty is rare, luckily is it rare, or judging from its effect on men, and the very stoutest of them, our world would be internally more distracted planet than we see to the perversion of business, courtesy, rights of property, and the rest. She perceived an incipient victim of the hundreds she anticipated, and she very tolerantly talked on. The weather and women have some resemblance, they say. Is it true that he who reads the one can read the other? Lord Larian here burst into a brave old laugh, exclaiming, Oh, good! Mr. Redworth knitted his thick brows. I beg pardon? Ah, women? Weather and women? No, the one point more variable in women makes all the difference. Can you tell me what the general laughed at? The honest Englishman entered the trap with promptitude. She said, Who is she, may I ask you? Lady Dunstane mentioned her name. Daughter of the famous Dan Marion, the young lady merited examination for her father's sake. But when reminded of her laughter-moving speech, Mr. Redworth bungled it. He owned he spoiled it, and candidly stated his inability to see the fun. She said St. George's Channel, in a gale, ought to be called St. Patrick's. Something, I missed some point, that quadrille tune, the pastorelle or something. She had experience of the channel last night, Lady Dunstane pursued, and they both, while in seeming converse, caught snatches from their neighbors during a pause of the dance. The sparkling Diana said to Lord Larian, You really decline to make any of us proud women by dancing tonight? The general answered, I might do it on two stilts, I can't on one. He touched his veteran leg. But surely, said she, there's always an inspiration coming to it from its partner in motion if one of them takes the step. He signified a woeful negative. My dear young lady, you say dark things to gray hairs. She rejoined, If we were over in England and you fixed on me the stigma of saying dark things, I should never speak without being thought obscure. It's because you flash too brightly for them. I think it is rather the reminiscence of the tooth that received a stone when it expected candy. Again the general laughed. He looked pleased and warmed. Yes, that's their way, that's their way and he repeated her words to himself, diminishing their importance as he stamped them on his memory, but so heartily admiring the lovely speaker that he considered her wit an honor to the old country and told her so. Irish prevailed up to the boiling point. Lady Dunstane, not less gratified, glanced up at Mr. Redworth, whose brows bore the knot of perplexity over a strong stare. He, too, stamped the words on his memory, to see subsequently whether they had a vestige of meaning. Terrifically precocious, he thought her. Lady Dunstane, in her quick sympathy with her friend, read the adverse mind in his face, 
and her reading of the mind was right, wrong altogether her deduction of the corresponding sentiment. Music was resumed to confuse the hearing of the eavesdroppers. They beheld a quaint spectacle. A gentleman, obviously an Englishman, approached with the evident intention of reminding the beauty of the night of her engagement to him, and claiming her, as it were, in the lion's jaws. He advanced a foot, withdrew it, advanced, withdrew, eager for his prize, not over-enterprising, in awe of the illustrious general she entertained, presumably quite unaware of the pretender's presence, whereupon a voice was heard. Oh, if it was minuetting you meant before the lady, I'd never have disputed your right to perform, sir. For it seemed that there were two claimants in the field, an Irishman and an Englishman, and the former, having a livelier sense of the situation, hung aloof in waiting for her eye. The latter directed himself to strike bluntly at his prey, and he continued minuetting, now rapidly blinking, flushed, angry, conscious of awkwardness, and a tangle incapable of extrication. He began to blink horribly under the raillery of his rival. The general observed him, but as an object remote and minute, a fly or gnat. The face of the brilliant Diana was entirely devoted to him she amused. Lady Dunstane had the faint lines of a decorous laugh on her lips as she said, How odd it is that our men show to such disadvantage in a ballroom. I have seen them in danger, and there they shine first of any, and one is proud of them. They should always be facing the elements or in action. She glanced at the minuet, which had become a petrified figure, still palpitating, bent forward, an interrogative reminder. Mr. Redworth reserved his assent to the proclamation of any English disadvantage. A whiff of Celtic hostility in the atmosphere put him on his mettle. Wherever the man is tried, he said. My lady, the Irish gentleman bowed to Lady Dunstane, I had the honour, Sullivan Smith, at the castle. She responded to the salute and Mr. Sullivan Smith proceeded to tell her, half in speech, half in dots most luminous, of a civil contention between the English gentleman and himself as to the possession of the loveliest of partners for this particular ensuing dance, and that they had simultaneously made a rush from the lower courts, namely their cards to the upper, being the lady, and Mr. Sullivan Smith partly founded his preferable claim on her Irish descent, and on his acquaintance with her eminent defunct father, one of the ever-radiating stars of his quenchless country. Lady Dunstane sympathized with him for his not intruding his claim when the young lady stood pre-engaged, as well as in humorous appreciation of his imaginative logic. There will be dancing enough after supper, she said. If I could score one dance with her, I'd go home supperless and feasted, said he, and that's not saying much among the hordes of hungry troopers tiptoe for the signal to the buffet. See, my lady, the gentleman, as we call him there, he is working his gamut perpetually up to the da capo. Oh, but it's a sheep trying to be a wolf. He's sheep-eyed, and he's wolf-fanged, pathetic and larcenous. Oh, now, who'd believe it? The man is dared. I'd as soon think of committing sacrilege in a cathedral." The man was actually, to quote his indignant rival, breaching the fortress and pointing out to Diana Marion her name on his dirty scrap of paper, a shocking sight when the lady's recollection was the sole point to be aimed at, and the only umpire, as if all of us couldn't have written that and hadn't done it. Mr. Sullivan Smith groaned disgustedly. He hated bad manners, particularly in cases involving ladies, and the bad manners of a Saxon fired his antagonism to the race, individual members of which he boasted of forgiving and embracing, honoring. So the man blackened the race for him, and the race was excused in the man, but his hatred of bad manners was vehement, and would have extended to a fellow countryman. His own were of the antecedent century, therefore venerable." Diana turned from her pursuer with a comic, woeful lifting of the brows at her friend. Lady Dunstane motioned her fan, and Diana came, bending head. "'Are you bound in honour? I don't think I am, and I do want to go on talking with the general. He is so delightful and modest. 
my dream of a true soldier telling me of his last big battle bit by bit to my fishing put off this person for a square dance down the list and take out mr redworth miss diana merlin mr redworth he will bring you back to the general who must not totally absorb you or he will forfeit his popularity diana instantly struck a treaty with a pertinacious advocate of his claims to whom on his relinquishing her mr sullivan smith remarked oh sir the law of it were a lady's concerned you're one for evictions i should guess and the anti-human process it's that letter of the law that stands between you and me and mine and yours but you've got your congee and my blessing on ye it was a positive engagement said the enemy mr sullivan smith derided him in a pretty partner you've picked for yourself when she keeps her positive engagement he besought lady dunstane to console him with a turn she pleaded weariness he proposed to sit beside her and divert her she smiled but warned him that she was english in every vein he interjected irish men and english women though it's puttin the cart before the horse the copper pennies where the gold guineas should be so here's the gentleman who takes the oyster like the lawyer of the fable english is he but we read the last shall be first and english women and irish men make the finest coupling in the universe well you must submit to see an irish woman let out by an englishman said lady dunstan at the same time informing the obedient diana then bestowing her hand on mr redworth to please her friend that he was a schoolfellow of her husband's favor can't help coming by rotation except in very extraordinary circumstances and he was ahead of me with you and takes my due and twould be hard on me if i weren't thoroughly indemnified mr sullivan smith bowed you gave them just the start over the frozen minute for conversation they were total strangers and he doesn't appear a bad sort of fellow for a temporary mate though he's not perfectly sure of his legs and that will excuse to any man leading out such a fresh young beauty of a bright eyes like the stars of a winter night in the frosty season over columkill or where you will so that's in ireland to be sure of the likeness to her her mother was half english of course she was and what was my observation about the coupling dan marion would make her irish all over and she has a vein of spanish blood in her for he had and she's got the colour but you spoke of their coupling or i did oh a man can hold his own with an english roly-poly mate he's not stifled but a woman hasn't his power of resistance to dead weight she's volatile she's frivolous a rattler and gabbler haven't i heard what they say of irish girls over there she marries and it's the end of her sparkling she must choose at home for a perfect harmonious partner lady dunstane expressed her opinion that her couple danced excellently together it's a bitter thing to see if the fellow couldn't dance after leading her out sighed mr sullivan smith i heard of her over there they call her the black pearl and the irish lily because she's dark they rack their poor brains and get the laugh of us and i listen to you said lady dunstane ah if fall england half a quarter the smallest piece of the land were like you my lady i'd be loyal to the finger-nails now is she engaged when i get a word with her she is nineteen or nearly and she ought to have five good years of freedom i think and five good years of serfdom i'd serve to win her a look at him under the eyelids assured lady dunstane that there would be small chance for mr sullivan smith after a life of bondage if she knew her diana in spite of his tongue, his tact, his lively features, and breadth of shoulders. Up he sprang. Diana was on Mr. Redworth's arm. No refreshments, she said, and this is my refreshment, taking the seat of Mr. Sullivan Smith, who ejaculated, I must go and have that gentleman's name. He wanted a foe. You know you are ready to coquette with the general at any moment, Tony, said her friend. Yes, with the general he is a noble old man superb and don't say old man with his uniform and his height and his gray head he's like a glorious october day just before the brown leaves fall diana hummed a little of the air of planksy kelly 
the favourite of her childhood, as Lady Dunstane well remembered. They smiled together at the scenes and times it recalled. Do you still write verses, Tony? I could about him. At one part of the fight he thought he would be beaten. He was overmatched in artillery. And it was a cavalry charge he thundered on them, riding across the field to give the word of command to the couple of regiments, riddled to threads that gain the day. That is life, when we dare death to live. I wonder at men who are men being anything but soldiers. I told you, Madre, my own Emmy, I forgave you for marrying, because it was a soldier. Perhaps a soldier is to be the happy man, but you have not told me a word of yourself. What has been done with the old crossways? The house, you know, is mine, and it's all I have. Ten acres in the house, furnished, and let for less than two hundred a year. Oh, how I long to evict a tenants. They can't have my feeling for the place where I was born. They're people of tolerably good connections, middling wealthy, I suppose, of the name of Warwick. And as far as I can understand, they stick there to be near the Sussex Downs, for a nephew who likes to ride on them. I have a half-engagement, barely legible, to visit them on an indefinite day, and can't bear the idea of strangers, masters in the old house. I must be driven there for shelter, for a roof some month, and I could make a pilgrimage in rain or snow just to dote on the outside of it. That's your Tony. She's my darling. I hear myself speak, but your voice or mine, Madre, it's one soul. Be sure I am giving up the ghost when I cease to be one soul with you, dear and dearest. No secrets, never a shadow of a deception, or else I shall feel I am not fit to live. Was I a bad correspondent when you were in India? Pretty well, copious letters when you did write. I was shy. I knew I should be writing, to Emmy and another, and only when I came to the flow could I forget him. He is very finely built, and I dare say he has a head. I read of his deeds in India and quivered, but he was just a bit in the way. Men are the barriers to perfect naturalness, at least with girls, I think. You wrote to me in the same tone as ever, and at first I had to struggle to reply— and I, who have such pride in being always myself. Two staring semicircles had formed, one to front the hero, the other the beauty. These half-moons imperceptibly dissolve to replenish and become a fixed obstruction. Yes, they look, Diana made answer to Lady Dunstane's comment on the curious impertinence. She was getting used to it, and her friend had a gratification in seeing how little this affected her perfect naturalness. You are often in the world. Dinners, dances, she said. People are kind. Any proposals? Nibbles? Quite heart-free? Absolutely. Diana's unshadowed bright face defied all menace of an eclipse. The block of sturdy gazers began to melt. The general had dispersed his group of satellites by a movement with the mayoress on his arm, construed as the signal for procession to the supper table. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of Diana of the Crossways。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter 3. THE INTERIOR OF MR. REDWORTH AND THE EXTERIOR OF MR. SULLIVAN SMITH It may be as well to take Mr. Redworth's arm. You will escape the crush for you, said Lady Dunstane to Diana. I don't sup. Yes, go. You must eat, and he is handiest to conduct you. Diana thought of her chaperone and the lateness of the hour. She murmured to soften her conscience. Poor Mrs. Pettigrew and once more Mr. Redworth, outwardly imperturbable, was in the maelstrom of a happiness resembling tempest. He talked and knew not what he uttered. To give this matchless girl the best to eat and drink was his business, and he performed it. Oddly, for a man who had no loaded design, marshalling the troops in his active and capacious cranium, he fell upon calculations of his income, present and prospective, while she sat at the table and he stood behind her. 
Others were wrangling for places, chairs, plates, glasses, game pie, champagne. She had them. The lady under his charge to a certainty would have them. So far good, and he had seven hundred pounds per annum. Seven hundred and fifty in a favorable aspect, at a stretch. Yes, the pleasantest thing to me after working all day is an opera of Carini's, she said, in full accord with her taste. And Talio for tenor, certainly. A fair enough sum for a bachelor, four hundred personal income and a prospect of higher dividends to increase it. Three hundred odd from his office, and no immediate prospects of an increase there. No one died there, no elderly martyr for the advancement of his juniors could be persuaded to die. They were too tough to think of retiring. Say, seven hundred and fifty, eight hundred, if the commerce of the country fortified the bank his property was embarked in, or eight fifty, or nine ten. I could call him my poet, also. Mr. Redworth agreed with her taste in poets. His letters are among the best ever written, or ever published, the raciest English I know. Frank, straight out, capital descriptions. The best English letter writers are as good as the French. You don't think so? In their way, of course. I dare say we don't sufficiently cultivate the art. We require the supple tongue a closer intercourse of society gives. Eight or ten hundred. Comfortable enough for a man in chambers. To dream of entering as a householder on that sum in these days would be stark nonsense, and a man too removes from a baronetcy has no right to set his reckoning on debts. If he does, he becomes a sort of meditative assassin. But what were the fates about when they planted a man of the ability of Tom Redworth in a government office? Clearly they intended him to remain a bachelor for life, and they sent him over to Ireland on inspection duty for a month to have sight of an Irish beauty think war the finest subject for poets he exclaimed flatly no i don't think it i think exactly the reverse it brings out the noblest traits in human character i won't own that even it brings out some but under excitement when you have not always the real man pray don't sneer at domestic life well there was a suspicion of disdain yes i can respect the hero military or civil with its distinction that the military hero aims at personal reward he braves wounds and death, interposed Diana. Whereas the civilian hero... Pardon me, let me deny that the soldier hero aims at a personal reward, she again interposed. He gets it, if he is not beaten. And then he is no longer a hero. He is to me. She had a woman's inveterate admiration of the profession of aims. Mr. Redworth endeavored to render practicable an opening in her mind to reason he admitted the grandeur of the poetry of homer we were a few centuries in advance of homer we do not slay damsels for a sacrifice to propitiate celestial wrath nor do we revel in details of slaughter he reasoned with her he repeated stories known to him of civilian heroes and won her assent to the heroical title for their deeds but it was languid or not so bright as the deeds deserved or as the young lady could look, and he insisted on the civilian hero, impelled by some unconscious motive to make her see the thing he thought, also the thing he was, his plain mind and matter-of-fact nature. Possibly she caught a glimpse of that. After a turn of fencing, in which he was impressed by the vibration of her tones when speaking of military heroes, she quitted the table, saying, An argument between one at supper and another handing plates is rather unequal if eloquence is needed as pat said to the constable when his hands were tied you beat me with the fists but my spirit is towering and kicks freely eight hundred a thousand a year two thousand are as nothing in the calculation of a householder who means that the mistress of the house shall have the choicest of the fruits and flowers of the four quarters and thomas redworth had vowed at his first outlook on the world of women that never should one of the sisterhood coming under his charge complain of not having them in profusion Consequently, he was a settled bachelor. In the character of disengaged and unaspiring philosophical bachelor, he reviewed the revelations of her character, betrayed by the beautiful virgin devoted to the sanguine coat. The thrill of her voice in speaking of soldier heroes shot him to the yonder side of a gulf. Not knowing why, for he had no scheme, desperate or other, in his head, the least affrightened of men was frightened by her tastes and by her aplomb, her inoffensiveness in freedom of manner and self-sufficiency, sign of purest breeding, and by her easy, peerless vivacity, her proofs of descent from the blood of Dan Marion, a wildish blood. 
the candor of the look of her eyes in speaking her power of looking forthright at men and looking the thing she spoke and the play of her voluble lips the significant repose of her lips in silence her weighing of the words he uttered for a moment before the prompt apposite reply down to her simple quotation of pat alarmed him he did not ask himself why his manly self was not intruded on his cogitations a mere eight hundred or thousand per annum had no place in that midst he beheld her quietly selecting the position of dignity to suit her an eminent military man or statesman or wealthy nobleman she had but to choose a war would offer her the decorated soldier she wanted a war such are women of this kind the thought revolted him and pricked his appetite for supper he did service by mrs pettigrew to which lady miss marion as she said promoted him at the table and then began to refresh in person standing malkin that's the fellow's name he heard close at his ear mr sullivan smith had drained a champagne glass bottle in hand and was priming the successor to it he cocked his eye at mr redworth's quick stare malkin and now we'll see whether the interior of him is gray or black or tabby or tortoise shell or any other color of the malkin breed he explained to mr redworth that he had summoned mr malkin to answer to him as a gentleman for calling miss marion a jilt the man sir said in my hearing she jilted him and that's to call the lady a jilt there's not a point of difference not a shade i overheard him i happened by the blessing of providence to be near when he named her publicly jilt and it's enough that she's a lady to have me for her champion the same if she had been an eskimo squaw i'll never live to hear a lady insulted you don't mean to say you're the donkey to provoke a duel mr redworth burst out gruffly through turkey and stuffing and an irish lady the young beauty of erin mr sullivan was flowing on he became frigid he politely bowed too, sir, if you haven't the grace to withdraw the offensive term before it cools and can't be obliteration. Fiddle! And go to the deuce! Mr. Redworth cried. Would a soft slap of the cheek persuade you, sir? Try it outside, and don't bother me with the nonsense of that sort at my supper. If I'm struck, I strike back. I keep my pistols for bandits and lawbreakers. Here, said Mr. Redworth, better inspired as to the way of treating an ultra of this isle, touch glasses you're a gentleman and won't disturb good company by and by the pleasing prospect of by and by renewed in mr sullivan smith his composure they touched the foaming glasses upon which in a friendly manner mr sullivan smith proposed that they should go outside as soon as mr redworth had finished supper quite finished supper for the reason that the term donkey affixed to him was like a minister cap of school days ringing bells on his top knot and also that it stuck in his gizzard Mr. Redworth declared the term to be simply hypothetical. If you fight, you're a donkey for doing it, but you won't fight. But I will fight. He won't fight. Then for the honor of your country you must. But I'd rather have him first, and I haven't drunk with him. And it should be a case of necessity to put a bullet or a couple inches of steel through the man you've drunk with. And what's in your favor? She danced with ye. She seemed to take to ye, and the man she has the smallest sugar melting for is sacred, if he's not sweet to me if he retracts hypothetically no but suppositiously certainly then we grasp hands on it it's malkin or nothing said mr sullivan smith swinging his heel moodily to wander in search of the foe how one sane man could name another a donkey for fighting to clear an innocent young lady's reputation passed his rational conception sir lucan hastened to mr redworth to have a talk over old school days and fellows I'll tell you what, said the civilian, there are Irishmen and Irishmen. I've met cool heads and long heads among them, and you and I knew Jack Derry, who was good at most things. But the burlesque Irishman can't be caricatured. Nature strained herself in a fit of absurdity to produce him, and all that art can do is to copy. This was his prelude to an account of Mr. Sullivan Smith, whom, as a specimen, he rejoiced to have met. "'There's a chance of mischief,' said Sir Lucan. "'I know nothing of the man he calls Malkin. "'I'll inquire presently.' "'He talked of his prospects and of the women. "'Fair ones, in his opinion, beside Miss Marion, were parading. "'He sketched two or three of his partners with a broad brush of epithets. "'It won't do for Miss Marion's name to be mixed up in a duel,' said Redworth. "'Not if she's to make her fortune in England,' said Sir Lucan. "'It's probably all smoke.' 
The remark had hardly escaped him when a wreath of metaphorical smoke and fire and no mean report startled the company of supping gentlemen. At the pitch of his voice, Mr. Sullivan Smith denounced Mr. Malkin in presence for a cur masquerading as a cat. And that is not the scoundrel's prime offense. For what d'ye think? He trumps up an engagement to dance with a beautiful lady, and because she can't remember, binds her to an oath for a dance to come. And then, holding her prisoner to them, he sulks. The dirty dog cat goes and sulks, and he won't dance and won't do anything but screech up in corners that he's jilted. He said the word, dozens of gentlemen heard the word, and I demand an apology of Mr. Malkin, or— and none of your guerrier nodding and bravado, Mr. Malkin, at me, if you please. The case is for settlement between gentlemen. The harassed gentleman of the name of Malkin, driven to extremity by the worrying, stood in braced preparation for the English attitude of defense. His tormentor drew closer to him. Mind, I give you warning. If you lay a finger on me, I'll knock you down, said he. Most joyfully, Mr. Sullivan Smith uttered a low, melodious cry. For a specimen of manners in an assembly of ladies and gentlemen, I ask ye. He addressed the ring about him to put his adversary entirely in the wrong before provoking the act of war. And then, as one intending greatly to remonstrate, he was on the point of stretching out his finger to the shoulder of Mr. Malkin, when Redworth seized his arm, saying, I'm your man, me first, you're due to me. Mr. Sullivan Smith beheld the vanishing of his foe in a cloud of faces. Now he was wroth on patently reasonable grounds. He threatened Saxondom. Man up, man down, he challenged the race of short-legged, thick-set, wooden-gated curmudgeons, and let it be pugilism if their white livers shivered at the notion of powder and ball. Redworth, in the struggle to haul him away, received a blow from him. And you've got it. You would have it, roared the Celt. Excuse yourself to the company for a misdirected effort, Redworth said, and he observed generally, no Irish gentleman strikes a blow in good company. But that's true as writ, and I offer excuses. If you'll come along with me and a couple of friends, the thing has been done before by torchlight and neatly. Come along and come alone, said Redworth. A way was cleared for them. Sir Lucan hurried up to Redworth, who had no doubt of his ability to manage Mr. Sullivan Smith. He managed that fine-hearted but purely sensational fellow so well that Lady Dunstane and Diana, after hearing in some anxiety of the hubbub below, beheld them entering the long saloon amicably, with the nods and looks of gentlemen quietly accordant. A little time later, Lady Dunstane questioned Redworth, and he smoothed her apprehensions, delivering himself much to her comfort, thus. In no case would any lady's name have been raised. The whole affair was nonsensical. He's a capital fellow of a kind, capable of behaving like a man of the world and a gentleman. Only he has, or thinks he has, like lots of his countrymen, a raw wound, something that itches to be grazed. Champagne on that. Irishmen, as far as I have seen of them, are like horses, bundles of nerves, and you must manage them, as you do with all nervous creatures, with firmness but good temper. You must never get into a fury of the nerves yourself with them. Spur and whip they don't want. They'll be off with you in a jiffy if you try it. They want the bridle rein. That seems to me the secret of Irish character. We English are not bad horsemen. It's a wonder we blunder so in our management of such a people. I wish you were in a position to put your method to the proof, said she. He shrugged. There's little chance of it. To reward him for his practical discretion, she contrived that Diana should give him a final dance, and the beautiful Gill smiled quickly, responsive to his appeal. He was, moreover, sensible in her look and speech that he had advanced in her consideration to be no longer the mere spinning stick, a young lady's partner, by which he humbly understood that her friend approved him. A gentle delirium enfolded his brain. A householder's life is often begun on eight hundred a year, on less, on much less, sometimes on nothing but resolution to make a fitting income, carving out a fortune. Eight hundred may stand as a superior basis. The sum is a distinct point of vantage. If it does not mean a carriage in Parisian millinery and a station for one of the stars of society, it means at any rate security, and then the heart of the man being strong and sound. Yes, he replied to her. I like my experience of Ireland and the Irish, and better than I thought I should. St. George's Channel ought to be crossed oftener by both of us. I'm always glad of the signal, said Diana. He had implied the people of the two islands. 
he allowed her interpretation to remain personal for the sake of creeping deliciousness that it carried through his blood shall you soon be returning to england he ventured to ask i am lady dunstane's guest for some months then you will sir lucan has an estate in surrey he talks of quitting the service i can't believe it his thrilled blood was chilled she entertained a sentiment amounting to adoration for the profession of arms gallantly had the veteran general and hero held on into the night that the festivity might not be dashed by his departure perhaps to a certain degree to prolong his enjoyment of a flattering scene at last sir lucan had the word from him and came to his wife diana slipped across the floor to her accommodating chaperon whom for the sake of another five minutes with her beloved emma she very agreeably persuaded to walk in the train of lord larian and forth they trooped down a pathway of nodding heads and curtsies resembling oak and birch trees under a tempered gale even to the shedding of leaves for here a turban was picked up by sir lucan there a jewelled earring by the self-constituted attendant mr thomas redworth at the portico rang awakening cheer really worth hearing the rain it rained and hats were formless as in the first conception of the edifice backs were damp boots liquidly musical the pipe of consolation smoked with difficulty with much pulling at the stem but the cheer arose magnificently and multiplied itself touching at the same moment the heavens and diana's heart at least drawing them together for she felt exalted enraptured as proud of her countrymen as of their hero that's the natural shamrock after the artificial she heard mr redworth say behind her she turned and sent one of her brilliant glances flying over him in gratitude for a timely word well said and she never forgot the remark nor he the look end of chapter three chapter four of diana of the crossways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lisa reichert diana of the crossways by george meredith chapter four containing hints of diana's experiences and of what they led to a fortnight after this memorable ball the principal actors of both sexes had crossed the channel back to england and old ireland was left to her rains from above and her undrained bogs below her physical and her mental vapours her ailments and her bog-bred doctors as to whom the governing country trusted they would be silent or discourse humorously the residence of sir lucan dunstan in the county of surrey inherited by him during his recent term of indian services was on the hills where a day of italian sky or better a day of our breezy southwest washed from the showery night gives distantly a tower to view and a murky web not without colour the ever-flying banner of the metropolis the smoke of the city's chimneys if you prefer plain language at a first inspection of the house lady dunstan did not like it and it was advertised to be let and the auctioneer proclaimed it in his dialect her taste was delicate she had the sensitiveness of an invalid twice she read the stalking advertisement of the attractions of copsley and hearing diana call it the plush of speech she shuddered she decided that a place where her husband's family had lived ought not to stand forth meretriciously spangled and daubed like a show-booth at a fair for a bait though the grandiloquent man of advertising letters assured sir lucan that a public agape for the big and gaudy mouthful is in no milder way to be caught as it is apparently the case she withdrew the trumpeting placard retract we likewise banner of the metropolis that plush of speech haunts all efforts to swell and illuminate citizen prose to a princely poetic yet lady dunstan herself could name the bank of smoke when looking northeastward from her summer-house the flag of london and she was a person of the critical mind well able to distinguish between the simple metaphor and the super obese a year of habitation induced her to conceal her dislike of the place in love cat's love she owned here she confessed to diana she would wish to live to her end it seemed remote 
where an invigorating upper air gave new bloom to her cheeks. But she kept one secret from her friend. Copsley was an estate of nearly twelve hundred acres, extending across the ridge of the hills to the slopes north and south. Seven counties rolled their backs under this commanding height, and it would have tasked a pigeon to fly within an hour the stretch of the country visible at the Copsley windows. Sunrise to right, sunset leftward, the borders of the grounds held both flaming horizons. So much of the heavens and of earth is rarely granted to a dwelling. The drawback was the structure, which had no charm, scarce a face. It is written that I should live in barracks, Lady Dunstan said. The colour of it taught white to impose a sense of gloom. Her cat's love of the familiar inside corners was never able to embrace the outer walls. Her sensitiveness, too, was racked by the presentation of so pitiably ugly a figure to the landscape. She likened it to a coarse-featured country wench, whose cleaning and decorating of her countenance makes complexion grin and ruggedness yawn. Dirty, dilapidated, hung with weeds and parasites, it would have been more tolerable. She tried the effect of various creepers, and they were as a staring paint. What it was like then she had no heart to say. One may, however, fall on a pleasurable resignation in accepting great indemnities, as Diana bade her believe, when the first disgust began to ebb. A good hundred over there would think it a paradise for an asylum, she signified London. Her friend bore such reminders meekly. They were readers of books of all sorts, political, philosophical, economical, romantic, and they mixed the diverse reading and thought, after the fashion of the ardently youthful. Romance affected politics, transformed economy, irradiated philosophy. They discussed the knotty question, why things were not done, the things being confessedly to do. And they cut the knot. Men, men calling themselves statesmen, declined to perform that operation because, forsooth, other men objected to have it performed on them and common humanity declared it to be for the common weal. If so, then it is so clearly indicated as a course of action. We shut our eyes against logic and the vaunted laws of economy. They are the knot we cut, or would cut, had we the sword. Diana did it to the tune of Gary Owen, or Planks de Kelly. Oh, for a despot! The cry was for a beneficent despot, naturally, a large-minded benevolent despot. In short, a despot to obey their bidding. Thoughtful young people who think through the heart soon come to this conclusion. The heart is the beneficent despot they would be. He cures those miseries. He creates the novel harmony. He sees all difficulties through his own sanguine hues. He is the musical poet of the problem, demanding merely to have it solved that he may sing. Clear proof of the necessity for solving it immediately. Thus far in their pursuit of methods for the government of a nation, to make it happy, Diana was leader. Her fine ardour and resonance, and more than the convincing ring of her voice, the girl's impassioned rapidity in rushing through any perceptible avenue of the labyrinth, or beating down obstacles to form one, and coming swiftly to some solution, constituted her the chief of the pair of democratic rebels, in questions that clamoured for instant solution. By dint of reading solid writers, using the brains they possessed, it was revealed to them gradually that their particular impatience came, perhaps, of the most earnest desire to get to a comfortable termination of the inquiry. The heart aching for mankind sought a nest for itself. At this point Lady Dunstan took the lead. Diana had to be tugged to follow. She could not accept a perhaps that cast dubiousness on her disinterested championship. She protested a perfect certainty of the single aim of her heart outward. But she reflected. She discovered that her friend had gone ahead of her. The discovery was reached, and even acknowledged, before she could persuade herself to swallow the repulsive truth. Oh, self, 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 are we eternally masking in a domino that reveals your hideous old face, when we could be most positive we had escaped you. Eternally, the desolating answer knelled. Nevertheless, the poor, the starving, the overtaxed in labour, 
they have a right to cry of now now they have and if a cry could conduct us to the secret of aiding healing feeding elevating them we might swell the cry as it is we must lay it on our wits patiently to track and find the secret and meantime do what the individual with his poor pittance can a miserable contribution sighed the girl old self was perceived in the sigh she was haunted after all one must live one's life placing her on a lower pedestal in her self-esteem the philosophy of youth revived her and if the abatement of her personal pride was dispiriting she began to see an advantage in getting inward eyes it's infinitely better i should know it emmy i'm a reptile pleasure here pleasure there i'm always thinking of pleasure i shall give up thinking and take to drifting neither of us can do more than open purses and minds lean if the old crossways had no tenant it would be a purse all mouth and charity is haunted like everything we do only i say with my whole strength yes i am sure in spite of the men professing that they are practical the rich will not move without a goad i have and hold you shall hunger and covet until you are strong enough to force my hand that's the speech of the wealthy and they are christians in name well i thank heaven i'm at war with myself you always manage to strike out a sentence worth remembering tony said lady dunstan at war with ourselves means the best happiness we can have it suited her frail as her health was and her wisdom striving to the spiritual happiness war with herself was far from happiness in the bosom of diana she wanted external life action fields for energies to vary the struggle it fretted and rendered her ill at ease in her solitary rides with sir lucan through a long winter season she appalled that excellent but conventionally minded gentleman by starting nay supporting theories next to profane in the consideration of a landowner she spoke of reform of the repeal of the corn laws as the simple beginning of the grants due to the people she had her ideas of course from that fellow redworth an occasional visitor at copsley and a man might be a donkey and think what he pleased since he had a vocabulary to back his opinions a woman sir lucan held was by nature a mute in politics of the thing called a radical woman he could not believe that she was less than monstrous with a nose he said and doubtless horse teeth hatchet jaws slatternly in the gown slipshod awful as for a girl an unmarried handsome girl admittedly beautiful her interjections echoing a man were ridiculous and not a little annoying now and then for she could be piercingly sarcastic her vocabulary in irony was a quiverful he admired her and liked her immensely complaining only of her turn for unfeminine topics he pardoned her on the score of the petty difference rankling between them in reference to his abandonment of his profession for here she was patriotically wrong-headed everybody knew that he had sold out in order to look after his estates of copsley and dunina secondly and in the first place to nurse and be a companion to his wife he had left her but four times in five months he had spent just three weeks of that time away from her in london no one could doubt of his having kept his pledge although his wife occupied herself with books and notions and subjects foreign to his taste his understanding too he owned and redworth had approved of his retirement had a contempt for soldiering quite as great as yours for civilians i can tell you sir lucan said dashing out of politics to the vexatious personal subject her unexpressed disdain was ruffling mr redworth recommends work he respects the working soldier said diana sir lucan exclaimed that he had been a working soldier he was ready to serve if his country wanted him he directed her to anathematize peace instead of scorning a fellow for doing the duties next about him and the mention of peace fetched him at a bound back to politics he quoted a distinguished tory orator to the effect 
that any lengthened term of peace bred maggots in the heads of the people. Mr. Redworth spoke of it. He translated something from Aristophanes for a retort, said Diana. Well, we're friends, eh? Sir Lucan put forth a hand. She looked at him, surprised at the unnecessary call for a show of friendship. She touched his hand with two tips of her fingers, remarking, I should think so indeed. He deemed it prudent to hint to his wife that Diana Marion appeared to be meditating upon Mr. Redworth. This is a serious misfortune, if true, said Lady Dunstan. She thought so for two reasons. Mr. Redworth generally disagreed in opinion with Diana, and contradicted her so flatly as to produce the impression of his not even sharing the popular admiration of her beauty, and further she hoped for Diana to make a splendid marriage. The nibbles threatened to be snaps and bites. There had been a proposal, in an epistle, a quaint effusion from a gentleman avowing that he had seen her, and had not danced with her, on the night of the Irish ball. He was rejected, but Diana groaned over the task of replying to the unfortunate applicant, so as not to wound him. "'Shall I have to do this often, I wonder?' she said. "'Unless you capitulate,' said her friend. Diana's exclamation, "'May I be heart-free for another ten years!' encouraged Lady Dunstan to suppose her husband quite mistaken. In the spring Diana went on a first pilgrimage to her old home, the Crossways, and was kindly entertained by the uncle and aunt of a treasured nephew, Mr. Augustus Warwick. She rode with him on the downs. A visit of a week humanized her view of the intruders. She wrote almost tenderly of her host and hostess to Lady Dunstan. They had but the one fault of spoiling their nephew. Him she described as a gentlemanly official, a picture of him. His age was thirty-four. He seemed fond of her scenery. Then her pen swept over the downs like a flying horse. Lady Dunstan thought no more of the gentlemanly official. He was a barrister who did not practice. In nothing the man for Diana. Letters came from the house of the Pettigrews in Kent, from London, from Halford Manor in Hertfordshire, from Lockton Grange in Lincolnshire, after which they ceased to be the thrice weekly, and reading the latest of them, Lady Dunstan imagined a flustered quill. The letter succeeding the omission contained no excuse, and it was brief. There was a strange interjection as to the wearyfulness of constantly wandering, like a leaf off the tree. Diana spoke of looking for a return of the dear winter days at Copsley. That was her station. Either she must have had some disturbing experience, or Copsley was dear for a Redworth season, thought the anxious peruser, musing, dreaming, putting together diverse shreds of correspondence, and testing them with her intimate knowledge of Diana's character, Lady Dunstan conceived that the unprotected beautiful girl had suffered a persecution. It might be an insult. She spelt over the names of the guests at the houses. Lord Roxeter was of evil report. Captain Rampon, a turf captain, had the like notoriety. And it is impossible, in a great house, for the hostess to spread her aegis to cover every dame and damsel present. She has to depend on the women being discreet, the men civilized. How brutal men can be, was one of Diana's incidental remarks in a subsequent letter, relating simply to masculine habits. In those days the famous ancestral plea of the passion for his charmer had not been altogether socially quashed down among the provinces, where the bottle maintained a sort of sway, and the beauty which inflamed the sons of men was held to be in coy expectation of violent effects upon their boiling blood. There were, one hears that there still are, remnants of the pristine male who, if resisted in their suing, conclude that they are scorned, and it infuriates them. Some also whose passion for the charmer is an instinct to pull down the standard of the sex, by a bully imposition of sheer physical ascendancy, whenever they see it flying with an air of gallant independence, and some who dedicate their lives to a study of the arts of the lord of reptiles, until they have worked the crisis for a display of him in person. Assault or siege they have achieved their triumphs. They have dominated a frailer system of nerves, 
and a young woman without father or brother or husband to defend her is cryingly a weak one, therefore inviting to such an order of heroes. Lady Dunstan was quick-witted and had a talkative husband. She knew a little of the upper social world of her time. She was heartily glad to have Diana by her side again. Not a word of any serious experience was uttered. Only on one occasion while they conversed, something being mentioned of her tolerance, a flush of swarthy crimson shot over Diana, and she frowned with the outcry, "'Oh, I have discovered that I can be a tigress!' Her friend pressed her hand, saying, "'The cause a good one! "'Women have to fight!' Diana said no more. There had been a bad experience of her isolated position in the world. Lady Dunstan now indulged a partial hope that Mr. Redworth might see in this unprotected beautiful girl a person worthy of his esteem. He had his opportunities, and evidently he liked her. She appeared to take more cordially to him. She valued the sterling nature of the man. But they were a hopeless couple. They were so friendly. Both ladies noticed in him an abstractedness of look, often when conversing, as of a man in calculation. They put it down to an ambitious mind. Yet Diana said then, and said always, that it was he that had first taught her the art of observing. On the whole, the brilliant marriage seemed a fairer prospect for her. How reasonable to anticipate, Lady Dunstan often thought, when admiring the advance of Diana's beauty and queenliness for never did woman carry her head more grandly, more thrillingly make her presence felt, and if only she had been an actress showing herself nightly on a London stage, she would before now have met the superb appreciation, melancholy to reflect upon. Diana regained her happy composure at Copsley. She had, as she imagined, no ambition. The dullness of the place conveyed a charm to a nature recovering from disturbance to its clear, smooth flow. Air, light, books, and her friend, these good things she had, they were all she wanted. She rode, she walked, with Sir Lucan or Mr. Redworth for companion, or with Saturday and Sunday guests, Lord Larian, her declared admirer, among them. Twenty years younger!' he said to her, shrugging with a merry smile drawn a little at the corners to sober sourness. And she vowed to her friend that she would not have had the heart to refuse him. Though, said she, speaking generally, I cannot tell you what a foreign animal a husband would appear in my kingdom. Her experience had wakened a sexual aversion of some slight kind, enough to make her feminine pride stipulate for perfect independence that she might have the calm out of which imagination spreads wing. Imagination had become her broader life, and as such on earth, under such skies, a husband who is not the fountain of it certainly is a foreign animal. He is a discordant note. He contracts the ethereal world, deadens radiancy. He is gross fact, a leash, a muzzle, a harness, a hood whatever is detestable to the free limbs and senses. It amused Lady Dunstan to hear Diana say, one evening when their conversation fell by hazard on her future, that the idea of a convent was more welcome to her than the most splendid marriage. For, she added, as I am sure I shall never know anything of this love they rattle about and rave about, I shall do well to keep to my good single path and I have a warning within me that a step out of it will be a wrong one, for me, dearest. She wished her view of the yoke to be considered purely personal, drawn from no examples and comparisons. The excellent Sir Lucan was passing a great deal of his time in London. His wife had not a word of blame for him. He was a respectful husband, and attentive when present, but so uncertain, owing to the sudden pressure of engagements, that Diana, bound on a second visit to the crossways, doubted whether she would be able to quit her friend, whose condition did not allow of her being left solitary at Copsley. He came nevertheless a day before Diana's appointed departure on her round of visits. She was pleased with him and let him see it, for the encouragement of a husband in the observance of his duties. One of the horses had fallen lame, so they went out for a walk, at Lady Dunstan's request. It was a delicious afternoon of spring, with the full red disk of sun dropping behind the brown beech twigs. 
she remembered long afterward the sweet simpleness of her feelings as she took in the scent of wild flowers along the lanes and entered the woods jaws of another monstrous and blackening experience he fell into the sentimental vein and a man coming from the heated london life to these glorified woods might be excused for doing so though it sounded to her just a little ludicrous in him she played tolerantly second to it she quoted a snatch of poetry and his whole face was bent to her with the petition that she would repeat the verse much struck was this giant ex-dragoon ah how fine grand he would rather hear that than any opera it was diviner yes the best poetry is she assented on your lips he said she laughed i am not a particularly melodious reciter he vowed he could listen to her eternally eternally his face on a screw of the neck and shoulders was now perpetually three-quarters fronting ah she was going to leave yes and you will find my return quite early enough said diana stepping a trifle more briskly his fist was raised on the length of the arm as if in invocation not in the whole of london is there a woman worthy to fasten your shoe buckles my oath on it i look i can't spy one such was his flattering eloquence she told him not to think it necessary to pay her compliments and here of all places they were in the heart of the woods she found her hand seized her waist even then so impossible is it to conceive the unimaginable even when the apparition of it smites us she expected some protesting absurdity or that he had seen something in her path what did she hear and from her friend's husband if stricken idiotic he was a gentleman the tigress she had detected in her composition did not require to be called forth half a dozen words direct sharp as fangs and teeth with the eyes burning over them sufficed for the work of defence the man who swore loyalty to emma her reproachful repulsion of eyes was unmistakable withering as masterful as a superior force on his muscles what thing had he been taking her for she asked it within and he of himself in a reflective gasp those eyes of hers appeared as in a cloud with the wrath above she had the look of a goddess in anger he stammered pleading across her flying shoulder oh horrible loathsome pitiable to hear a momentary aberration her beauty he deserved to be shot could not help admiring quite lost his head on his honour never again once in the roadway and copsley visible she checked her airy pace for breath and almost commiserated the dejected wretch in her thankfulness to him for silence nothing exonerated him but at least he had the grace not to beg secrecy that would have been an intolerable whine of a poltroon adding to her humiliation he abstained he stood at her mercy without appealing she was not the woman to take poor vengeance but oh she was profoundly humiliated shamed through and through the question was i guilty of any lightness anything to bring this on me would not be laid and how she pitied her friend this house her heart's home was now a wreck to her nay worse a hostile citadel the burden of the task of meeting emma with an open face crushed her like very guilt yet she succeeded after an hour in her bedchamber she managed to lock up her heart and summon the sprite of acting to her tongue and features which ready attendant on the suffering female host performed his liveliest throughout the evening to emma's amusement and to the culprit ex dragoon's astonishment in whom to tell the truth of him her sparkle and fun kindled the sense of his being less criminal than he had supposed and with a dim vision of himself as the real proven donkey for not having been a harmless dash more so but to be just as well as penetrating this was only the effect of her personal charm on his nature so it spurred him a moment when it struck this doleful man that to have secured one kiss of those fresh and witty sparkling lips he would endure forfeits pangs anything save the hanging of his culprit's head before his emma reflection washed him clean secrecy is not a medical restorative 
by no means a good thing for the baffled, amorously adventurous cavalier, unless the lady's character shall have been firmly established in or over his hazy, wagging noddle. Reflection informed him that the honourable, generous, proud girl spared him for the sake of the house she loved. After a night of tossing, he rose right heartily repentant. He showed it in the best manner, not dramatically. On her accepting his offer to drive her down to the valley to meet the coach, a genuine illumination of pure gratitude made a better man of him, both to look at and in feeling. She did not hesitate to consent, and he had half expected a refusal. She talked on the way quite as usual, cheerfully, if not altogether so spiritedly. A flash of her matchless wit now and then reduced him to that abject state of man beside the fair person he has treated high cavalierly, which one craves permission to describe as pulp. He was utterly beaten. The sight of Redworth on the valley road was a relief to them both. He had slept in one of the houses of the valley, and spoke of having had the intention to mount to Copsley. Sir Lucan proposed to drive him back. He glanced at Diana, still with that calculating abstract air of his, and he was rallied. He confessed to being absorbed in railways, the new lines of railways projected to thread the land and fast mapping it. "'You've not embarked money in them?' said Sir Lucan. The answer was, "'I have all I possess.' And Redworth, for a sharp instant, set his eyes on Diana, indifferent to Sir Lucan's bellow of stupefaction at such gambling on the part of a prudent fellow. He asked her where she was to be met, where written to during the summer, in case of his wishing to send her news. She replied, Copsley will be the surest. I am always in communication with Lady Dunstan. She coloured deeply. The recollection of the change of her feeling for Copsley suffused her maiden mind. The strange blush prompted an impulse in Redworth to speak to her at once of his venture in railways. But what would she understand of them, as connected with the mighty stake he was playing for? He delayed. The coach came at a trot of the horses, admired by Sir Lucan, round a corner. She entered it, her maid followed, the door banged, the horses trotted. She was off. Her destiny of the crossways tied a knot, barred a gate, and pointed to a new direction of the road on that fine spring morning, when beech buds were near the burst, cowslips yellowed the meadow flats, and skylarks quivered upward. For many long years Redworth had in his memory, for a comment on procrastination and excessive scrupulousness in his calculating faculty, the blue back of a coach. He declined the vacated place beside Sir Lucan, promising to come and spend a couple of days at Copsley in a fortnight, Saturday week. He wanted, he said, to have a talk with Lady Dunstan. Evidently he had railways on the brain, and Sir Lucan warned his wife to be guarded against the speculative mania, and advised the man, if she could. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Diana of the Crossways》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Diana of the Crossways》by George Meredith — Chapter Five Concerning the Scrupulous Gentleman Who Came Too Late On the Saturday of his appointment, Redworth arrived at Copsley with a shade deeper of the calculating look under his thick brows, habitual to him latterly. He found Lady Dunstane at her desk, pen in hand, the paper untouched, and there was an appearance of trouble about her somewhat resembling his own, as he would have observed had he been open-minded enough to notice anything, except that she was writing a letter. He begged her to continue it. He proposed to read a book till she was at leisure. I have to write and scarcely know how, said she, clearing her face to make the guest at home, taking a chair by the fire. I would rather chat for half an hour. She spoke of the weather, frosty but tonic, bad for the last days of hunting, good for the farmer in the country, let us hope. Redworth nodded assent. It might be surmised that he was brooding over those railways in which he had embarked his fortune. Ah! 
those railways. She was not long coming to the wailful exclamation upon them, both to express her personal sorrow at the disfigurement of our dear England, and lead to a little modest offering of a woman's counsel to the rash adventurer, for thus could she serviceably put aside her perplexity a while. Those railways, when would there be peace in the land, where one single nook of shelter and escape from them, and the English, blunt as their senses are to noise and hubbub, would be reveling in hisses, shrieks, puffings, and screeches, so that traveling would become an intolerable affliction. I speak rather as an invalid, she admitted. I conjure up all sorts of horrors, the whistle in the night beneath one's windows, and the smoke of trains defacing the landscape. Hideous accidents, too. They will be wholesale and past help. Imagine a collision. I have borne many changes with equanimity. I pretend to a certain degree of philosophy, but this mania for cutting up land does really cause me to pity those who are to follow us. They will not see the England we have seen. It will be patched and scored, disfigured, a sort of barbarous Maori visage. England in a New Zealand mask. You may call it the sentimental view. In this case, I am decidedly sentimental. I love my country. I do love quiet, rural England. Well... And I love beauty. I love simplicity. All that will be destroyed by the refuse of the towns flooding the land, barring accidents, as Lucan says. There seems nothing else to save us. Redworth acquiesced. Nothing. And you do not regret it, he was asked? Not a bit. We have already exchanged opinions on the subject. Simplicity must go, and the townsman meet his equal in the countryman. As for beauty... I would sacrifice that to circulate gumption. A bushel full of nonsense is talked pro and con. It always is at an innovation. What we are now doing is to take longer and a quicker stride, that is all, and establishing a new field for the speculator. Yes, and I am one, and this is the matter I wanted to discuss with you, Lady Dunstan, said Redworth, bending forward, the whole man devoted to the point of business. She declared she was less complimented. She felt the compliment and trusted her advice might be useful, faintly remarking that she had a woman's head and not less was implied as much as not more, in order to give strength to her prospective opposition. All his money, she heard, was down on the railway table. He might within a year have a tolerable fortune, and, of course, he might be ruined. He did not expect it. Still, he fronted the risks. And now, said he, I come to you for counsel. I am not held among my acquaintances to be a marrying man, as it's called. He paused. Lady Dunstane thought it an occasion to praise him for his considerateness. You involve no one but yourself, you mean? Her eyes shed approval. Still, the day may come. I say only that it may, and the wish to marry is a rosy colouring, equal to a flying chariot in conducting us across difficulties and obstructions to the deed, and then one may have to regret a previous rashness. These practical men are sometimes obtuse. She dwelt on that vision of the future. He listened and resumed. My view of marriage is that no man should ask a woman to be his wife unless he is well able to support her in the comforts, not to say luxuries, she is accustomed to. His gaze had wandered to the desk. It fixed there. That is Miss Marion's writing, he said. The letter, said Lady Dunstane, and she stretched out her hand to press down a leaf of it. Yes, it is from her. Is she quite well? I suppose she is. She does not speak of her health. He looked pertinaciously in the direction of the letter, and it was not rightly mannered. That letter of all others was covert and sacred to the friend. It contained the weightiest of secrets. I have not written to her, said Redworth. He was astonishing. To whom? To Diana? You could very well have done so, only I fancy she knows nothing, has never given a thought to railway stocks and shares, 
She has a loathing for speculation. And speculators, too, I dare say. It is extremely probable, Lady Dunstan spoke with an emphasis, for the man liked Diana and would be moved by the idea of forfeiting her esteem. She might blame me if I did anything dishonorable. She certainly would. She will have no cause. Lady Dunstane began to look as at a cloud charged with remote explosions, and still for the moment she was unsuspecting. But it was a flitting moment. When he went on, and very singularly droning to her ear, the more a man loves a woman, the more he should be positive before asking her that she will not have to consent to a loss of position, and I would rather lose her than fail to give her all, not be sure, as far as a man can be sure, of giving her all I think she's worthy of. Then the cloud shot a lightning flash, and the doors of her understanding swung wide to the entry of a great wonderment. A shock of pain succeeded it. Her sympathy was roused so acutely that she slipped over the reflective rebuke she would have addressed to her silly delusion concerning his purpose in speaking of his affairs to a woman. Though he did not mention Diana by name, Diana was clearly the person. And why had he delayed to speak to her? Because of this venture of his money to make him a fortune, for the assurance of her future comfort. Here was the best of men for the girl, not displeasing to her, a good, strong, trustworthy man, pleasant to hear and to see, only erring in being a trifle too scrupulous in love and a fortnight back she would have imagined he had no chance. And now she knew that the chance was excellent in those days, with this revelation in Diana's letter, which said that all chance was over. The courtship of a woman, he droned away, is in my mind not fair to her until a man has to the full enough to sanction his asking her to marry him. And if he throws all he possesses on a stake to win her, give her what she has a right to claim, he ought, only at present the prospect seems good, he ought, of course, to wait. Well, the value of the stock I hold has doubled, and it increases. I am a careful watcher of the market. I have friends, brokers and railway directors. I can rely on them. Pray, interposed Lady Dunstane, specify, I am rather in a mist, the exact point upon which you do me the honor to consult me. She ridiculed herself for having imagined that such a man would come to consult her upon a point of business. It is, he replied, this. Whether, as affairs stand now with me, I have an income from my office and personal property, say between thirteen and fourteen hundred a year to start with, whether you think me justified in asking a lady to share my lot. Why not? But will you name the lady? Then I may write at once. In your judgment, yes, the lady, I have not named her. I had no right. Besides, the general question first, in fairness to the petitioner, you might reasonably stipulate for more for a friend. She could make a match, as you have said. He muttered of brilliant and the highest, and his humbleness of the honest man enamored touched Lady Dunstan. She saw him now as the man of strength that she would have selected from a thousand suitors to guide her dear friend. She caught at a straw. Tell me, it is not Diana. Diana Marion? As soon as he had said it, he perceived pity, and he drew himself tight for the stroke. She's in love with someone? She is engaged. He bore it well. He was a big-chested fellow and that excruciating twist within of the revolution of the wheels of the brain snapping their course to grind the contrary to that of the heart, was revealed in one short lift and gasp, a compression of the tremendous change he underwent. "'Why did you not speak before?' said Lady Dunstane. Her words were tremulous. "'I should have had no justification. You might have won her,' She could have wept, her sympathy and her self-condolence under disappointment at Diana's conduct joined to swell the feminine flood. The poor fellow's quick breathing and blinking reminded her of cruelty, and in a retrospect, she generalized, to ease her spirit of regret, by hinting it without hurting. 
Women really are not puppets. They are not so excessively luxurious. It's good for young women in the early days of marriage to rough it a little. She found herself groaning, as he had done. He had ears for nothing but the fact. Then I am too late. I have heard it today. She is engaged, positively. Lady Dunstan glanced backward at the letter on her desk. She had to answer the strangest of letters that had ever come to her, and it was from her dear Tony, the baldest intimation of the weightiest place of intelligence which a woman can communicate to her heart's friend. The task of answering it was now doubled. I fear so, I fancy so, she said, and she longed to cast eye over the letter again to see if there might possibly be a loophole behind the line. Then I must make my mind up to it, said Redworth. I think I'll take a walk. She smiled kindly. It will be our secret. I thank you with all my heart, Lady Dunstane. He was not a weaver of phrases in distress. His blunt reserve was eloquent of it to her, and she liked him the better, could have thanked him, too, for leaving her promptly. When she was alone, she took in the contents of the letter at a hasty glimpse. It was of one paragraph, and fired its shot like a cannon with a muzzle at her breast. My own Emmy, I have been asked in marriage by Mr. Warwick, and have accepted him. Signify your approval, for I have decided that it is the wisest thing a waif can do. We are to live at the crossways for four months of the year, so I shall have Dada in his best days and all my youngest dreams, my sunrise and morning dew surrounding me, my old home for my new one. I write in haste to you first, burning to hear from you. Send your blessing to yours in life and death through all transformations. Tony that was all. Not a word of the lover about to be decorated with the title of husband. No confession of love nor a single supplicating word to her friend in excuse for the abrupt decision to so grave a step. Her previous description of him as a gentlemanly official in his appearance conjured him up most distastefully. True, she might have made a more lamentable choice, a silly lordling or a hero of scandals, but if a gentlemanly official was of stabler mold, he failed to harmonize quite so well with the idea of a creature like Tony. Perhaps Mr. Redworth also failed in something. Where was the man fitly to mate her? Mr. Redworth, however, was manly and trustworthy, of the finest Saxon type, in build and in character. He had great qualities, and his excess of scrupulousness was most pitiable. She read, The wisest thing a waif can do. It bore a sound of desperation. Avowedly, Tony had accepted him without being in love. Or was she masking the passion? No. Had it been a case of love, she would have written very differently to her friend. Lady Dunstane controlled the pricking of the wound inflicted by Diana's novel exercise in laconics where the fullest flow was due to tenderness, and dispatched felicitations upon the text of the initial line. Wonders are always happening. She wrote to hide vexation beneath surprise, naturally betraying it. I must hope and pray that you have not been precipitate. Her curiosity to inspect the happiest of man the most genuine part of her letter, was expressed coldly. When she had finished the composition, she perused it and did not recognize herself in her language, though she had been so guarded to cover and wound her Tony dealt their friendship, in some degree injuring their sex, for it might now, after such an example, verily seem that women are incapable of a translucent, perfect confidence, their impulses, caprices, desperations, tricks of concealment, trip a heart-whole friendship. Well, tomorrow, if not today, the tripping may be expected. Lady Dunstane resigned herself sadly to a lowered view of her Tony's character. This was her unconscious act of reprisal. Her brilliant, beloved Tony, dazzling, but in beauty and the gifted mind, stood as one essentially with the common order of women. She wished to be settled. 
Mr. Warwick proposed, and for the sake of living at the crossways she accepted him. She, the lofty scorner of loveless marriages, who had said how many times that nothing save love excused it. She degraded their mutual high standard of womankind. Diana was an eclipse, full three parts. The bulk of the gentlemanly official she had chosen obscured her. But I have written very carefully, thought Lady Dunstane, dropping her answer into the post bag. She had indeed been so careful that to cloak her feelings she had written as another person. Women with Otio's husbands have a task to preserve friendship. Redworth carried his burden through the frosty air at a pace to melt icicles in Greenland. He walked unthinkingly, right ahead to the Red West, as he discovered when pausing to consult his watch. Time was left to return at the same pace and dress for dinner. He swung round and picked up remembrances of sensations he had strewn by the way. She knew these woods. He was walking in her footprints. She was engaged to be married. Yes, his principle never to ask a woman to marry him, never to court her, without bank-book assurance of his ability to support her in cordial comfort, was right. He maintained it, and owned himself a donkey for having stuck to it. Between him and his excellent principle there was war, without the slightest division. Warned of the danger of losing her, he would have done the same again, confessing himself donkey for his pains. The principle was right, because it was due to the woman. His rigid adherence to the principle set him belaboring his donkey ribs as the proper due to himself, for he might have had a chance all through two winters. The opportunities had been numberless, here in this beech wood, near that thorn bush, on the juniper slope, from the corner of chalk and sand in junction to the corner of clay and chalk, all the length of the wooded ridge he had reminders of her presence and his priceless chances, and still the standard of his conduct said no, while his heart bled. He felt that a chance had been, more sagacious than Lady Dunstane, from his not nursing a wound, he divined in the abruptness of Diana's resolution to accept a suitor, a sober reason and a fitting one, for the wish that she might be settled. And had he spoken, if he had spoken to her, she might have given her hand to him, to a dishonorable brute, a blissful brute, but a worse than donkey. Yes, his principle was right, and he lashed with it, and prodded with it, drove himself into the sour wilds where bachelordom crops noxious weeds without a hallowing luminary, and clung to it, bruised and bleeding though he was. The gentleness of Lady Dunstane soothed him during the term of a visit that was rather like purgatory, sweetened by angelical tears. He was glad to go, wretched in having gone. She diverted the incessant conflict between his insubordinate self and his castigating, but avowedly sovereign principle. Away from her, he was the victim of a flagellation so dire that it almost drove him to revolt against the Lord he served and somehow the many memories at Copsley kept him away. Sir Lucan, when speaking of Diana's engagement to that fellow Warwick, exalted her with an extraordinary enthusiasm, exceedingly hard for the silly beast who had lost her to bear. For the present, the place dearest to Redworth of all places on earth was unendurable. Meanwhile, the value of railway investments rose in the market, fast as asparagus heads for cutting, a circumstance that added stings to reflection. Had he been only a little bolder, a little less the fanatical devotee of his rule of masculine honor, less the slave to the letter of success, but why reflect it all? Here was a goodly income approaching, perhaps a seat in Parliament, a station for the airing of his opinions, and a social status for the wife now denied to him. The wife was denied to him. He could conceive of no other the tyrant-ridden, reticent, tenacious creature had thoroughly wedded her in mind. Her view of things had a throne beside his own, even in their differences. He perceived, agreeing or disagreeing, the motions of her brain, as he did with none other of women. And this it is which stamps character on her, divides her from them, upraises, and enspheres. 
he declined to live with any other of the sex before he could hear of the sort of man mr warwick was a perpetual object of his quest the bridal bells had rung and diana antonia marion lost her maiden name she became the mrs warwick of our footballing world why she married she never told possibly in amazement at herself subsequently she forgot the specific reason that which weighs heavily in youth and commits us to desperate action will be a trifle under older eyes to blunter senses a more enlightened understanding her friend emma probed the, for the reason vainly it was partly revealed to redworth by guesswork and a putting together of pieces yet quite luminously as it were by touch of tentacle feelers one evening that he passed with sir lucan dunstane when the lachrymose ex dragoon and son of idlees had rather more than dined end of chapter five recording by sheila blunt chapter six of diana of the crossways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith Chapter 6 The Couple Six months a married woman, Diana came to Copsley to introduce her husband. They had run over Italy, the Italian peninsula, she quoted him in a letter to Lady Dunstan, and were furnishing their London house. Her first letters from Italy appeared to have a little bloom of sentiment, Augustus was mentioned as liking this and that in the land of beauty. He patronized art, and it was a pleasure to hear him speak upon pictures and sculptures. He knew a great deal about them. He is an authority. Her humor soon began to play round the unfortunate man, who did not seem, to the reader's mind, to bear so well a sentimental clothing. His pride was in being very English on the continent, and Diana's instances of his lofty appreciations of the garden of art and nature, and statuesque walk through it, would have been more amusing if her friend could have harmonized her idea of the couple. A description of a bit of a wrangle between us at Lucca, where an Italian postmaster, on a journey of inspection, claimed a share of their carriage, and audaciously attempted entry, was laughable, but jarred. Would she some day lose her relish for ridicule and see him at a distance? He was generous, Diana said she saw fine qualities in him. It might be that he was lavish on his bridal to her. She said he was unselfish, kind, affable with his equals. He was cordial to the acquaintances he met. Perhaps his worst fault was an affected superciliousness before the foreigner, not uncommon in those days. You are to know, dear Emmy, that we English are the aristocracy of Europeans. Lady Dunstan inclined to think we were, nevertheless, in the mouth of a gentlemanly official, the frigid arrogance added a stroke of caricature to his deportment. On the other hand, the reports of him gleaned by Sir Lucan sounded favourable. He was not taken to be preternaturally stiff, nor bright, but a goodish sort of fellow, good horseman, good shot, good character, in short, the average Englishman, excelling as a cavalier, a slayer, and an orderly subject. That was a somewhat elevated standard to the patriotic Emma. Only she would never have stipulated for an average to espouse Diana. Would he understand her and value the best in her? Another and unanswered question was, how could she have condescended to wed with an average? There was, transparently, some secret not confided to her friend. He appeared. Lady Dunstan's first impression of him recurred on his departure. Her unanswered question drummed at her ears, though she remembered that Tony's art in leading him out had moderated her rigidly judicial summary of the union during a greater part of the visit. His requiring to be led out was against him. Considering the subjects, his talk was passable. The subjects treated of politics, pictures, continental travel, our manufacturers, our wealth and the reasons for it, excellent reasons well weighed. He was handsome as men go, 
rather tall, not too stout, precise in the modern fashion of his dress, and the pair of whiskers encasing a colourless depression up to a long, thin, straight nose, and closed lips indicating an aperture. The contraction of his mouth expressed an intelligence in the attitude of the firmly negative. The lips opened to smile. The teeth were faultless. An effect was produced, if a cold one, the colder for the unparticipating northern eyes, eyes of that half-cloud and blue, which make a kind of hueless grey, and are chiefly striking in an authoritative stage. Without contradicting, for he was exactly polite, his look signified a person conscious of being born to command. In fine, an aristocrat among the aristocracy of Europeans. His differences of opinion were prefaced by a, pardon me, and pausing smile of the teeth. Then a succinctly worded sentence or two, a perfect settlement of the dispute. He disliked argumentation. He said so, and Diana remarked it of him, speaking as a wife who merely noted a characteristic. Inside his boundary he had neat phrases, opinions in packets. Beyond it, apparently the world was void of any particular interest. Sir Lucan, whose boundary would have shown a narrower limitation had it been defined, stood no chance with him. Tory versus Whig. He tried a wrestle and was thrown. They agreed on the topic of wine. Mr. Warwick had a fine taste in wine. Their after-dinner sittings were devoted to this and the alliterative cognate theme, equally dear to the gallant ex-dragoon, from which it resulted that Lady Dunstan received satisfactory information in a man's judgment of him. Warwick is a clever fellow and a thorough man of the world, I can tell you, Emmy. Sir Lucan further observed that he was a gentlemanly fellow, a gentlemanly official. Diana's primary dash of portraiture stuck to him, so true it was. As for her, she seemed to have forgotten it. Not only did she strive to show him to advantage by leading him out, she played second to him. Subserviently, fondly, she quite submerged herself, content to be dull if he might shine. And her talk of her husband in her friend's blue chamber boudoir of the golden stars, where they had discussed the world and taken counsel in her maiden days, implied admiration of his merits. He rode superbly. He knew law. He was preparing for any position. He could speak really eloquently. She had heard him at a local meeting. And he loved the old crossways almost as much as she did. He has promised me he will never ask me to sell it, she said, with a simpleness that could hardly have been acted. When she was gone, Lady Dunstan thought she had worn a mask in the natural manner of women trying to make the best of their choice and she excused her poor Tony for the artful presentation of him at her own cost. But she could not excuse her for having married the man. Her first and her final impression likened him to a house locked up and empty, a London house, conventionally furnished and decorated by the upholsterer and empty of inhabitants. How a brilliant and beautiful girl could have committed this rashness was the perplexing riddle the naughtier because the man was idle, and Diana had ambition. She despised and dreaded idleness in men. Empty of inhabitants, even to the ghost, both human and spiritual were wanting. The mind contemplating him became reflectively stagnant. I must not be unjust, Lady Dunstan hastened to exclaim, at a whisper that he had at least proved his appreciation of Tony, whom he preferred to call Diana, as she gladly remembered, and the two were bound together for a moment warmly by her recollection of her beloved Tony's touching little petition, You will invite us again? And then there had flashed in Tony's dear dark eyes that look of their old love drowning. They were not to be thought of separately. She admitted that the introduction to a woman of her friend's husband is crucially trying to him. He may well show worse than he is. Yet his appreciation of Tony, in espousing her, was rather marred by Sir Lucan's report of him as a desperate admirer of beautiful women. It might be for her beauty only, not for her spiritual qualities. At present he did not seem aware of their existence. But to be entirely just, 
she had hardly exhibited them, or a sign of them, during the first interview. And sitting with his hostess alone, he had seized the occasion to say that he was the happiest of men. He said it with the nearest approach of fervour she had noticed. Perhaps the very fact of his not producing a highly favourable impression should be set to plead on his behalf. Such as he was, he was himself, no simulator. She longed for Mr. Redworth's report of him. Her compassion for Redworth's feelings, when beholding the woman he loved, another man's wife, did not soften the urgency of her injunction that he should go speedily and see as much of them as he could, because, she gave her reason, I wish Diana to know she has not lost a single friend through her marriage and is only one the richer. Redworth buckled himself to the task. He belonged to the class of his countrymen, who have a dungeon vault for feelings that should not be suffered to cry abroad, and into this oubliette he cast them, letting them feed as they might, or perish. It was his heart down below, and in no voluntary musings did he listen to it, to sustain the thing. Grimly lord of himself, he stood emotionless before the world. Some worthy fellows resemble him, and they are called deep-hearted. He was dungeon-deep. The prisoner underneath might clamour and leap. None heard him or knew of him. Nor did he ever view the day. Diana's frank, Ah, Mr. Redworth, how glad I am to see you, was met by the calmest formalism of the wish for her happiness. He became a guest at her London house, and his report of the domesticity there, and notably of the lord of the house, pleased Lady Dunstan more than her husband's. He saw the kind of man accurately, as far as men are to be seen on the surface, and she could say assentingly, without anxiety, yes, yes, to his remarks upon Mr. Warwick, indicative of a man of capable head in worldly affairs, commonplace beside his wife. The noble gentleman for Diana was yet unborn, they tacitly agreed. Meantime one must not put a mortal husband to the fiery ordeal of his wife's deserts, they agreed likewise. You may be sure she is a constant friend, Lady Dunstan said for his comfort. And she reminded herself, subsequently, of a shade of disappointment, at his imperturbable rejoinder, I could calculate on it. For though not at all desiring to witness the sentimental fit, she wished to see that he held an image of Diana, surely a woman to kindle poets and heroes, the princes of the race, and it was a curious perversity that the two men she had moved were merely excellent, emotionless, ordinary men with heads for business. Elsewhere, out of England, Diana would have been a woman for a place in song, exalted to the skies. Here she had the destiny to inflame Mr. Redworth and Mr. Warwick, two railway directors, bent upon scoring the country to the likeness of a child's lines of hopscotch in a gravel yard. As with all invalids, the pleasure of living backward was haunted by the tortures it evoked, and two years later she recalled this outcry against the fates. She would then have prayed for Diana to inflame none but such men as those two. The original error was, of course, that rash and most inexplicable marriage, a step never alluded to by the driven victim of it. Lady Dunstan heard rumours of dissensions. Diana did not mention them. She spoke of her husband as unlucky in railway ventures, and of a household necessity for money, nothing further. One day she wrote of a government appointment her husband had received, ending the letter, So there is an end of our troubles. Her friend rejoiced, and afterward, looking back at her satisfaction, saw the dire beginning of them. Lord Dannisburgh's name, as one of the admirers of Mrs. Warwick, was dropped once or twice by Sir Lucan. He had dined with the Warwicks, and met the eminent member of the cabinet at their table. There is no harm in admiration, especially on the part of one of a crowd observing a star. No harm can be imputed when the husband of a beautiful woman accepts an appointment from the potent minister admiring her. So Lady Dunstan thought, for she was sure of Diana in her inmost soul. But she soon perceived in Sir Lucan that the old dog world was preparing to yelp on a scent. He of his nature belonged to the hunting pack, and with a cordial feeling for the quarry, he was quite with his world in expecting to see her run, and readiness to join the chase. 
no great scandal had occurred for several months. The world was in want of it, and he, too, with a very cordial feeling for the quarry, piously hoping she would escape, already had his nose to the ground, collecting testimony in the track of her. He said little to his wife, but his world was getting so noisy that he could not help half-pursing his lips, as with the soft whistle of an innuendo at the heels of it. Redworth was in America, engaged in carving up that hemisphere. She had no source of information but her husband's chance gossip, and London was death to her. And Diana, writing faithfully twice a week, kept silence as to Lord Dannisburgh, except in naming him among her guests. She wrote this, which might have a secret personal signification. We women are the verbs passive of the alliance. We have to learn, and if we take to activity with the best intentions, we conjugate a frightful disturbance. We are to run on lines like the steam trains, or we come to no stations, dashed to fragments. I have the misfortune to know I was born an active. I take my chance. Once she coupled the names of Lord Larian and Lord Dannisburgh, remarking that she had a fatal attraction for antiques. The death of her husband's uncle and illness of his aunt withdrew her to the crossways, where she remained nursing for several months, reading diligently, as her letters showed, and watching the approaches of the destroyer. She wrote like her former self, subdued by meditation in the presence of that inevitable. The world ceased barking. Lady Dunstan could suppose Mr. Warwick to have now a reconciling experience of his wife's noble qualities. He probably did value them more. He spoke of her to Sir Lucan in London with commendation. She is an attentive nurse. He inherited a considerable increase of income when he and his wife were the sole tenants of the crossways, but disliking the house, for reasons hard to explain by a man previously professing to share her attachment to it, he wished to sell or let the place, and his wife would do neither. She proposed to continue living in their small London house rather than be cut off from the crossways, which he said was ludicrous. People should live up to their position, and he sneered at the place and slightly wounded her, for she was open to a wound when the cold fire of a renewed attempt at warmth between them was crackling and showing bits of flame after she had given proof of her power to serve. Service to himself and his relatives affected him. He deferred to her craze for the crossways, and they lived in a larger London house, up to their position, which means ever a trifle beyond it, and gave choice dinner parties to the most eminent. His jealousy slumbered. Having ideas of a seat in Parliament at this period, and preferment superior to the post he held, Mr. Warwick deemed it sagacious to court the potent patron Lord Dannisburgh could be, and his wife had his interests at heart, the fork-tongued world said. The cry revived. Stories of Lord D. and Mrs. W. whipped the hot pursuit. The moral repute of the great Whig lord and the beauty of the lady composed inflammable material. "'Are you altogether cautious?' Lady Dunstan wrote to Diana, and her friend sent a copious reply. "'You have the fullest right to ask your Tony anything, and I will answer as at the judgment bar. You allude to Lord Dannisburgh. He is near what Dada's age would have been, and is, I think I can affirm, next to my dead father and my Emmy, my dearest friend. I love him. I could say it in the streets without shame, and you do not imagine me shameless. Whatever his character in his younger days, he can be honestly a woman's friend, believe me. I see straight to his heart. He has no disguise, and unless I am to suppose that marriage is the end of me, I must keep him among my treasures. I see him almost daily. It is not possible to think I can be deceived, and as long as he does me the honour to esteem my poor portion of brains by coming to me, for what he is good enough to call my counsel, I shall let the world wag its tongue. Between ourselves, I trust to be doing some good. I know I am of use in various ways. No doubt there is a danger of a woman's head being turned, when she reflects that a powerful minister, governing a kingdom, has not considered her too insignificant to advise him. And I am sensible of it. I am, I assure you, dearest, on my guard against it. That would not attach me to him, as his homely friendliness does. 
He is the most amiable, cheerful, benignant of men. He has no feeling of an enemy, though naturally his enemies are numerous and venomous. He is full of observation and humour. How he would amuse you, in many respects accord with you, and I should not have a spark of jealousy. Some day I shall beg permission to bring him to Copsley. At present, during the session, he is too busy, as you know. Me, his crystal spring of wisdom, he can favour with no more than an hour in the afternoon, or a few minutes at night, or I get a pencilled note from the benches of the house, with an anecdote, or news of a division. I am sure to be enlivened. So I have written to you fully, simply, frankly. Have perfect faith in your Tony, who would, she vows to heaven, die rather than disturb it and her heart's beloved. The letter terminated with one of Lord Dannisburgh's anecdotes, exciting to merriment in the season of its freshness, and a postscript of information. Augustus expects a mission, about a month, uncertain whether I accompany him. Mr. Warwick departed on his mission. Diana remained in London. Lady Dunstan wrote, entreating her to pass the month, her favourite time of the violet yielding to the cowslip, at Copsley. The invitation could not be accepted, but the next day Diana sent word that she had a surprise for the following Sunday, and would bring a friend to lunch. If Sir Lucan would meet them at the corner of the road in the valley leading up to the heights, at a stated hour. Lady Dunstan gave the listless baronet his directions, observing, "'It's odd.' She never will come alone since her marriage. Queer, said he, of the serenest absence of conscience, and that there must be something not entirely right going on, he strongly inclined to think. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Diana of the Crossways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter 7. The Crisis. It was a confirmed suspicion when he beheld Lord Dannisburgh on the box of a foreign hand, and the peerless Diana beside him cockaded lackeys in plain livery and the lady's maid to the rear but lord dannisburgh's visit was a compliment and the freak of his driving down under the beams of aurora on a sober sunday morning capital fun so with a gaiety that was kept alive for the invalid emma to partake of it they rattled away to the heights and climbed them and diana rushed to the arms of her friend whispering and cooing for pardon if she startled her guilty of a little whiff of blarney lord dannisburgh wanted so much to be introduced to her and she so much wanted her to know him and she hoped to be graciously excused for thus bringing them together that she might be chorus to them chorus was a pretty fiction on the part of the thrilling and topping voice she was the very radiant diana of her earliest opening day both in look and speech a queenly comrade and a spirit leaping and shining like a mountain water she did not seduce she ravished the judgment was taken captive and flowed with her as to the prank of the visit emma heartily enjoyed it and hugged it for a holiday of her own and doting on the beautiful dark-eyed fresh creature who bore the name of the divine huntress she thought her a true diane in nature step and attributes the genius of laughter superadded none else on earth so sweetly laughed none so spontaneously victoriously provoked the healthful openness her delicious chatter and her museful sparkle in listening equally quickened every sense of life adorable as she was to her friend emma at all times she that day struck a new fountain in memory and it was pleasant to see the great lord's admiration of this wonder one could firmly believe in their friendship and his winning ideas from the abounding bubbling well a recurrent smile beamed on his face when hearing and observing her certain dishes provided at the table were diana's favourites and he relished them 
asking for a second help and remarking that her taste was good in that as in all things they lunched eating like boys they walked over the grounds of copsley and into the lanes and across the meadows of the cowslip rattling chatting enlivening the frosty air happy as children biting to the juices of ripe apples off the tree but tony was the tree the dispenser of the rosy gifts she had a moment of reflection only a moment and emma felt the pause as though a cloud had shadowed them and a spirit had been shut away both spoke of their happiness at the kiss of parting that melancholy note at the top of the wave to human hearts conscious of its enforced decline was repeated by them and diana's eyelids blinked to dismiss a tear you have no troubles emma said only the pain of the good-bye to my beloved said diana i have never been happier never shall be now you know him you think with me i knew you would you have seen him as he always is except when he is armed for battle he is the kindest of souls and soul i say he is the one man among men who gives me notions of a soul in men the eulogy was exalted lady dunstan made a little mouth for oh in correction of the transcendental touch though she remembered their foregone conversations upon men strange beings that they are and understood diana's meaning really really honour diana emphasized her extravagant praise to print it fast hear him speak of ireland would he not speak of ireland in a tone to catch the irishwoman he is past thoughts of catching dearest at that age men are pools of fish or what you will they are not anglers next year if you invite us we will come again but you will come to stay in the winter certainly but i am speaking of one of my holidays they kissed fervently the lady mounted the grey and portly lord followed her sir lucan flourished his whip and emma was left to brood over her friend's last words one of my holidays not a hint to the detriment of her husband had passed the stray beam balefully illuminating her marriage slipped from her involuntarily sir lucan was troublesome with his ejaculations that evening and kept speculating on the time of the arrival of the four in hand in london upon which he thought a great deal depended they had driven out of town early and if they drove back late they would not be seen as all the cacklers were sure then to be dressing for dinner and he would not pass the clubs i couldn't suggest it he said but dennis berg's an old hand but they say he snaps his fingers at tattle and laughs well it doesn't matter for him perhaps but a game of two oh it'll be all right they can't reach london before dusk and the cat's away it's more than ever incomprehensible to me how she could have married that man said his wife i've long since given it up said he diana wrote her thanks for the delightful welcome telling of her drive home to smoke and solitude with a new host of romantic sensations to keep her company she wrote thrice in the week and the same addition of one to the ordinary number next week then for three weeks not a line sir lucan brought news from london that warwick had returned nothing to explain the silence a letter addressed to the crossways was likewise unnoticed the supposition that they must be visiting on a round appeared rational but many weeks elapsed until sir lucan received a printed sheet in the superscription of a former military comrade who had marked a paragraph it was one of those journals now barely credible dedicated to the putrid of the upper circle wherein initials raised sewer lamps as modios lifted a roof leering hideously thousands detested it and fattened their crops on it domesticated beasts of superior habits to the common will indulge themselves with a luxurious role in carrion for a revival of their original instincts society was largely a purchaser the ghastly thing was dreaded 
as a scourge hailed as a refreshment nourished as a parasite it professed undaunted honesty and operated in the fashion of the worm's bread of decay success was its boasted justification the animal world when not rigorously watched will always crown with success the machine supplying its appetites the old dog world took signal from it the one-legged devil god waved his wooden hoof and the creatures in view in the hunt was uproarious why should we seem better than we are down with hypocrisy cried the censor morum spicing the lamentable derelictions of this and that great person male and female the plea of corruption of blood in the world to excuse the public chafing of a grievous itch is not less old than sin and it offers a merry day of frisky truant running to the animal made unashamed by another and another stripped branded and stretched flat sir lucan read of mr and mrs w and a distinguished peer of the realm the paragraph was brief it had a flavour promise of more to come pricked curiosity he read it enraged feeling for his wife and again indignant feeling for diana his third reading found him out he felt for both but as a member of the whispering world much behind the scenes he had a longing for the promised insinuations just to know what they could say or dared say the paper was not shown to lady dunstane a run to london put him in the tide of the broken dam of gossip the names were openly spoken and swept from mouth to mouth of the scandalmongers gathering matter as they flew he knocked at diana's door where he was informed that the mistress of the house was absent more than official gravity accompanied the announcement her address was unknown sir lucan thought it now time to tell his wife he began with a hesitating circumlocution in order to prepare her mind for bad news she divined immediately that it concerned diana and forcing him to speak to the point she had the story jerked out to her in a sentence it stopped her heart the chill of death was tasted in that wavering ascent from oblivion to recollection why had not diana come to her she asked herself and asked her husband who as usual was absolutely unable to say under compulsory squeezing he would have answered that she did not come because she could not fib so easily to her bosom friend and this he thought notwithstanding his personal experience of diana's generosity but he had other personal experiences of her sex and her sex plucked at the bright star and drowned it the happy day of lord dannisburgh's visit settled in emma's belief as the cause of mr warwick's unpardonable suspicions and cruelty arguing from her own sensations of a day that had been like the return of sweet health to her frame she could see nothing but the loveliest freakish innocence in diana's conduct and she recalled her looks her words every fleeting gesture even to the ingenuousness of the noble statesman's admiration of her for the confusion of her unmanly and unworthy husband and emma was nevertheless a thoughtful person only her heart was at the head of her thoughts and led the file whose reasoning was accurate on erratic tracks all night her heart went at fever pace she brought the repentant husband to his knees and then doubted strongly doubted whether she would whether in consideration for her friend she could intercede with diana to forgive him in the morning she slept heavily sir lucan had gone to london early for further tidings she awoke about midday and found a letter on her pillow it was diana's then while her fingers eagerly tore it open her heart the champion writer overnight sank it needed support of facts and feared them not in distrust of that dear persecuted soul but because the very bravest of hearts is of its nature a shivering defender sensitive in the presence of any hostile array much craving for material support until the mind and spirit displace it deputed to second them instead of leading she read by a dull november fog light 
a mixture of the dreadful and the comforting and dwelt upon the latter in abandonment hugged it though conscious of evil and the little that there was to veritably console the close of the letter struck the blow after bluntly stating that mr warwick had served her with a process and that he had no case without suborning witnesses diana said but i leave the case and him to the world ireland or else america it is a guiltless kind of suicide to bury myself abroad he has my letters they are such as i can own to you and ask you to kiss me and kiss me when you have heard all the evidence all that i can add to it kiss me you know me too well to think i would ask you to kiss criminal lips but i cannot face the world in the dark yes not where i am expected to smile and sparkle on pain of incurring suspicion if i show a sign of oppression i cannot do that i see myself wearing a false grin your tony no i do well to go this is my resolution and in consequence my beloved my only true loved on earth i do not come to you to grieve you as i surely should nor would it soothe me dearest this will be to you the best of reasons it could not soothe me to see myself giving pain to emma i am like a pestilence and let me swing away to the desert for there i do no harm i know i am right i have questioned myself it is not cowardice i do not quail i abhor the part of actress i should do it well too well destroy my soul in the performance is a good name before such a world as this worth that sacrifice a convent and self-quenching cloisters would seem to me like holy dew but that would be sleep and i feel the powers of life never have i felt them so mightily if it were not for being called on to act and mew i would stay fight meet a bayonet hedge of charges and rebut them i have my natural weapons and my cause it must be confessed that i have also more knowledge of men and the secret contempt it must be the best of them entertain for us oh and we confirm it if we trust them but they have been at a wicked school i will write from whatever place you shall have letters and constant i write no more now in my present mood i find no alternative between raging and drivelling i am henceforth dead to the world never dead to emma till my breath is gone poor flame i blow at a bedroom candle by which i write in a brown fog and behold what i am though not even serving to write such a tangled scrawl as this i am of no mortal service in two days i shall be out of england within a week you shall hear where i long for your heart on mine your dear eyes you have faith in me and i fly from you i must be mad yet i feel calmly reasonable i know that this is the thing to do some years hence a grey woman may return to hear of a butterfly diana that had her day and disappeared better than a mewing and curtsying simulacrum of the woman i drivel again adieu i suppose i am not liable to capture and imprisonment until the day when my name is cited to appear i have left london this letter and i quit the scene by different routes i would they were one my beloved i have an ache i think i am wronging you i am not mistress of myself and do as something within me wiser than i dictates you will write kindly write your whole heart it is not compassion i want i want you i can bear stripes from you let me hear emma's voice the true voice this running away merits your reproaches it will look like i have more to confess the tigress in me wishes it were i should then have a reckless passion to fold me about and the glory infernal if you name it so and so it would be of suffering for and with some one else as it is i am utterly solitary sustained neither from above nor below except within myself and that is all fire and smoke 
like their new engines i kiss this miserable sheet of paper yes i judge that i have run off a line and what a line which hardly shows a trace for breathing things to follow until they feel the transgression in wreck how immensely nature seems to prefer men to women but this paper is happier than the writer your tony that was the end emma kissed it in tears they had often talked of the possibility of a classic friendship between women the alliance of a mutual devotedness men choose to doubt of she caught herself accusing tony of the lapse from friendship hither should the true friend have flown unerringly the blunt ending of the letter likewise dealt a wound she reperused it perused and meditated the flight of mrs warwick she heard that cry fatal but she had no means of putting a hand on her your tony the coldness might be set down to exhaustion it might yet her not coming to her friend for counsel and love was a positive weight in the indifferent scale she read the letter backwards and by snatches here and there many perusals and hours passed before the scattered creature exhibited in its pages came to her out of the flying threads of the web as her living tony whom she loved and prized and was ready to defend against the world by that time the fog had lifted she saw the sky on the borders of milky cloudfuls her invalid's chill sensitiveness conceived a sympathy in the bearing heavens and lying on her sofa in the drawing-room she gained strength of meditative vision weak though she was to help through ceasing to brood on her wound and herself she cast herself into her dear tony's feelings and thus it came that she imagined tony would visit the crossways where she kept souvenirs of her father his cane and his writing desk and a precious miniature of him hanging above it before leaving england for ever the fancy sprang to certainty every speculation confirmed it had sir lucan been at home she would have dispatched him to the crossways at once the west wind blew and gave her a view of the downs beyond the weald from her southern window she thought it even possible to drive there and reach the place on the chance of her vivid suggestion some time after nightfall but a walk across the room to try her forces was too convincing of her inability she walked with an ebony silver mounted stick a present from mr redworth she was leaning on it when the card of thomas redworth was handed to her End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Diana of the Crossways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter Eight. In which is exhibited how a practical man and a divining woman learn to respect one another you see you are my crutch lady dunstan said to him raising the stick in reminder of the present he offered his arm and hurriedly informed her to dispose of dull personal matter that he had just landed she looked at the clock lucan is in town you know the song alas i scarce can go or creep while lucan is away i do not doubt you have succeeded in your business over there ah now i suppose you have confidence in your success i should have predicted it had you come to me she stood either musing or in weakness and said abruptly will you object to lunching at one o'clock the sooner the better said redworth she had sighed her voice betrayed some agitation strange in so serenely minded a person his partial acquaintance with the herculean sir lucan's reputation in town inspired a fear of his being about to receive admission to the distressful confidences of the wife and he asked if mrs warwick was well the answer sounded ominous with its accompaniment of evident pain i think her health is good had they quarrelled 
he said he had not heard a word of mrs warwick for several months i heard from her this morning said lady dunstan and motioned him to a chair beside the sofa where she half reclined closing her eyes the sight of tears on the eyelashes frightened him she roused herself to look at the clock providence or accident you are here she said i could not have prayed for the coming of a truer man mrs warwick is in great danger you know our love she is the best of me heart and soul her husband has chosen to act on vile suspicions baseless i could hold my hand in the fire and swear she has enemies or the jealous fury is on the man i know little of him he has commenced an action against her he will rue it but she you understand this of women at least they are not cowards in all things but the horror of facing a public scandal my poor girl writes of the hatefulness of having to act the complacent put on her accustomed self she would have to go about a mark for the talkers and behave as if nothing were in the air full of darts oh that general whisper it makes a coup de massue a gale to sink the bravest vessel and a woman must preserve her smoothest front chat smile or else well she shrinks from it i should too she is leaving the country wrong cried redworth wrong indeed she writes that in two days she will be out of it judge her as i do though you are a man i pray you have seen the hunted hare it is our education we have something of the hare in us when the hounds are full cry our bravest our best have an impulse to run by this poor Watt, far off upon a hill shakespeare would have the divine comprehension i have thought all round it and come back to him she is one of shakespeare's women another character but one of his own another hermione i dream of him seeing her with that eye of steady flame the bravest and best of us at bay in the world need an eye like his to read deep and not be baffled by inconsistencies insensibly redworth blinked his consciousness of an exalted compassion for the lady was heated by these flights of advocacy to feel that he was almost seated beside the sovereign poet thus eulogized and he was of a modest nature but you are practical pursued lady dunstan observing signs that she took for impatience you are thinking of what can be done if lucan were here i would send him to the crossways without a moment's delay on the chance the mere chance it shines to me if i were only a little stronger i fear i might break down and it would be unfair to my husband he has trouble enough with my premature infirmities already i am certain she will go to the crossways tony is one of the women who burn to give last kisses to things they love and she has her little treasures hoarded there she was born there her father died there she is three parts irish superstitious in affection i know her so well at this moment i see her there if not she has grown unlike herself have you a stout horse in the stables redworth asked you remember the mare bertha you have ridden her the mare would do and better than a dozen horses he consulted his watch let me mount bertha i engage to deliver a letter at the crossways to-night lady dunstan half inclined to act hesitation in accepting the aid she sought but said will you find your way he spoke of three hours of daylight and a moon to rise she has often pointed out to me from your ridges where the crossway lies about three miles from the downs near a village named storling on the road to braston the house has a small plantation of firs behind it and a bit of river rare for sussex to the right an old straggling red brick house at crossways a stone's throw from a finger-post on a square of green roads to brasted london wickford riddlehurst i shall find it 
Write what you have to say, my lady, and confide it to me. She shall have it, to-night, if she's where you suppose. I'll go, with your permission, and take a look at the mare. Sussex roads are heavy in this damp weather, and the frost coming on won't improve them for a tired beast. We haven't our rails laid down there yet. You made me admit some virtues in the practical, said Lady Dunstane, and had the poor fellow volleyed forth a tale of the everlastingness of his passion for diana it would have touched her far less than his exact memory of diana's description of her loved birthplace she wrote i trust my messenger to tell you how i hang on you i see my ship making for the rocks you break your emma's heart it will be the second wrong step i shall not survive it the threat has made me incapable of rushing to you as i might have had strength to do yesterday i am shattered and wait panting for mr redworth's return with you he has called by accident as we say trust to him if ever heaven was active to avert a fatal mischance it is to-day you will not stand against my supplication it is my life i cry for i have no more time he starts he leaves me to pray like the mother seeing her child on the edge of the cliff come this is your rest my tony and your soul warns you it is right to come do rightly scorn other counsel the cowards come with our friend the one man known to me who can be a friend of women your emma redworth was in the room the mare'll do well he said she has had her feed and in five minutes will be saddled at the door but you must eat dear friend said the hostess i'll munch at a packet of sandwiches on the way there seems a chance and the time for lunching may miss it you understand everything i fancy if she is there one break in the run will turn her back the sensitive invalid felt a blow in his following up the simile of the hunted hare for her friend but it had a promise of hopefulness and this was all that could be done by earthly agents under direction of spiritual as her imagination encouraged her to believe she saw him start after fortifying him with a tumbler of choice bordeaux thinking how tony would have said she was like a lady arming her knight for battle on the back of the mare he passed her window after lifting his hat and he thumped at his breast pocket to show her where the letter housed safely the packet of provision bulged on his hip absurdly and blessedly to her sight not unlike the man in his combination of robust serviceable qualities as she reflected during the later hours until the sun fell on smouldering november woods and sensations of the frost he foretold bade her remember that he had gone forth riding like a huntsman his greatcoat lay on a chair in the hall and his travelling bag was beside it he had carried it up from the valley expecting hospitality and she had sent him forth half naked to weather a frosty november night she called in the groom whose derision of a great coat for any gentleman upon bertha meaning work for the mare appeased her remorsefulness brisby the groom reckoned how long the mare would take to do the distance to storling with a rider like mr redworth on her back by seven brisby calculated mr redworth would be knocking at the door of the three ravens inn at storling when the mare would have a decent grooming and mr redworth was not the gentleman to let her be fed out of his eye more than that brisby had some acquaintance with the people of the inn he begged to inform her ladyship that he was half a sussex man though not exactly born in the county his parents had removed to sussex after the great event and the downs were his first field of horse exercise and no place in the world was like them fair weather or foul summer or winter and snow ten feet deep in the gullies the grandest air in england he had heard say his mistress kept him to the discourse for the comfort of hearing hard bald matter-of-fact and she was amused and rebuked by his assumption 
that she must be entertaining an, an anxiety about master's favorite mare but ah that diana had delayed in choosing a mate had avoided her disastrous union with perhaps a more imposing man to see the true beauty of masculine character in mr redworth as he showed himself to-day how could he have doubted succeeding one grain more of faith in his energy and diana might have been mated to the right husband for her an open-minded clear-faced english gentleman her speculative ethereal mind clung to bald matter-of-fact to-day she would have vowed that it was the soul potentially heroical even brisby partook of the reflected rays and he was very benevolently considered by her she dismissed him only when his recounting of the stages of bertha's journey began to fatigue her and deaden the medical efficacy of him and his like stretched on the sofa she watched the early sinking sun in southwestern cloud and the changes from saffron to intensest crimson the crown of a november evening and one of frost redworth struck on a southward line from chalkridge to sand where he had a pleasant footing in familiar country under beeches that browned the ways along beside a meadow brook fed by the heights through pines and across deep sand ruts to full view of weald and downs diana had been with him here in her maiden days the coloured back of a coach put an end to that dream he lightened his pocket surveyed the land as he munched a favourable land for rails and she had looked over it and he was now becoming a wealthy man and she was a married woman straining the leash his errand would not bear examination it seemed such a desperate long shot he shut his inner vision on it and pricked forward when the burning sunset chopped waves above the juniper and yews behind him he was far on the wheel trotting down an interminable road that the people opposing railways were not people of business was his reflection and it returned persistently for practical men even the most devoted among them will think for themselves their army which is the rational calls them to its banners in opposition to the sentimental and redworth joined it in the abstract summoning the horrible state of the roads to testify against an enemy wanting almost in common humaneness a slip of his excellent stepper in one of the half-frozen pits of the highway was the principal cause of his confusion of logic she was half on her knees beyond the market town the roads were so bad that he quitted them and with the indifference of an engineer struck a line of his own southeastward over fields and ditches favored by a round horizon moon on his left so for a couple of hours he went ahead over rolling fallow land to the meadow flats and a pale shining of freshets then hit on a lane skirting the water and reached an amphibious village five miles from storling he was informed and a clear traverse of lanes not to be mistaken if he kept a sharp eye open the sharpness of his eyes was divided between the sword belt of the starry hunter and the shifting lanes that zigzagged his course below the downs were softly illumined still it amazed him to think of a woman like diana warwick having an attachment to this district so hard of yield mucky featureless fit but for the rails she sided with her friend into testing reasonable women too the moon stood high on her march as he entered storling he led his good beast to the stables of the three ravens thanking her and caressing her the ostler conjectured from the look of the mare that he had been out with the hounds and lost his way it appeared to redworth singularly that near the ending of a wild goose chase his plight was pretty well described by the fellow however he had to knock at the door of the crossways now in the silent night-time a certainly empty house to his fancy he fed on a snack of cold meat and tea standing and set forth clearly directed 
if he kept a sharp eye open hitherto he had proved his capacity and he rather smiled at the repetition of the formula to him of all men a turning to the right was taken one to the left and through the churchyard out of the gate round to the right and on by this route after an hour he found himself passing beneath the bare chestnuts of the churchyard wall of storling and the sparkle of the edges of the dead chestnut leaves at his feet reminded him of the very ideas he had entertained when treading them the loss of an hour strung him to pursue the chase in earnest and he had a beating of the heart as he thought that it might be serious he recollected thinking it so at copsley the long ride and nightfall with nothing in view had obscured his mind to the possible behind the thick obstruction of the probable again the possible waved its marsh light to help in saving her from a fatal step supposing a dozen combinations of the conditional mood became his fixed object since here he was of that there was no doubt and he was not here to play the fool though the errand were foolish he entered the churchyard crossed the shadow of the tower and hastened along the path fancying he beheld a couple of figures vanishing before him he shouted he hoped to obtain directions from these natives the moon was bright the gravestones legible but no answer came back and the place appeared to belong entirely to the dead i frightened them he thought they left a queerish sensation in his frame a ride down to sussex to see ghosts would be an odd experience but an undigested dinner of tea is the very grandmother of ghosts and he accused it of confusing him sight and mind out of the gate now for the turning to the right and on he turned he must have previously turned wrongly somewhere and where a light in a cottage invited him to apply for the needed directions the door was opened by a woman who had never heard tell of the crossways nor had her husband nor any of the children crowding round them a voice within ejaculated crassways and soon upon the grating of a chair an old man whom the woman named her lodger by way of introduction presented himself with his hat on saying i knows the spot they calls crassways and he led redworth understood the intention that a job was to be made of it and submitting said to the right i think he was bidden to come along if he wanted they crassways and from the right they turned to the left and further sharp round and on to a turn where the old man otherwise incommunicative said there down thick their road and a post in the middle i want a house not a post roared redworth spying a bare space the old man dispatched a finger travelling to his knob na there's ne'er a house but that's crassways for four roads if it's crassways you want they journeyed backward they were in such a maze of lanes that the old man was master and redworth vowed to be rid of him at the first cottage this however they were long in reaching and the old man was promptly through the garden gate hailing the people and securing information before redworth could well hear he smiled at the dogged astuteness of a dense-headed old creature determined to establish a claim to his fee they struck a lane sharp to the left your sussex redworth asked him and was answered na nah, the shears emerging from deliberation the old man said i'm a hampshireman a capital county hey the old man heaved his chest once why what has happened to it once it were a capital county i say ha you ask me what have happened to it you take and go and look at it now and down here'll be no better soon i tells em when i was a boy old hampshire was a proud country with the old coaches and the old squires and harvest homes and christmas marryings cutting up the land there's no pride in living there nor anywhere is i sees now you mean the railways 
it's the devil come up and abroad o'er all england exclaimed the melancholy ancient patriot a little cheering was tried on him but vainly he saw with unerring distinctness the triumph of the foul potentate nay his personal appearance in they there puffing engines the country which had produced andrew hedger as he stated his name to be would never show the same old cricketing commons it did when he was a boy old england he declared was done for when redworth applied to his watch under the brilliant moonbeams he discovered that he had been listening to this natural outcry of a decaying and shunted class full three-quarters of an hour and the crossways was not in sight he remonstrated the old man plodded along we must do as we're directed he said further walking brought them to a turn any turn seemed hopeful another turn offered the welcome sight of a blazing doorway on a rise of ground off the road approaching it the old man requested him to bide a bit and stopped the ascent at long strides a vigorous old fellow redworth waited below observing how he joined the group at the lighted door and as it was apparent put his question of the whereabout of the crossways finally in extreme impatience he walked up to the group of spectators they were all and andrew hedger among them the most entranced and profoundly reverent observing the dissection of a pig unable to awaken his hearing redworth jogged his arm and the shake was ineffective until it grew in force i've no time to lose have they told you the way andrew hedger yielded his arm he slowly withdrew his intent fond gaze from the fair outstretched white carcass and with drooping eyelids he said i could eat hog a solid hour he had forgotten to ask the way intoxicated by the aspect of the pig and when he did ask it he was hard of understanding given wholly to his last glimpses redworth got the directions he would have dismissed mr andrew hedger but there was no doing so i'll show ye on to the crossways house the latter said implying that he had already earned something by showing him the crossways post hogs my feed said andrew hedger the gastric springs of eloquence moved him to discourse and he unburdened himself between succulent pauses they've killed him early he's fat and he might have been fatter but he's fat they've got their christmas ready that they have lord you should see the chitterlings and the sausages hung up to and along the beams that's a crown for any dwelling they runs em round the top of the room it's like a may-day wreath in old times home-fed hog they've a treat in store they have and snap your fingers at the world for many a long day and the hams they cure their own hams at that house old style that's what i say of a hog he's good from end to end and beats a christian hollow everybody knows it and owns it redworth was getting tired in sympathy with current conversation he said a word for the railways they would certainly make the flesh of swine cheaper bring a heap of hams into the market but andrew hedger remarked with contempt that he had not much opinion of foreign hams nobody knew what they fed on hog he said would feed on anything where there was no choice they had wonderful stomachs for food only when they had a choice they left the worst for last and home filled them with stuff to make good meat and fat what we call prime bacon as it is not right to damp a native enthusiasm redworth let him dilate on his theme and mused on his boast to eat hog a solid hour which roused some distant classic recollection an odd jumble they crossed the wooden bridge of a flooded stream now you have it said the hog worshipper that may be the house i reckon a dark mass of building with the moon behind it shining in spires through a mound of firs met redworth's gaze the windows all were blind no smoke rose from the chimneys he noted the dusky square of green 
and the finger-post signalling the centre of the four roads andrew hedger repeated that it was the crossways house ne'er a doubt redworth paid him his expected fee whereupon andrew shouldering off wished him a hearty good night and forthwith departed at high pedestrian pace manifestly to have a concluding look at the beloved anatomy there stood the house absolutely empty thought redworth the sound of the gate bell he rang was like an echo to him the gate was unlocked he felt a return of his queer churchyard sensation when walking up the garden path in the shadow of the house here she was born here her father died and this was the station of her dreams as a girl at school near london and in paris her heart was here he looked at the windows facing the downs with dead eyes the vivid idea of her was a phantom presence and cold assuring him that the bodily diana was absent had lady dunstan guessed rightly he might perhaps have been of service anticipating the blank silence he rang the house bell it seemed to set wagging a weariful tongue in the corpse the bell did its duty to the last note and one thin revival stroke for a finish as in days when it responded livingly to the guest he pulled and had the reply just the same with the faint terminal touch resembling exactly a there at the close of a voluble delivery in the negative absolutely empty he pulled and pulled the bell wagged wagged this had been a house of a witty host a merry girl junketing guests a house of hilarious thunders lightnings of fun and fancy death never seemed more voiceful than in that wagging of the bell for conscience sake as became a trusty emissary he walked round to the back of the house to verify the total emptiness his apprehensive despondency had said that it was absolutely empty but upon consideration he supposed the house must have some guardian likely enough an old gardener and his wife lost in deafness double-shotted by sleep there was no sign of them the night air waxed sensibly crisper he thumped the back doors blank hollowness retorted on the blow he banged and kicked the violent altercation with wood and wall lasted several minutes ending as it had begun flesh may worry but it is sure to be worsted in such an argument well my dear lady redworth addressed lady dunstan aloud while driving his hands into his pockets for warmth we've done what we could the next best thing is to go to bed and see what morning brings us the temptation to glance at the wild divinings of dreamy witted women from the point of view of the practical man was aided by the intense frigidity of the atmosphere in leading him to criticize a sex not much used to the exercise of brains and they hate railways he associated them in the matter of intelligence with andrew hedger and company they sank to the level of the temperature in his esteem as regarded their intellects he approved their warmth of heart the nipping of the victim's toes and finger-tips testified powerfully to that round to the front of the house at a trot he stood in moonlight then for involuntarily he now did everything running with a dash up the steps he seized the sullen pendant bell handle and worked it pumpwise till he perceived a smaller bell knob beside the door at which he worked piston wise pump and piston the hurly-burly and the tinkler were created an alarm to scare cat and mouse and cardinal spider all that run or weave in desolate houses with the good result of a certain degree of heat to his frame he ceased panting no stir within nor light that white stare of windows at the moon was undisturbed the downs were like a wavy robe of shadowy grey silk no wonder that she had loved to look on them and it was no wonder that andrew hedger enjoyed prime bacon bacon frizzling fat rashers of real home fed on the fire none of your foreign suggested none of your foreign suggested a genial refreshment and resistance to antagonistic elements nor was it 
granting a sharp night the temperature at least fifteen below zero an excessive boast for a man to say he could go on eating for a solid hour these were notions darting through a half-nourished gentleman nipped in the frame by a severely frosty night truly a most beautiful night she would have delighted to see it here the downs were like floating islands like fairy laden vapours solid as andrew hedger's hour of eating visionary as too often his desire redworth muttered to himself after taking the picture of the house and surrounding country from the sward that he thought it about the sharpest night he had ever encountered in england he was cold hungry dispirited and astoundingly stricken with an incapacity to separate any of his thoughts from old andrew hedger nature was at her pranks upon him he left the garden briskly as to the legs and reluctantly he would have liked to know whether diana had recently visited the house or was expected it could be learnt in the morning but his mission was urgent and he was on the wings of it he was vexed and saddened scarcely had he closed the garden gate when the noise of an opening window arrested him and he called the answer was in a feminine voice youngish not disagreeable but not diana's he heard none of the words but rejoined in a bawl mrs warwick mr redworth that was loud enough for the deaf or the dead the window closed he went to the door and waited it swung wide to him and oh marvel of a woman's divination of a woman there stood diana End of chapter 8chapter nine of diana of the crossways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard diana of the crossways by george meredith chapter nine shows how a position of delicacy for a lady and gentleman was met in simple fashion without hurt to either redworth's impulse was to laugh for very gladness of heart as he proffered excuses for his tremendous alarms and in doing so the worthy gentleman imagined he must have persisted in clamouring for admission because he suspected that if at home she would require a violent summons to betray herself it was necessary to him to follow his abashed sagacity up to the mark of his happy animation had i known it was you said diana bidding him enter the passage she wore a black silk mantilla and was warmly covered she called to her maid danvers whom redworth remembered a firm woman of about forty wrapped like her mistress in head covering cloak scarf and shawl telling her to scour the kitchen for firewood diana led into a sitting-room i need not ask you have come from lady dunstan she said is she well she is deeply anxious you are cold empty houses are colder than out of doors you shall soon have a fire she begged him to be seated the small glow of candlelight made her dark rich colouring orange in shadow house and grounds are open to a tenant she resumed i say good-bye to them to-morrow morning the old couple who are in charge sleep in the village to-night i did not want them here you have quitted the government service i think a year or so since when did you return from america two days back and paid your visit to copsley immediately as early as i could that was true friendliness you have a letter for me i have he put his hand to his pocket for the letter presently she said she divined the contents and nursed her resolution to withstand them danvers had brought firewood and coal orders were given to her and in spite of the opposition of the maid and intervention of the gentleman diana knelt at the grate observing allow me to do this i can lay and light a fire he was obliged to look on she was a woman who spoke her meaning she knelt handling paper firewood and matches like a housemaid danvers proceeded on her mission and redworth 
eyed diana in the first fire glow he could have imagined a madonna on an old black spanish canvas the act of service was beautiful in gracefulness and her simplicity in doing the work touched it spiritually he thought as she knelt there that never had he seen how lovely and how charged with mystery her features were the dark large eyes full on the brows the proud line of a straight nose in right measure to the bow of the lips reposeful red lips shut and their curve of the slumber smile at the corners her forehead was broad the chin of a sufficient firmness to sustain that noble square the brows marked by a soft thick brush to the temples her black hair plainly drawn along her head to the knot revealed by the mantilla fallen on her neck elegant in plainness the classic poet would have said of her hair and dress she was of the women whose wits are quick in everything they do that which was proper to her position complexion and the hour surely marked her appearance unaccountably this night the fair fleshly presence overweighted her intellectual distinction to an observer bent on vindicating her innocence or rather he saw the hidden in the visible owner of such a woman and to lose her redworth pitied the husband the crackling flames reddened her whole person gazing he remembered lady dunstan saying of her once that in anger she had the nostrils of a war-horse the nostrils now were faintly alive under some sensitive impression of her musings the olive cheeks pale as she stood in the doorway were flushed by the fire beams though no longer with their swarthy central rose tropic flower of a pure and abounding blood as it had seemed she was now beset by battle his pity for her and his eager championship overwhelmed the spirit of compassion for the foolish wretched husband dolt the man must be redworth thought and he asked inwardly did the miserable tyrant suppose of a woman like this that she would be content to shine as a candle in a grated lanthorn the generosity of men speculating upon other men's possessions is known yet the man who loves a woman has to the full the husband's jealousy of her good name and a lover that without the claims of the alliance can be wounded on her behalf is less distracted in his homage by the personal luminary to which man's manufacture of balm and incense is mainly drawn when his love is wounded that contemplation of her incomparable beauty with the multitude of his ideas fluttering round it did somewhat shape the personal luminary in redworth he was conscious of pangs the question bit him how far had she been indiscreet or wilful and the bite of it was a keen acid to his nerves a woman doubted by her husband is always and even to her champions in the first hours of the noxious rumour until they had solidified in confidence through service a creature of the wilds marked for our ancient running nay more than a cynical world these latter will be sensible of it the doubt casts her forth the general yelp drags her down she runs like the prey of the forest under spotting branches clear if we can think so but it has to be thought in devotedness her character is abroad redworth bore a strong resemblance to his fellow-men except for his power of faith in this woman nevertheless it required the superbness of her beauty and the contrasting charm of her humble posture of kneeling by the fire to set him on his right track of mind he knew and was sure of her he dispersed the unhallowed fry in attendance upon any stirring of the reptile part of us to look at her with the eyes of a friend and if a little mouse of a thought scampered out of one of the chambers of his head and darted along the passages fetching a sweat to his brows well whatsoever the fact his heart was hers he hoped he could be charitable to women she rose from her knees and said now please give me the letter he was entreated to excuse her for consigning him to firelight when she left the room 
danvers brought in a dismal tallow candle remarking that her mistress had not expected visitors her mistress had nothing but tea and bread and butter to offer him danvers uttered no complaint of her sufferings happy in being the picture of them i'm not hungry said he a plate of andrew hedger's own would not have tempted him the foolish frizzle of bacon sang in his ears as he walked from end to end of the room an illusion of his fancy pricked by a frost-edged appetite but the anticipated contest with diana checked and numbed the craving was warwick a man to proceed to extremities on a mad suspicion what kind of proof had he redworth summoned the portrait of mr warwick before him and beheld a sweeping of closed eyes in cloud a long upper lip in cloud the rest of him was all cloud as usual with these conjurations of a face the index of the nature conceived by him displayed itself and no more but he took it for the whole physiognomy and pronounced of the husband thus delineated that those closed eyes of the long upper lip would both suspect and proceed madly he was invited by danvers to enter the dining-room there diana joined him the best of a dinner on bread and butter is that one is ready for supper soon after it she said swimming to the tea-tray you have dined at the inn he replied the three ravens when my father's guests from london flooded the crossways the three ravens provided the overflow with beds on nights like this i have got up and scraped the frost from my window-panes to see them step into the old fly singing some song of his the inn had a good reputation for hospitality in those days i hope they treated you well excellently said redworth taking an enormous mouthful while his heart sank to see that she who smiled to encourage his eating had been weeping but she also consumed her bread and butter that poor maid of mine is an instance of a woman able to do things against the grain she said danvers is a foster child of luxury she loves it great houses plentiful meals and the crowd of twinkling footmen's calves yet you see her here in a desolate house consenting to cold and i know not what terrors of ghosts poor soul i have some mysterious attraction for her she would not let me come alone i should have had to hire some old storling grenham or retain the tattling keepers of the house she loves her native country too and disdains the foreigner my tea you may trust redworth had not a doubt of it he was becoming a tea-taster the merit of warmth pertained to the beverage i think you get your tea from scoppins in the city he said that was the warehouse for mrs warwick's tea they conversed of teas the black the green the mixtures each thinking of the attack to come and the defense meantime the cut bread and butter having flown redworth attacked the loaf he apologized oh pay me a practical compliment diana said and looked really happy at his unfeigned relish of her simple fare she had given him one opportunity in speaking of her maid's love of native country but it came too early they say that bread and butter is fattening he remarked you preserve the mean said she he admitted that his health was good for some little time to his vexation at the absurdity she kept him talking of himself so flowing was she and so sweet the motion of her mouth in utterance that he followed her lead and he said odd things and corrected them he had to describe his ride to her yes the view of the downs from dewhurst she exclaimed or any point along the ridge emma and i once drove there in summer with clotted cream from her dairy and we bought fresh plucked whortleberries and stewed them in a hollow of the furzes and ate them with ground biscuits and the clotted cream iced and thought it a luncheon for seraphs then you dropped to the road round under the sand heights and meditated railways just a notion or two you have been very successful in america successful perhaps we exclude extremes in our calculations of the still problematical i am sure said she 
you always have faith in your calculations her innocent archness dealt him a stab sharper than any he had known since the day of his hearing of her engagement he muttered of his calculations being human he was as much of a fool as other men more oh no said she positively i cannot think it i know it mr redworth you will never persuade me to believe it he knocked a rising groan on the head and rejoined i hope i may not have to say so to-night diana felt the edge of the dirt and meditating railways you scored out poor land of herds and flocks and night fell and the moon sprang up and on you came it was clever of you to find your way by the moonbeams that's about the one thing i seem fit for but what delusion is this in the mind of a man succeeding in everything he does cried diana curious despite her wariness is there to be the revelation of a hair shirt ultimately a journal of confessions you succeeded in everything you aimed at and broke your heart over one chance miss my heart is not of the stuff to break he said and laughed off her fortuitous thrust straight into it another cup yes i came by night said she and cleverly found your way and dined at the three ravens and walked to the crossways and met no ghosts on the contrary or at least i saw a couple tell me of them we breathe them here we sell them periodically to the newspapers well i started them in their natal locality i saw them going down the churchyard and bellowed after them with all my lungs i wanted directions to the crossways i had missed my way at some turning in an instant they were vapour diana smiled it was indeed a voice to startle delicate apparitions so do roar hyrcanian tigers pyramus and thisbe slain lions one of your ghosts carried a loaf of bread and dropped it in fright one carried a pound of fresh butter for home consumption they were in the churchyard for one in passing to kneel at her father's grave and kiss his tombstone she bowed her head forgetful of her guard the pause presented an opening redworth left his chair and walked to the mantelpiece it was easier to him to speak not facing her you have read lady dunstan's letter he began she nodded i have can you resist her appeal to you i must she is not in a condition to bear it well you will pardon me mrs warwick fully fully i venture to offer merely practical advice you have thought of it all but have not felt it in these cases the one thing to do is to make a stand lady dunstane has a clear head she sees what has to be endured by you consider she appeals to me to bring you her letter would she have chosen me or any man for her messenger if it had not appeared to her a matter of life and death you count me among your friends one of the truest here are two then and your own good sense for i do not believe it to be a question of courage he has commenced let him carry it out said diana her desperation could have added the cry and give me freedom that was the secret in her heart she had struck on the hope for the detested yoke to be broken at any cost i decline to meet his charges i despise them if my friends have faith in me and they may i want nothing more well i won't talk commonplaces about the world said redworth we can none of us afford to have it against us consider a moment to your friends you are the diana marion they knew and they will not suffer an injury to your good name without a struggle but if you fly you leave the dearest you have to the whole brunt of it they will if they love me they will but think of the shock to her lady dunstan reads you not quite no not if she even wishes me to stay said diana he was too intent on his pleading to perceive a signification she reads you as clearly in the dark as if you were present with her oh why am i not ten years older diana cried and tried to face round to him and stopped paralyzed 
ten years older i could discuss my situation as an old woman of the world and use my wits to defend myself and then you would not dream of flight before it no she does not read me no she saw that i might come to the crossways she no one but myself can see the wisdom of my holding aloof in contempt of this baseness and of allowing her to sink under that which your presence would arrest her strength will not support it emma oh cruel diana sprang up to give play to her limbs she dropped on another chair go i must i cannot turn back she saw my old attachment to this place it was not difficult to guess who but i can see the wisest course for me it comes to this that the blow aimed at you in your absence will strike her and mortally said redworth then i say it is terrible to have a friend said diana with her bosom heaving friendship i fancy means one heart between two his unstressed observation hit a bell in her head and set it reverberating she and emma had spoken written the very words she drew forth her emma's letter from under her left breast and read some half-blinded lines redworth immediately prepared to leave her to her feelings trustier guides than her judgment in this crisis adieu for the night mrs warwick he said and was guilty of eulogizing the judgment he thought erratic for the moment night is a calm adviser let me presume to come again in the morning i dare not go back without you she looked up as they faced together each saw that the other had passed through a furnace scorching enough to him though hers was the delicacy exposed their reflection had its weight with her during the night danvers is getting ready a bed for you she is airing linen diana said but the bed was declined and the hospitality was not pressed the offer of it seemed to him significant of an unwary cordiality and thoughtlessness of tacklers that might account possibly for many things supposing a fool or madman or malignant to interpret them then good night said she they joined hands he exacted no promise that she would be present in the morning to receive him and it was a consolation to her desire for freedom until she reflected on the perfect confidence it implied and felt as a quivering butterfly impalpably pinned End of chapter nine chapter ten of diana of the crossways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by mark penfold diana of the crossways by george meredith chapter ten the conflict of the night her brain was a steam wheel throughout the night everything that could be thought of was tossed nothing grasped the unfriendliness of the friends who sought to retain her recurred for look to fly could not be interpreted as a flight it was but a stepping aside a disdain of defending herself and a wrapping herself in her dignity women would be with her she called on the noblest of them to justify the course she chose and they did in an almost audible murmur and oh the rich reward a black archway gate swung open to the glittering fields of freedom emma was not of the chorus emma meditated as an invalid how often had emma bewailed to her that the most grievous burden of her malady was her fatal tendency to brood sickly upon human complications she could not see the blessedness of the prospect of freedom to a woman abominably yoked what if a miserable woman were dragged through mire to reach it married the mire was her portion whatever she might do that man but pass him and that other the dear the kind careless high-hearted old friend 
he could honestly protest his guiltlessness, and would smilingly leave the case to go its ways. Of this she was sure, that her decision and her pleasure would be his. They were tied to the stake. She had already tasted some of the mortal agony. Did it matter whether the flames consumed her? Reflecting on the interview with Redworth, though she had performed her part in it placidly, her skin burned. It was the beginning of tortures if she stayed in England. By staying to defend herself, she forfeited her attitude of dignity and lost all chance of her reward. And name the sort of world it is, dear friends, for which we are to sacrifice our one hope of freedom that we may preserve our fair fame in it. Diana cried aloud, My freedom! Feeling as a butterfly flown out of a box to stretches of sunny earth beneath spacious heavens, her bitter marriage, joyless in all its chapters, indefensible where the man was right as well as where insensately wrong, had been imprisonment. She excused him down to his last madness if only the bonds were broken. Here, too, in this very house of her happiness with her father, she had bound herself to the man voluntarily, quite inexplicably, voluntarily, as we say, but there must be a spell upon us at times. Upon young women there certainly is. The wild brain of Diana, armed by her later enlightenment as to the laws of life and nature, dashed in revolt at the laws of the world when she thought of the forces, natural and social, urging young women to marry and be bound to the end. It should be a spotless world which is thus ruthless, but were the world impeccable it would behave more generously. The world is ruthless, dear friends, because the world is hypocrite. The world cannot afford to be magnanimous or even just. Her dissensions with her husband, their differences of opinion, and puny wranglings, hoistings of two standards, reconciliations for the sake of decency, breaches of the truce, and his detested meanness, the man behind the mask. And glimpses of herself, too, the half-known, half-suspected, developing creature claiming to be Diana, and unlike her dreamed Diana, deformed by marriage, irritable, acerb, rebellious, constantly justifiable against him, but not in her own mind, and therefore accusing him of the double crime of provoking her and perverting her, these were the troops defiling through her head while she did battle with the hypocrite world. One painful sting was caused by the feeling that she could have loved whom? An ideal. Had he, the imagined but unvisioned, been her yoke-fellow, would she now lie raising caged beast cries in execration of the yoke? She would not now be seeing herself as hare, serpent, tigress, the hypothesis was reviewed in negatives. She had barely a sense of softness, just a single little heave of the bosom, quivering upward and leadenly sinking, when she glanced at a married Diana heartily mated. The regrets of the youthful for a life sailing away under medical sentence of death in the sad eyes of relatives resemble it. She could have loved. Goodbye to that. A woman's brutalist tussle with the world was upon her. She was in the arena of the savage claws, flung there by the man who of all others should have protected her from them. And what had she done to deserve it? She listened to the advocate pleading her case. She primed him to admit the charges, to say the worst, in contempt of legal prudence, and therefore expose her transparent honesty. The very things awakening a mad suspicion proved her innocence. But was she this utterly simple person? Oh, no, she was the Diana of the pride in her power of fencing with evil, by no means of the order of those ninny young women who realize the popular conception of the purely innocent. She had fenced and kept her guard. Of this it was her angry glory to have the knowledge. But she had been compelled to fence. Such are men in the world of facts, that when a woman steps out of her domestic tangle to assert, because it is a tangle, her rights to partial independence, they cite her for their prey, or at least they complacently suppose her accessible. 
wretched at home a woman ought to bury herself in her wretchedness else may she be assured that not the cleverest wariest guard will cover her character against the husband her cause was triumphant against herself she decided not to plead it for this reason that the preceding court which was the public and only positive one had entirely and justly exonerated her but the holding of her hand by the friend half a minute too long for friendship and the over-friendliness of looks letters frequency of visits would speak within her she had a darting view of her husband's estimation of them in his present mood she quenched it they were trifles things that women of the world have to combat the revelation to a fair-minded young woman of the majority of men being not other than men and some of the friendliest of men betraying confidence under the excuse of temptation is one of the shocks to simplicity which leave her the alternative of misanthropy or philosophy diana had not the heart to hate her kind so she resigned herself to pardon and to the recognition of the state of duel between the sexes active enough in her sphere of society the circle hummed with it many lived for it could she pretend to ignore it her personal experience might have instigated a less clear and less intrepid nature to take advantage of the opportunity for playing the popular innocent who runs about with astonished eyes to find herself in so hunting a world and wins general compassion if not shelter in unsuspected and unlicensed places there is perpetually the inducement to act the hypocrite before the hypocrite world unless a woman submits to be the humbly knitting housewife unquestioningly worshipful of her lord for the world is ever gracious to an hypocrisy that pays homage to the mask of virtue by copying it the world is hostile to the face of an innocence not conventionally simpering and quite surprised the world prefers decorum to honesty let me be myself whatever the martyrdom she cried in that phase of young sensation when to the blooming woman the putting on of a mask appears to wither her and reduce her to the show she parades yet in common with her sisterhood she owned she had worn a sort of mask the world demands it of them as the price of their station that she had never worn it consentingly was the plea for now casting it off altogether showing herself as she was accepting martyrdom becoming the first martyr of the modern woman's cause a grand position and one imaginable to an excited mind in the dark which does not conjure a critical humour as light does to correct the feverish sublimity she was then this martyr a woman capable of telling the world she knew it and of confessing that she had behaved in disdain of its rigider rules according to her own ideas of her immunities oh brave but was she holding the position by flight it involved the challenge of consequences not an evasion of them she moaned her mental steam-wheel stopped fatigue brought sleep she had sensationally led her rebellious wits to the crossways distilling much poison from thoughts on the way and there for the luxury of a still seeming indecision she sank into oblivion the end of chapter 10 recording by mark penfold chapter 11 of diana of the crossways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please contact librivox.org recording by lucy kempton Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith Chapter 11 Recounts the journey in a chariot with a certain amount of dialogue and a small incident on the road. In the morning the fight was over. She looked at the signpost of the Crossways whilst dressing and submitted to follow, obediently as a puppet, the road recommended by friends though a voice within that she took for the intimations of her reason protested that they were wrong, that they were judging of her case in the general, and unwisely, disastrously for her. The mistaking of her desires for her reasons was peculiar to her situation. 
So I suppose I shall some day see the crossways again, she said, to conceive a compensation in the abandonment of freedom. The night's red vision of martyrdom was reserved to console her secretly, among the unopened lockers in her treasury of thoughts. It helped to sustain her, and she was too conscious of things necessary for her sustainment to bring it to the light of day and examine it. She had a pitiful bit of pleasure in the gratification she imparted to Danvers by informing her that the journey of the day was backward to Copsley. "'If I may venture to say so, ma'am, I am very glad,' said her maid. "'You must be prepared for the questions of lawyers, Danvers.' "'Oh, ma'am, they'll get nothing out of me, and their wigs won't frighten me. "'It is usually their baldness that is most frightening, my poor Danvers.' "'Nor their baldness, ma'am.' said the literal maid. I never cared for their heads or them. I've been in a case before. Indeed, exclaimed her mistress, and she had a chill. Danvers mentioned a notorious case, adding, They got nothing out of me. In my case you will please to speak the truth, said Diana, and beheld in the looking-glass the priming of her maid's mouth. The sight shot a sting. "'Understand there is to be no hesitation about telling the truth of what you know of me,' said Diana. And the answer was, "'No, ma'am,' for Danvers could remark to herself that she knew little and was not a person to hesitate. She was a maid of the world, with the quality of faithfulness, by nature, to a good mistress. Redworth's further difficulties were confined to the hiring of a conveyance for the travellers and hot-water bottles, together with a postillion not addicted to drunkenness. He procured a posting chariot, an ancient and musty, of a late autumnal yellow unrefreshed by paint. The only bottles to be had were Dutch Shedam. His postillion, inspected by Stalling, carried the flag of habitual inebriation on his nose, and he deemed it advisable to ride the mare in accompaniment as far as Riddlehurst notwithstanding the postillion's vows upon his honour that he was no drinker. The emphasis to a gentleman acquainted with his countrymen was not reassuring. He had hopes of enlisting a trustier fellow at Riddlehurst, but he was disappointed, and while debating upon what to do, for he shrank from leaving two women to the conduct of that inflamed trough-snout, Brisby, dispatched to Stalling by an afterthought of Lady Dunstan's, rushed out of the Riddlehurst Inn taproom, and relieved him of the charge of the mare. He was accommodated with a seat on the stool by the chariot. "'My triumphal car,' said his captive. She was very amusing about her postillion. Danvers had to beg pardon for laughing. "'You are happy,' observed her mistress. But Redworth laughed, too, and he could not boast of any happiness beyond the temporary satisfaction. Nor could she who sprang the laughter boast of that little— she said to herself, in the midst of the hilarity, "'Wherever I go now, in all weathers, I am perfectly naked.' And remembering her readings of a certain wonderful old quarto book in her father's library, by an eccentric old Scottish nobleman, wherein the wearing of garments and sleeping in houses is accused as the cause of human degeneracy, she took a forced merry stand on her return to the primitive healthful state of man and woman and affected scorn of our modern ways of dressing and thinking. Whence it came that she had some of her wildest seizures of iridescent humour. Danvers attributed the fun to her mistress's gladness in not having pursued her bent to quit the country. Redworth saw deeper, and was nevertheless amazed by the airy hawk poise and pounce down of her wit, as she ranged high and low, now capriciously generalising, now dropping bolt upon things of passage, the postillion jogging from rum to gin, the rustics baconly agape, the horse-kneed ostlers. She touched them to the life in similes and phrases, and next she was aloft, derisively philosophising, but with a comic afflatus that dispersed the sharpness of her irony and mocking laughter. The afternoon refreshments at the inn of the country market town, and the English idea of public hospitality, as to manner and the substance provided for wayfarers, were among the themes she made memorable to him. She spoke of everything tolerantly, just naming it in a simple sentence that fell with a ring and chimed. Their host's ready acquiescence in receiving orders, his contemptuous disclaimer of stuff he did not keep, 
his flat indifference to the sheep he sheared, and the phantom half-crown flickering in one eye of the anticipatory waiter, the perfading and comforting smell of stale beer over all the apartments, the prevalent notion of bread, butter, tea, milk, sugar, as matter for the exercise of a native inventive genius. These were reviewed in quips of metaphor. Come, we can do better at an inn or two known to me, said Redworth. Surely this is the best that can be done for us when we strike them with the magic wand of a postillion, said she. It depends, as elsewhere, on the individuals entertaining us. Yet you admit that your railways are rapidly polishing off the individual. They will spread the metropolitan idea of comfort. I fear they will feed us on nothing but that big word. It booms, a curfew bell, for every poor little light that we would read by. Seeing their beacon-nosed postillion preparing to mount and failing in his jump, Redworth was apprehensive, and questioned the fellow concerning potation. "'Lord, sir, they call me half a horse, but I can't bates water,' was the reply, with the assurance that he had not taken a pailful. Habit enabled him to gain his seat. "'It seems to us unnecessary to heap on coal when the chimney is afire, but he may know the proper course,' Diana said convulsing Danvers, and there was discernibly to Redworth, under the influence of her phrases, a likeness of the flaming half-horse, with the animals all smoking in the frost, to a railway engine. Your wrinkled centaur, she named the man. Of course he had to play second to her, and not unwillingly, but he reflected passingly on the instinctive push of her rich and sparkling voluble fancy to the initiative, which women do not like in a woman, and men prefer to distantly admire. English women and men feel toward the quick-witted of their species as to aliens, having the demerits of aliens' wordiness, vanity, obscurity, shallowness, and empty glitter, the sin of posturing. A quick-witted woman exerting her wit is both a foreigner and potentially a criminal. She is incandescent to a breath of rumour. It accounted for her having detractors, a heavy counterpoise to her enthusiastic friends. It might account for her husband's discontent, the reduction of him to a state of mere masculine antagonism. What is the husband of a Vanwood woman? He feels himself but a diminished man. The English husband of a voluble woman relapses into a dreary mute. Ah, for the choice of places! Redworth would have yielded her the loquent lead for the smallest of the privileges due to him who now rejected all, except the public scourging of her. The conviction was, in his mind, that the husband of this woman sought rather to punish than be rid of her, but a part of his own emotion went to form the judgment. Furthermore, Lady Dunstan's allusion to her enemies made him set down her growing crops of backbiters to the trick she had of ridiculing things English. If the English do it themselves, it is in a professionally robust, a jocose, kindly way, always with a glance at the other things, great things, they excel in, and it is done to have the credit of doing it. They are keen to catch an inimical tone. They will find occasion to chastise the presumptuous individual, unless it be the leader of a party, therefore a power, for they respect a power. Redworth knew their quaintnesses. Without overlooking them, he winced at the acid of an irony that seemed to spring from aversion, and regretted it for her sake. He had to recollect that she was in a sharp-strung mode, bitterly sure-excited. Moreover, he reminded himself of her many and memorable phrases of enthusiasm for England, Shakespeare land, as she would sometimes perversely term it, to sink the country in the poet. English fortitude, English integrity, the English disposition to do justice to dependence, adolescent English ingenuousness, she was always ready to laud. Only her enthusiasm required rousing by circumstances. It was less at the brim than her satire. Hence she made enemies among a placable people. He felt that he could have helped her under happier conditions. The beautiful vision she had been on the night of the Irish ball swept before him, and he looked at her, smiling. "'Why do you smile?' she said. "'I was thinking of Mr. Sullivan Smith.' "'Ah, my dear compatriot, and think too of Lord Larian?' She caught her breath. Instead of recreation, the names brought on a fit of sadness. It deepened. She neither smiled nor rattled any more. 
She gazed across the hedgeways at the white meadows and bare-twigged copses showing their last leaves in the frost. I remember your words. Observation is the most enduring of the pleasures of life. And so I have found it, she said. There was a brightness along her under eyelids that caused him to look away. The expected catastrophe occurred on the descent of a cutting in the sand, where their cordial postillion, at a trot, bumped the chariot against the sturdy wheels of a wagon, which sent it reclining for support upon a beech tree's huge, intertwisted serpent roots, amid strips of brown bracken and pendant weeds, while he exhibited one short stump of leg, all boot, in air. No one was hurt. Diana disengaged herself from the shoulder of Danvers, and mildly said, "'That reminds me. I forgot to ask why we came in a chariot.' Redworth was excited on her behalf, but the broken glass had done no damage, nor had Danvers fainted. The remark was unintelligible to him, apart from the comforting it had been designed to give. He jumped out and held a hand for them to do the same. "'I never foresaw an event more positively,' said he. "'And it was nothing but a back view that inspired you all the way,' said Diana." A wagoner held the horses, another assisted Redworth to right the chariot. The postillion had hastily recovered possession of his official seat, that he might as soon as possible feel himself again where he was most intelligent, and was gay in stupidity, indifferent to what happened behind him. Diana heard him counselling the wagoner as to the common sense of meeting small accidents with a cheerful soul. Lord, he cried, I'd been pitched to Somerset in my time, and taken up for dead. And that didn't beat me. Disasters of the present kind could hardly affect such a veteran. But he was painfully disconcerted by Redworth's determination not to entrust the ladies any farther to his guidance. Danvers had implored for permission to walk the mile to the town, and thence take a fly to Copsley. Her mistress rather sided with the postillion, who begged them to spare him the disgrace of riding in and delivering a box at the Red Lion. What will they say? and they know Arthur dance well there, he groaned. What, Arthur, chariot in a box? And me a better man to his work now than I'd been for many a long season, fit for double the journey. A bit of a shake always braces me up. I could read a newspaper right off, small print and all. Come along, sir, and hand the ladies in. Danvers vowed her thanks to Mr. Redworth for refusing. They walked ahead, the postillion communicated his mixture of professional and human feelings to the wagoners and walked his horses in the rear, meditating on the weak-heartedness of gentry folk, and the means for escaping being chaffed out of his boots at the old red lion, where he was to eat, drink, and sleep that night. Ladies might be fearsome after a bit of a shake. He would not have supposed it of a gentleman. He jogged himself into an arithmetic of the number of nips of liquor he had taken to soothe him on the road, in spite of the gentleman, for some of them are sworn enemies of poor men as yonder one, ne'er a doubt. Diana enjoyed her walk beneath the lingering brown-red of the frosty November sunset, with the scent of sand-earth strong in the air. "'I had to hire a chariot, because there was no two-horse carriage,' said Redworth, "'and I wished to reach Copsley as early as possible.' She replied, smiling, that accidents were fated, as a certain marriage had been. The comparison forced itself on her reflections. "'But this is quite an adventure,' said she, reanimated by the brisker flow of her blood. "'We ought really to be thankful for it, in days when nothing happens.' Redworth accused her of getting that idea from the perusal of romances. "'Yes, our lives require compression, like romances, to be interesting. "'And we object to the process,' she said. "'Real happiness is a state of dullness. "'When we taste it consciously, it becomes mortal.' a thing of the seasons. But I like my walk. How long these November sunsets burn, and what hues they have. There is a scientific reason, only don't tell it me. Now I understand why you always choose your holidays in November. She thrilled him with her friendly recollection of his customs. As to happiness, the looking forward is happiness, he remarked. Oh, the looking back, back, she cried. Forward, that is life. And back with death, if you will, and still that is happiness, death, and our postillion. Aye, I wonder why the fellow hangs to the rear, said Redworth, turning about. It's his cunning strategy, poor creature, so that he may be thought to have delivered us at the head of the town, 
for us to make a purchase or two if we go to the inn on foot, said Diana. We'll let the manoeuvre succeed. Redworth declared that she had a head for everything, and she was flattered to hear him. So, passing from the southern into the western road, they saw the town lights beneath an amber sky burning out sombrely over the woods of Copsley, and entered the town, the postillion following. End of chapter 11 Recording by Lucy Kempton Chapter 12 of Diana of the Crossways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Kempton Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith Chapter 12 Between Emma and Diana Diana was in the arms of her friend at a late hour of the evening and Danvers breathed the amiable atmosphere of footmen once more, professing herself perished. This maid of the world, who could endure hardships and loss of society for the mistress to whom she was attached, no sooner saw herself surrounded by the comforts befitting her station than she indulged in the luxury of a wailful dejectedness, the better to appreciate them. She was unaffectedly astonished to find her outcries against the cold and the journeyings to and fro, interpreted as a serving woman's muffled comments on her mistress's behaviour. Lady Dunstan's maid, Bartlett, and Mrs. Bridges, the housekeeper, and Foster, the butler, contrived to let her know that they could speak Anne if they would, and they expressed her pity of her to assist her to begin the speaking. She bowed in acceptance of Foster's offer of a glass of wine after supper, but treated him and the other two immediately as though they had been interrogating bigwigs. They wormed nothing out of me, she said to her mistress at night, undressing her. But what a set they are. They've got such comfortable places. They've all their days and hours for talk of the doings of their superiors. They read the vilest of those town papers, and they put their two and two together of what is happening in and about. And not one of their footmen thinks of staying because it's so dull. And they and the maids object. Did one ever hear to the three uppers retiring, when they've done dining, to the private room to dessert? "'That is the custom,' observed her mistress. "'Foster carries the decanter, ma'am, "'and Mrs. Bridges the biscuits, "'and Bartlett the plate of fruit, "'and they march out in order. "'The man at the head of the procession, probably. "'Oh, yes, and the others, "'though they have everything except the wine and dessert, "'don't like it. "'When I was here last they were new "'and hadn't a word against it. "'Now they say it's invidious. "'Lady Dunstan will be left without an underservant "'at Copsley soon.' I was asked about your boxes, ma'am, and the moment I said they were at Dover, that instant all three peeped. They let out a mouse to me. They do love to talk. Her mistress could have added, and you too, my good Danvers, trustworthy though she knew the creature to be in the main. Now go and be sure you have bedclothes enough before you drop asleep, she said, and Danvers directed her steps to gossip with Bartlett. Diana wrapped herself in a dressing gown Lady Dunstan had sent her and sat by the fire, thinking of the powder of tattle stored in servants' halls to explode beneath her, and but for her choice of roads she might have been among strangers. The liking of strangers best is a curious exemplification of innocence. Yes, I was in a muse, she said, raising her head to Emma, whom she expected and sat armed to meet, unaccountably iron-nerved. I was questioning whether I could be quite as blameless as I fancy, if I sit and shiver to be in England. You will tell me I have taken the right road. I doubt it, but the road is taken, and here I am. But any road that leads me to you is homeward, my darling. She tried to melt, determining to be at least open with her. I have not praised you enough for coming, said Emma, when they embraced again. Praise a little your truest friend of women. Your letter gave the tug. I might have resisted it. He came straight from heaven. But cruel, Tony, where is your love? It is unequal to yours, dear, I see. I could have wrestled with anything abstract and distant from being certain. But here I am. But my own dear girl, 
you never could have allowed this infamous charge to be undefended. I think so. I've an odd apathy as to my character, rather like death when one dreams of flying the soul. What does it matter? I should have left the flies and wasps to worry a corpse. And then goodbye gentility. I should have worked for my bread. I had thoughts of America. I fancy I can write, and Americans, one hears, are gentle to women. Ah, Tony, there's the looking back. And of all women, you. Or else, dear, perhaps once on foreign soil in a different air, I might, might have looked back and seen my whole self, not shattered, as I feel it now, and come home again, compassionate to the poor persecuted animal, to defend her. Perhaps that was what I was running away for. I fled on the instinct, often a good thing to trust. I saw you at the crossways. I remembered I had the dread that you would, though I did not imagine you would reach me so swiftly. My going there was an instinct too. I suppose we are all instinct when we have the world at our heels. Forgive me if I generalise without any longer the right to be included in the common human sum. Pariah and taboo are words we borrow from barbarous tribes. They stick to me. My Tony, you look as bright as ever, and you speak despairingly. Call me Enigma. I am that to myself, Emmy. You are not quite yourself to your friend. Since the blow I have been bewildered. I see nothing upright. It came on me suddenly, stunned me. A bolt out of a clear sky, as they say. He spared me a scene. There had been threats, and yet the sky was clear, or seemed. When we have a man for arbiter, he is our sky. Emma pressed her Tony's unresponsive hand, feeling strangely that her friend ebbed from her. Has he to mislead him? she said, colouring at the breach in the question. Proofs? He has the proofs he supposes. Not to justify suspicion. He broke open my desk and took my letters. Horrible. But the letters? Emma shook with a nervous revulsion. You might read them. Basest of men. That is the unpardonable cowardice, exclaimed Emma. The world will read them, dear, said Diana, and struck herself to ice. She broke from the bitter frigidity and fury. They are letters, none very long, sometimes two short sentences. He wrote at any spare moment. On my honour as a woman, I feel for him most. The letters, I would bear any accusation rather than that exposure. Letters of a man of his age to a young woman he rates too highly. The world reads them. Do you hear it saying it could have excused her for that fiddle-faddle with a younger, a young lover? And had I thought of a lover? I had no thought of loving or being loved. I confess I was flattered. To you, Emma, I will confess. You see the public ridicule, and half his age. He and I would have appeared a romantic couple. Confess, I said. Well, dear, the stake is lighted for a trial of its effect on me. It is this. He was never a dishonourable friend, but men appear to be capable of friendship with women only for as long as we keep out of pulling distance of that line where friendship ceases. They may step on it, we must hold back a league. I have learnt it. You will judge whether he disrespects me. As for him, he is a man, at his worst, not one of the worst, at his best, better than very many. There now, Emma, you have me stripped and burning. There is my full confession. Except for this, yes, one thing further, that I do rage at the ridicule, and could choose, but for you, to have given the world cause to revile me, or think me romantic. Something or somebody to suffer for would really be agreeable. It is a singular fact, I have not known what this love is that they talk about. And behold, me marched into Smithfield, society's heretic, if you please. I must own I think it hard. Emma chafed her cold hand softly. It is hard. I understand it, she murmured. And is your Sunday visit to us in the list of offences? An item? You gave me a happy day. Then it counts for me in heaven. He set spies on you? So we may presume. Emma went through a sphere of tenuous reflections in a flash. He will rue it. Perhaps now... He may now be regretting his wretched frenzy. 
and Tony could pardon. She has the power of pardoning in her heart. Oh, certainly, dear. But tell me why it is you speak tonight rather unlike the sedate philosophical Emma, in a tone, well, tolerably sentimental. I am unaware of it, said Emma. Who could have retorted with a like reproach? I am anxious. I will not say at present for your happiness, for your peace. And I have a hope that possibly a timely word from some friend, Lukin or another, might induce him to consider. To pardon me, do you mean? cried Diana, flushing sternly. Not pardon. Suppose a case of faults on both sides. You address a faulty person, my dear. But do you know that you are hinting at a reconcilement? Might it not be? Open your eyes to what it involves. I trust I can pardon. Let him go his ways, do his darkest, or repent. But return to the roof of the basest of men, who was guilty of the unpardonable cowardice? You expect me to be superhuman. When I consent to that, I shall be out of my woman's skin, which he has branded. Go back to him? She was taken with a shudder of head and limbs. No, I really have the power of pardoning, and I am bound to, for among my debts to him, this present exemption, that is like liberty dragging a chain, or, say, an escaped felon wearing his manacles should count. I am sensible of my obligation. The price I pay for it is an immovable patch, attractive to male idiots, I have heard, and a mark of scorn to females. Between the two, the remainder of my days will be lively. Out, out, damned spot. But it will not, and not on the hand, on the forehead. We'll talk of it no longer. I have sent a note, with an enclosure, to my lawyers. I sell the crossways. If I have the married woman's right to any scrap of property, for money to scatter fees. My purse, dear Tony, exclaimed Emma. My house, you will stay with me. Why do you shake your head? With me you are safe. She spied at the shadows in her friend's face. Ever since your marriage, Tony, you have been strange in your trick of refusing to stay with me. And you and I made our friendship the pledge of a belief in eternity. We vowed it. Come, I do talk sentimentally, but my heart is in it. I beg you, all the reasons are with me, to make my house your home. You will. You know I am rather lonely. Diana struggled to keep her resolution from being broken by tenderness, and doubtless poor Sir Lukin had learnt his lesson. Still, her defensive instincts could never quite slumber under his roof, not because of any further fear that they would have to be summoned. It was chiefly owing to the consequences of his treacherous foolishness. For this half-home with her friend, thenceforward denied to her, she had accepted a protector, called husband, rashly, past credence in the retrospect. But it had been her propelling motive, and the loathings roused by her marriage helped to sicken her at the idea of a lengthened stay, where she had suffered the shock precipitating her to an act of insanity. I do not forget you were an heiress, Emmy, and I will come to you if I need money to keep my head up. As for staying, two reasons are against it. If I am to fight my battle, I must be seen. I must go about, wherever I am received. So my field is London, that is obvious, and I shall rest better in a house where my story is not known. Two or three questions ensued. Diana had to fortify her fictitious objection by alluding to her maid's prattle of the household below, and she excused the hapless, overfed, idle people of those regions. To Emma it seemed a not unnatural sensitiveness. She came to a settled resolve in her thoughts, as she said, they want a change. London is their element. Feeling that she deceived this true heart, however lightly and necessarily, Diana warmed to her, forgiving her at last for having netted and dragged her back to front the enemy. An imposition of horrors of which the scene and the travelling with Redworth, the talking of her case with her most intimate friend as well, had been a distempering foretaste. They stood up and kissed, parting for the night. An odd world, where for the sin we have not participated in we must fib and continue fibbing, she reflected. She did not entirely cheat her clearer mind, for she perceived that her step in flight had been urged both by a weak despondency and a blind desperation. 
also that the world of a fluid civilization is perforce artificial. But her mind was in the background of her fevered senses, and when she looked in the glass and mused on uttering the word liar to the lovely image, her senses were refreshed, her mind somewhat relieved, the face appeared so sovereignly defiant of abasement. Thus did a nature distraught by pain obtain some short lull of repose. Thus, moreover, by closely reading herself, whom she scourged to excess that she might in justice be comforted, she gathered an increasing knowledge of our human constitution and stored matter for the brain. End of chapter 12 Recording by Lucy Kempton Chapter 13 of Diana of the Crossways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter 13 Touching the First Days of Her Probation. The result of her sleeping was that Diana's humour, locked up overnight, insisted on an excursion, as she lay with half-buried head and open eyelids, thinking of the firm of lawyers she had to see, and to whom, and to the legal profession generally, she would be, under outward courtesies, nothing other than the woman Warwick. She pursued the woman Warwick unmercifully through a series of interviews with her decorous and crudely minded defenders, accurately perusing them behind their senior staidness. Her scorching sensitiveness sharpened her intelligence in regard to the estimate of discarded wives entertained by men of business and plain men of the world, and she drove the woman Warwick down their ranks, amazed by the vision of a puppet so unlike to herself in reality though identical in situation that woman reciting her side of the case gained a gradual resemblance to danvers she spoke primly perpetually the creature aired her handkerchief she was bent on softening those sugar loaves the hard business men of applying to her for facts facts were treated as unworthy of her mere stuff of the dust heap mutton bones old shoes she swam above them in a cocoon of her spinning, sylphidine, unseizable, and between perplexing and mollifying the slaves of facts, she saw them at their heels, a tearful fry, abjectly imitative of her melodramatic performances. The spectacle was presented of a band of legal gentlemen vociferating mightily for swords, and the onset, like the Austrian Empress's Magyars, to vindicate her just and holy cause. Our law courts failing, they threatened Parliament, and for a last resort, the country. We are not going to be the woman Warwick without a stir, my brethren. Emma, an early riser that morning, for the purpose of a private consultation with Mr. Redworth, found her lying placidly wakeful, to judge by appearances. "'You have not slept, my dear child?' "'Perfectly,' said Diana, giving her hand and offering the lips. "'I am only having a warm morning bath in bed,' she added, in explanation of a chill moisture that the touch of her exposed skin betrayed. For whatever the fun of the woman Warwick, there had been sympathetic feminine horrors in the frame of the sentient woman." Emma fancied she kissed a quiet sufferer. A few remarks very soon set her wildly laughing. Both were laughing when Danvers entered the room, rather guilty being late, and the sight of the prim-visaged maid she had been driving among the lawyers kindled Diana's comic imagination to such a pitch that she ran riot in drolleries, carrying her friend headlong on the tide. "'I have not laughed so much since you were married,' said Emma nor i dear proving that the bar to it was the ceremony said diana she promised to remain at copsley three days then for the campaign in mr redworth's metropolis i wonder whether i may ask him to get me lodgings a sitting-room and two bedrooms the crossways has a board up for letting i should prefer to be my own tenant only it would give me a hundred pounds more to get a substitute's money I should like to be at work writing instantly. Ink is my opium, and the pen my nigger, 
and he must dig up gold for me it is written danvers you can make ready to dress me when i ring emma helped the beautiful woman to her dressing-gown and the step from her bed she had her thoughts and went down to redworth at the breakfast-table marvelling that any husband other than a madman could cast such a jewel away the material loveliness eclipses intellectual qualities in such reflections he must be mad she said compelled to disburden herself in a congenial atmosphere which however she infrigidated by her overflow of exclamatory wonderment a curtain that shook voluminous folds luring redworth to dreams of the treasure forfeited he became rigidly practical provision will have to be made for her lukin must see mr warwick she will do wisely to stay with friends in town mixing company women are the best allies for such cases who are her solicitors they are mine braddock thorpe and simnel a good firm she is in safe hands with them i dare say they may come to an arrangement i should wish it she will never consent redworth shrugged a woman's never fell far short of outstripping the sturdy pedestrian time to his mind diana saw him drive off to catch the coach in the valley regulated to meet the train and much though she liked him she was not sorry that he had gone she felt the better clad for it she would have rejoiced to witness the departure on wings of all her friends except emma to whom her coldness overnight had bound her anew warmly in contrition and yet her friends were well beloved by her but her emotions were distraught emma told her that mr redworth had undertaken to hire a suite of convenient rooms and to these she looked forward the nest among strangers where she could begin to write earning bread an idea that with the pride of independence conjured the pleasant morning smell of a bakery about her she passed three peaceable days at copsley at war only with the luxury of the house on the fourth a letter to lady dunstane from wedworth gave the address of the best lodgings he could find and diana started for london she had during a couple of weeks besides the first fresh exercising of her pen as well as the severe gratification of economy a savage exultation in passing through the streets on foot and unknown save for the plunges into the office of her solicitors she could seem to herself a woman who had never submitted to the yoke what a pleasure it was after finishing a number of pages to start eastward toward the lawyer regions full of imaginary cropping incidents and from that churchyard westward against smoky sunsets or in welcome fogs an atom of the crowd she had an affection for the crowd they clothed her she laughed at the gloomy forebodings of danvers concerning the perils environing ladies in the streets after dark alone the lights in the streets after dark and the quick running of her blood combined to strike sparks of fancy and in spirit the task of composition at night this new strange solitary life cut off from her adulatory society both by the shock that made the abyss and by the utter foreignness threw her in upon her natural forces recasting her and thinning away her memory of her past days except in girlhood into the remote she lived with her girlhood as with a simple little sister they were two in one and she corrected the dreams of the younger protected and counselled her very sagely advising her to love truth and look always to reality for her refreshment she was ready to say that no habitable spot on our planet was healthier and pleasanter than london as to the perils haunting the head of danvers her experiences assured her of a perfect immunity from them and the maligned thoroughfares of a great city she was ready to affirm contrasted favourably with certain hospitable halls the long-suffering fates permitted her for a term to enjoy the generous delusion subsequently a sweet surprise alleviated the shock she had sustained emma dunstane's carriage was at her door and emma entered her sitting-room to tell her of having hired a house in the neighbourhood looking on the park she begged to have her for guests sorrowfully anticipating the refusal at least they were to be near one another 
"'You really like this life in lodgings?' asked Emma, to whom the stiff furniture and narrow apartments were a dreariness, the miserably small fire of the sitting-room an aspect of cheerless winter. "'I do,' said Diana. "'Yes,' she added with some reserve, and smiled at her damped enthusiasm. "'I can eat when I like, walk, work, and I am working. My legs and my pen demand it. Let me be independent.' Besides, I begin to learn something of the bigger world outside the one I know, and I crush my mincing tastes. In return for that, I get a sense of strength I had not when I was a drawing-room exotic. Much is repulsive, but I am taken with a passion for reality. They spoke of the lawyers, and the calculated period of the trial, of the husband, too, in his inciting belief in the falseness of his wife. That is his excuse diana said her closed mouth meditatively dimpling the corners over thoughts of his grounds for fury he had them though none of the incriminating charge the sphinx mouth of the married woman at war and at bay must be left unriddled she and the law differed in their interpretation of the dues of wedlock but matters referring to her case were secondary with diana beside the importance of her storing impressions her mind required to hunger for something, and this reality which frequently she was forced to loathe, she forced herself proudly to accept, despite her youthfulness. Her philosophy swallowed it in the lump, as the great serpent his meal. She hoped to digest it sleeping likewise. Her visits of curiosity to the law courts, where she stood spying and listening behind a veil, gave her a great deal of tough substance to digest there she watched the process of the tortures to be applied to herself and hardened her senses for the ordeal she saw there the ribbed and shanked old skeleton world on which our fair fleshly is moulded after all your fool's paradise is not a garden to grow in sharon's ferry-boat is not thicker with phantoms they do not live in mind or soul chiefly women people it a certain class of limp men women for the most part they are sown there and put their garden under the magnifying glass of intimacy what do we behold a world not better than the world it curtains only foolisher her conversations with lady dunstane brought her at last to the point of her damped enthusiasm she related an incident or two occurring in her career of independence and they discussed our state of civilization plainly and gravely save for the laughing peals her phrases occasionally provoked as when she named the intruders and disturbers of solitarily faring ladies cupid's footpads her humour was created to swim on waters where a prescribed and cultivated prudery should pretend to be drowning i was getting an exalted idea of english gentlemen emmy rich and rare were the gems she wore i was ready to vow that one might traverse the larger island similarly respected I praised their chivalry. I thought it a privilege to live in such a land. I cannot describe to you how delightful it was to me to walk out and home generally protected. I might have been seriously annoyed, but that one of the clerks articled, he called himself, of our lawyers happened to be by. He offered to guard me, and was amusing with his modest tiptoe air. No, I trust to the English common man more than ever. He is a man of honour. I am convinced he is matchless in any other country, except Ireland. The English gentleman trades on his reputation. He was condemned by an afflicted delicacy, the sharpest of critical tribunals. Emma bade her not to be too sweeping from a bad example. "'It is not a single one,' said Diana. "'What vexes me and frets me is that I must be a prisoner or allow Danvers to mount guard.' and I can't see the end of it, and Danvers is no magician. She seems to know her countrymen, though. She warded one of them off by saying to me, This is the crossing, my lady. He fled. Lady Dunstane affixed the popular title to the latter kind of gentleman. She was irritated on her friend's behalf, and against the worrying of her sisterhood, thinking in her heart, nevertheless, that the passing of a face and figure like Diana's might inspire honourable emotions, pitiable for being hapless if you were with me dear you would have none of these annoyances she said pleading forlornly 
Diana smiled to herself. No, I should relapse into softness. This life exactly suits my present temper. My landlady is respectful and attentive. The little housemaid is a willing slave. Danvers does not despise them pugnaciously. They make a home for me, and I am learning daily. Do you know, the less ignorant I become, the more considerate I am for the ignorance of others? I love them for it. She squeezed Emma's hand with more meaning than her friend apprehended. So I win my advantage from the trifles I have to endure. They are really trifles, and I should once have thought them mountains. For the moment Diana stipulated that she might not have to encounter friends or others at Lady Dunstane's dinner-table, and the season not being favourable to those gatherings planned by Lady Dunstane in her project of winning supporters, there was a respite during which Sir Lucan worked manfully at his three clubs to vindicate Diana's name from the hummers and whores, gaining half a dozen hot adherents and a body of lukewarm, sufficiently stirred to be desirous to see the lady. He worked with true champion zeal, although an interview granted him by the husband settled his opinion as to any possibility of the two ever coming to terms. Also it struck him that if he by misadventure had been a woman and the wife of such a fellow, by Jove, his apostrophe to the father of the gods of pagandom, signifying the amount of matter Warwick would have had reason to complain of in earnest, by ricochet his military mind rebounded from his knowledge of himself to an ardent faith in Mrs. Warwick's innocence. For, as there was no resemblance between them, there must, he deduced, be a difference in their capacity for enduring the perpetual company of a prig, a stick, a petrified poser. Moreover, the novel act of advocacy, and the nature of the advocacy, had effect on him, and then he recalled the scene in the winter beechwoods, and Diana's wild dear eyes, her perfect generosity to a traitor and fool. How could he have doubted her? Glimpses of the corrupting cause, for it partly penetrated his density. A conqueror of ladies, in mid-career, doubts them all. Of course he had meant no harm, nothing worse than some petty philandering with the loveliest woman of her time. And by Jove, it was worth the rebuff to behold the beauty in her wrath. The reflections of Lothario, however much tending tardily to do justice to a particular lady, cannot terminate wholesomely. But he became a gallant partisan. His portrayal of Mr. Warwick to his wife and his friends was fine caricature. The fellow had his hand up at my first word, stood like a sentinel under inspection. Understand, Sir Lukin, that I receive you simply as an acquaintance. As an intermediary, permit me to state that you are taking superfluous trouble. The case must proceed. It is final. She is at liberty, in the meantime, to draw on my bankers for the provision she may need, at the rate of five hundred pounds per annum. He spoke of the lady now bearing my name. He was within an inch of saying, dishonouring. I swear I heard the dis, and he caught himself up. He again declined any attempt toward reconciliation. It could only be founded on evasion of the truth to be made patent on the day of trial. Half his talk was lawyer's lingo. The fellow's teeth looked like frost. If Lot's wife had a brother, his name's Warwick. How Diana Merion, who could have had the pick of the best of us, ever came to marry a fellow like that, passes my comprehension. Queer creatures as women are. He can ride. That's about all he can do. I told him Mrs. Warwick had no thought of reconciliation. Then, Sir Lukin, you will perceive that we have no standpoint for a discussion. I told him the point was for a man of honour not to drag his wife before the public, as he had no case to stand on less than nothing. You should have seen the fellow's face. He shot a sneer up to his eyelids, and flung his head back. So I said, Good day. He marches me to the door, with his compliments to Lady Dunstane. I could have floored him for that. Bless my soul, what fellows the world is made of, when here's a man, calling himself a gentleman, who, just because he gets in a rage with his wife, for one thing or another, and past all competition, the handsomest woman of her day, and the cleverest, the nicest, the best of the whole boiling, has her out for a public horse-whipping, and sets all the idiots of the kingdom against her. 
I tried to reason with him. He made as if he were going to sleep standing. Sir Lukin gratified Lady Dunstane by his honest championship of Diana, and now, in his altered mood, the thrice indebted rogue was just cloudily conscious of a desire to propitiate his dear wife by serving her friend. He began a crusade against the scandal newspapers, going with an Irish military comrade straight to the editorial offices, and leaving his card and a warning that the chastisement for print of the name of the lady in their columns would be personal and condign. Captain Carew Mahoney, albeit unacquainted with Mrs. Warwick, had espoused her cause. She was a woman, she was an Irish woman, she was a beautiful woman. She had, therefore, three positive claims on him as a soldier and a man. Other Irish gentlemen, animated by the same swelling degrees, were awaking to the intimation that they might be wanted. Some words were dropped here and there by General Lord Larrian. He regretted his age and infirmities. A goodly regiment for a bodyguard might have been selected to protect her steps in the public streets. When it was bruited that the general had sent her a present of his great Newfoundland dog, Leander, to attend on her and impose a required respect. But as it chanced that her address was unknown to the voluntary constabulary, they had to assuage their ardour by thinking the dog luckier than they. The report of the dog was a fact. He arrived one morning at Diana's lodgings, with a soldier to lead him, and a card to introduce the Hercules of dogs, a very ideal of the species, toweringly big, benevolent, reputed a rescuer of lives, disdainful of dog-fighting, devoted to his guardian's office, with a majestic paw to give, and the noblest satisfaction in receiving caresses, ever expressed by mortal male, enfolded about the head, kissed, patted, hugged, snuggled, informed that he was his new mistress's one love and darling. She dispatched a thrilling note of thanks to Lord Larrian, sure of her touch upon an Irish heart. The dog Leander soon responded to the attachment of a mistress enamoured of him. "'He is my husband,' she said to Emma, and started a tear in the eyes of her smiling friend. "'He promises to trust me, and never to have the law of me, and to love my friends as his own, so we are certain to agree.' In rain, snow, sunshine, through the parks and the streets, he was the shadow of Diana, commanding, on the whole, apart from some desperate attempts to make him serve as introducer, a civilised behaviour in the legions of Cupid's footpads. But he helped, innocently enough, to create an enemy. End of chapter 13 Chapter Fourteen of Diana of the Crossways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter Fourteen. Giving glimpses of Diana under her cloud before the world and of her further apprenticeship. As the day of her trial became more closely calculable, Diana's anticipated alarms receded with the deadening of her heart to meet the shock. She fancied she put on proof armor, unconscious that it was the turning of the inward flutterer to steel which supplied her cuirass and shield. The necessity to brave society in the character of honest defendant caused but a momentary twitch of the nerves. Her heart beat regularly like a serviceable clock, None of her faculties abandoned her, save songfulness, and none belied her, excepting a disposition to tartness, almost venomous in the sarcastic shafts she let fly at friends interceding with Mr. Warwick to spare his wife when she had determined to be tried. A strange fit of childishness overcame her powers of thinking, and was betrayed in her manner of speaking, though, to herself, her dwindled humour allowed her to appear the towering Britomart. She pouted contemptuously on hearing that a Mr. Sullivan Smith, a remotely recollected figure, had besought Mr. Warwick for an interview, and gained it by stratagem, to bring the man to his senses. But an ultra-Irishman did not compromise her battlefront, as the busybody supplications of a personal friend like Mr. Redworth did, and that the latter, without consulting her, 
should be one of the plaintive crew whining about the heels of the plaintiff for a mercy she disdained and rejected was bitter to her taste he does not see that unless i go through the fire there is no justification for this wretched character of mine she exclaimed truce treaty withdrawal signified publicly pardon not exoneration by any means and now that she was in armour she had no dread of the public so she said redworth's being then engaged upon the canvas of a burrow added to the absurdity of his meddling with the dilemmas of a woman dear me emma think of stepping aside from the parliamentary robe to entreat a husband to relent and arrange the domestic alliance of a contrary couple quixotry is agreeable reading a silly performance lady dunstan pleaded his friendship she had to quit the field where such darts were showering the first dinner party was aristocratic easy to encounter lord and lady crane lady pennon lord and lady escart lord larian mr and mrs montvert of halford manor lady singleby sir walter capperston friends admirers of diana patrons in the phrase of the time of her father were the guests lady pennon expected to be amused and was gratified for diana had only to open her mouth to set the great lady laughing she petitioned to have mrs warwick at her table that day week because the marquis was dying to make her acquaintance and begged to have all her sayings repeated to him vowed she must be salt in the dessert and remember i back you through thick and thin said lady pennon to which diana replied if i am salt in the dessert you are the spring and the old lady protested she must put that down for her book the witty mrs warwick of whom wit was expected had many incitements to be guilty of cheap wit and the beautiful mrs warwick being able to pass anything she uttered gave good and bad alike under the impulsion to give out something that the stripped and shivering mrs warwick might find a cover in applause she discovered the social uses of cheap wit she laid ambushes for anecdotes a telling form of it among a people of no conversational interlocution especially in the circles depending for dialogue upon perpetual fresh supplies of scandal which have plentiful crops yet not sufficient the old dinner and supper tables at the crossways furnished her with an abundant store and recollection failing she invented irish anecdotes are always popular in england as promoting besides the wholesome shakes of the sides a kindly sense of superiority anecdotes also are portable unlike the lightning flash which will not go into the pocket they can be carried home they are dispersable at other tables these were diana's weapons she was perforce the actress of her part in happier times when light of heart and natural her vogue had not been so enrapturing Doubtless Cleopatra, in her simple Egyptian uniform, would hardly have won such plaudits as her stress of barbaric oriental splendours evoked for her on the swan and serpent Nile barge. Not from posterity, at least. It is a terrible decree that all must act who would prevail, and the more extended the audience, the greater need for the mask and buskin. From Lady Pennon's table, Diana passed to Lady Crane's, Lady Escarts, lady singleby's the duchess of rabies warmly clad in the admiration she excited she appeared at princess therese parilli's first ball of the season and had her circle not of worshippers only she did not dance the princess a fair austrian benevolent to her sisterhood an admirer of diana's contrasting complexion would have had her dance once in a quadrille of her forming but yielded to the mute expression of the refusal Wherever Mrs. Warwick went, her arts of charming were addressed to the women. Men may be counted on for falling bowled over by a handsome face and pointed tongue. Women required some wooing from their ensphered and charioted sister, particularly if she is clouded. And old women, excellent buttresses, must be suavely courted. Now, to woo the swimming matron and court the settled dowager, she had to win forgiveness for her beauty, and this was done, easily done, by forbearing to angle with it in the press of nibblers. 
they ranged about her, individually unnoticed. Seeming unaware of its effect where it kindled, she smote a number of musical female chords, compassion among them. A general grave affability of her eyes and smiles was taken for quiet pleasure in the scene. Her fitful intentness of look when conversing with the older ladies told of the mind within at work upon what they said, and she was careful that plain dialogue should make her comprehensible to them. Nature taught her these arts, through which her wit became extolled entirely on the strength of her reputation, and her beauty did her service by never taking aim abroad. They are the women's arts of self-defence, as legitimately and honourably hers as the manful use of the fists with a coarser sex. If it had not been nature that taught her the practice of them in extremity, the sagacious dowagers would have seen brazenness rather than innocence, or an excusable indiscretion, in the part she was performing. They are not lightly duped by one of their sex. Few tasks are more difficult than for a young woman under a cloud to hoodwink old women of the world. They are the prey of financiers, but time has presented them with a magic ancient glass to scan their sex in. At Princess Perilly's ball, two young men of singular elegance were observed by Diana, little though she concentrated her attention at any figures of the group. She had the woman's faculty, transiently bestowed by perfervid jealousy upon men, of distinguishing minutely in the calmest of indifferent glances. She could see without looking, and when her eyes were wide, they had not to dwell to be detective. It did not escape her that the Englishman of the two hurried for the chance of an introduction, nor that he suddenly, after putting a question to a man beside him, retired. She spoke of them to Emma as they drove home. The princess's partner in the first quadrille, Hungarian, I suppose? He was like a tartar modelled by a Greek, supple as the Scythian's bow, braced as the string. He has the air of a born horseman, and valses perfectly. I won't say he was handsomer than a young Englishman there, but he had the advantage of soldierly training. How different is that quick springy figure from our young men's lounging style? It comes of military exercise and discipline. That was Count Jocani, a cousin of the princess, and a cavalry officer, said Emma. You don't know the other? I'm sure the one you mean must be Percy Dacier. His retiring was explained. The Honourable Percy Dacier was the nephew of Lord Dannisburg, often extolled to her as the promising youngster of his day, with the reserve that he wasted his youth, for the gentleman was decorous and studious, ambitious according to report, a politician taking to politics much too seriously and exclusively to suit his uncle's pattern for the early period of life. Uncle and nephew went their separate ways, rarely meeting, though their exchange of esteem was cordial. Thinking over his abrupt retirement from the crowded semicircle, Diana felt her position pinch her. She knew not why. Lady Dunstan was as indefatigable by day as by night in the business of acting goddess to her beloved Tony, whom she assured that the service, instead of exhausting, gave her such healthfulness as she had imagined herself to have lost for ever. The word was passed, and invitations poured in to choice conversational breakfasts, private afternoon concerts, all the humming season's assemblies. Mr. Warwick's treatment of his wife was taken by implication for lunatic. Wherever she was heard or seen, he had no case. A jury of some hundreds of both sexes, ready to be sworn, pronounced against him. Only the personal enemies of the lord in the suit presumed to doubt, and they exercised the discretion of a minority. But there is an upper middle class below the aristocratic, boasting an aristocracy of morals, and eminently persuasive of public opinion, if not commanding it. Previous to the relaxation, by amendment, of a certain legal process, this class was held to represent the austerity of the country, at present a relaxed austerity is represented, and still the bulk of the members are of fair repute, though not quite on the level of their pretensions. They were then, while more sharply divided from the titular superiors they are socially absorbing, very powerful to brand a woman's character, 
whatever her rank might be, having innumerable agencies and avenues for that high purpose, to say nothing of the printing press. Lady Dunstan's anxiety to draw them over to the cause of her friend set her thinking of the influential Mrs. Cramborne Wathen, with whom she was distantly connected. The wife of a potent sergeant at law, fast mounting to the bench and knighthood, the centre of a circle, and not strangely that, despite her deficiency in the arts and graces, for she had wealth and a cook, a husband proud of his wine-cellar, and the ambition to rule, all the rewards together with the expectations of the virtuous. She was a lady of incisive features bound in stale parchment. Complexion she had none, but she had spotlessness of skin, and sons and daughters just resembling her, like cheaper editions of a precious quattro of a parish type. You discern the imitation of the type, you acknowledged the inferior compositor. Mr. Cramborne Wathen was by birth of a grade beneath his wife. He sprang, behind a curtain of horror, from tradesmen. The bench was in designation for him to wash out the stain. But his children suffered in large hands and feet, short legs, excess of bone, prominences misplaced. Their mother inspired them carefully with the religion she opposed to the pretensions of a nobler blood, while instilling into them that the blood they drew from her was territorial, far above the vulgar. Her appearance and her principles fitted her to stand for the Puritan rich of the period, emerging by the aid of an extending wealth into luxurious worldliness, and retaining the maxims of their forefathers for the discipline of the poor and erring. Lady Dunstan called on her, ostensibly to let her know she had taken a house in town for the season, and in the course of the chat, Mrs. Cramborne Wathen was invited to dinner. "'You will meet my friend, Mrs. Warwick,' she said, and the reply was, "'Oh, I have heard of her.' The formal consultation with Mr. Cramborne Wathen ended in an agreement to accept Lady Dunstan's kind invitation." Considering her husband's plenitude of old legal anecdotes, and her own diligent perusals of the funny publications of the day, that she might be on the level of the wits and celebrities she entertained, Mrs. Cramborne Wathen had a right to expect the leading share in the conversation to which she was accustomed. Every honour was paid to them. They met aristocracy in the persons of Lord Larian, of Lady Rockton, Colonel Pearlby, the Pettigrews, but neither of them held the table for a moment. The topics flew, and were no sooner up than down. They were unable to get a shot. They had to eat in silence, occasionally grinning, because a woman laboring under a stigma would rattle-rattle, as if the laughter of the company were her due, and decency beneath her notice. Someone alluded to a dog of Mrs. Warwick's, whereupon she trips out a story of her dog's amazing intelligence. "'And pray,' said Mrs. Cramborne Wathen across the table, merely to slip in a word, "'what is the name of this wonderful dog?' "'His name is Leander,' said Diana. "'Oh, Leander, I don't think I hear myself calling to a dog in a name of three syllables, two at the most. "'No, so I call him Hero if I want him to come immediately,' said Diana." and the gentleman, to Mrs. Cramborne Wathen's astonishment, acclaimed it. Mr. Redworth, at her elbow, explained the point to her disgust. That was Diana's offence. If it should seem a small one, let it be remembered that a snub was intended, and was foiled, and foiled with an apparent simplicity, enough to exasperate, had there been no laughter of men to back the countering stroke. A woman under a cloud, she talked, pushed to shine. She would be heard, would be applauded. Her chronicler must likewise admit the error of her giving way to a petty sentiment of antagonism on first beholding Mrs. Cramborne Wathen, before whom she at once resolved to be herself for a holiday, instead of acting demurely to conciliate. Probably it was an antagonism of race, the shrinking of the skin from the burr, but when tremendous powers are invoked, we should treat any simple revulsion of our blood as a vice. The gods of this world's contests demand it of us, 
in relation to them that the mind, and not the instincts, shall be at work. Otherwise, the course of a prudent policy is never to invoke them, but avoid. The upper class was gained by her intrepidity, her charm, and her elsewhere offending wit, however the case might go. It is chivalrous, but not, alas, inflammable in support of innocence. The class below it is governed in estimates of character by accepted patterns of conduct. Yet, where innocence under persecution is believed to exist, the members animated by that belief can be enthusiastic. Enthusiasm is a heaven-sent steeplechaser, and takes a flying leap of the ordinary barriers. It is more intrusive than chivalry, and has a passion to communicate its ardour. Two letters from stranger ladies reached Diana, through her lawyers and Lady Dunstan. Anonymous letters, not so welcome, being male effusions, one of them comical almost over the verge to pathos in its termination. To me you will ever be the goddess Diana, my faith in woman. He was unacquainted with her. She had not the heart to think the writers donkeys. How they obtained her address was a puzzle. They stole in to comfort her slightly. They attached her to her position of defendant by the thought of what would have been the idea of her character if she had flown, a reflection emanating from inexperience of the resources of sentimentalists. If she had flown, she was borne along by the tide like a butterfly that a fish may gobble unless friendly hand shall intervene. And could it in nature? She was past expectation of release. The attempt to imagine living with any warmth of blood in her vindicated character, for the sake of zealous friends, consigned her to a cold and empty house upon a foreign earth. She had to set her mind upon the mysterious and shrouded twelve with whom the verdict would soon be hanging, that she might prompt her human combativeness to desire the vindication at such a price as she would have to pay for it. When Emma Dunstan spoke to her of the certainty of triumphing, she suggested a possible dissentient among the fateful twelve, merely to escape the drumming sound of the hollow big word. The irreverent imp of her humour came to her relief by calling forth the twelve in the tone of the clerk of the court, and they answered to their names of trades and crafts after the manner of Titania's elves, and were questioned as to their fitness by education, habits, enlightenment, to pronounce decisively upon the case in dispute, the case being plainly stated. They replied that the long habit of dealing with scales enabled them to weigh the value of evidence the most delicate. Moreover, they were Englishmen, and anything short of downright bullet facts went to favour the woman. For thus we light the balance of legal injustice toward the sex. We conveniently wink, ma'am. A rough, old-fashioned way for us. It is a breach of promise. We shall reckon on her damages. We have daughters of our own. Is it a suit for divorce? Well, we have wives of our own, and we can lash or we can spare. That's as it may be. But we'll keep the couple tied, let em hate as they like, if they can't furnish pork-butcher's reasons for sundering. Because the man makes the money in this country. My goodness, what a funny people, sir. It's our way of holding the balance, ma'am. But would it not be better to rectify the law and the social system, dear sir? Why, ma'am, we find it comfortabler to take cases as they come, in the style of our fathers. But don't you see, my good man, that you are offering scapegoats for the comfort of the majority? Well, ma'am, there always were scapegoats, and always will be. We find it comes round pretty square in the end. And I may be the scapegoat, Emmy. It is perfectly possible. The grocer, the pork butcher, dry salter, stationer, tea merchant, etc., they sit on me. I have studied the faces of the juries, and Mr. Braddock tells me of their composition, and he admits that they do justice roughly, a rough and tumble country, to quote him though he says they are honest in intention. "'More shame to the man who drags you before them, if he persists,' Emma rejoined. "'He will. I know him. 
I would not have him draw back now, said Diana, catching her breath. And, dearest, do not abuse him, for if you do, you set me imagining guiltiness. Oh, heaven, suppose me publicly pardoned. No, I have kinder feelings when we stand opposed. It is odd, and rather frets my conscience, to think of the little resentment I feel. Hardly any. He has not cause to like his wife. I can own it, and am sorry for him, heartily. No two have ever come together so naturally antagonistic as we two. We walked a dozen steps, in stupefied union, and hit upon a crossways. From that moment it was tug and tug, he, me, I, him. By resisting I made him a tyrant, and he, by insisting, made me a rebel. And he was the maddest of tyrants, a weak one. My dear, he was also a double dealer. Or no, perhaps not in design. He was moved at one time by his interests, at another by his idea of his honour. He took what I could get for him, and then turned and drubbed me for getting it. "'This is the creature you try to excuse!' exclaimed indignant Emma. "'Yes, because... but fancy all the smart things I said being called my sallies. Can a woman live with it? Being... because I behaved... I despised him too much, and I showed it. He is not a contemptible man before the world. He is merely a very narrow one under close inspection. I could not, or did not, conceal my feeling. I showed it not only to him, to my friend. Husband grew to mean to me stifler, lung contractor, iron mask, inquisitor, everything anti-natural. He suffered under my sallies, and it was the worse for him when he did not perceive their drift. He is an upright man. I have not seen marked meanness. One might build up a respectable figure in negatives. I could add a row of knots to the single number he cherishes, enough to make a millionaire of him. But strike away the first, the rest are wind, which signifies that if you do not take him estimate of himself, you will think little of his negative virtues. He is not eminently, that is to say, not saliently selfish, not rancorous, not obtrusive, ta-ta, ta-ta, but dull, dull as a woolen nightcap over eyes and ears and mouth, oh, an executioner's black cap to me, dull, and suddenly staring awake to the idea of his honour, I rendered him ridiculous. I had caught a trick of using men's phrases. Dearest, now that the day of trial draws nigh, you have never questioned me, and it was like you to spare me pain but now I can speak of him and myself. Diane dropped her voice. Here was another confession. The proximity of the trial acted like fire on her faded recollection of incidents. It may be that partly the shame of alluding to them had blocked her woman's memory, for one curious operation of the charge of guiltiness upon the nearly guiltless is to make them paint themselves pure white, to the obliteration of minor spots, until the whiteness being acknowledged, or the ordeal imminent, the spots recur and press upon their consciences. She resumed in a rapid undertone. You know that a certain degree of independence has been, if not granted by him, conquered by me. I had the habit of it. Obedience with him is imprisonment. He is a blind wall. He received a commission greatly to his advantage, and was absent. He seems to have received information of some sort. He returned unexpectedly at a late hour, and attacked me at once, middling violent. My friend, and that he is, was coming from the house for a ten minutes talk, as usual, on his way home, to refresh him after the long sitting and bear-baiting he had nightly to endure. Now let me confess, I grew frightened. Mr. Warwick was off his head, as they say, crazy and I could not bear the thought of those two meeting. While he raged, I threw open the window and put the lamp near it to expose the whole interior, cunning as a veteran intriguer. Horrible, but it had to be done to keep them apart. He asked me what madness possessed me to sit by an open window at midnight in view of the public, with a damp wind blowing. I complained of want of air and fanned my forehead. I heard the steps on the pavement, I stung him to retort loudly, and was relieved. The steps passed on. So the trick succeeded. The trick! 
It was the worst I was guilty of, but it was a trick, and it branded me trickster. It teaches me to see myself with an abyss in my nature full of infernal possibilities. I think I am hewn in black rock. A woman who can do as I did by instinct needs to have an angel always near her if she has not a husband she reveres. We are none of us better than you, dear Tony. Only some are more fortunate, and many are cowards, Emma said. You acted prudently in a wretched situation, partly of your own making, partly of the circumstances. But a nature like yours could not sit still and moan. That marriage was to blame. The English notion of women seems to be that we are born white sheep or black. Circumstances have nothing to do with our colour. They dread to grant distinctions, and to judge of us discerningly is beyond them. Whether the fiction that their homes are purer than elsewhere helps to establish the fact, I do not know. There is a class that does live honestly, and at any rate it springs from a liking for purity, but I am sure that their method of impressing it on women has the dangers of things artificial. They narrow their understanding of human nature, and that is not the way to improve the breed. I suppose we women are taken to be the second thoughts of the Creator. Human nature's fringes, mere finishing touches, not a part of the texture, said Diana. The pretty ornamentation. However, I fancy I perceive some tolerance growing in the minds of the dominant sex. Our old lawyer, Mr. Braddock, who appears to have no distaste for conversations with me, assures me he expects the day to come when women will be encouraged to work at crafts and professions for their independence. That is the secret of the opinion of us at present, our dependency. Give us the means of independence, and we will gain it, and have a turn at judging you, my lords. You shall behold a world reversed. Whenever I am distracted by existing circumstances, I lay my finger on the material conditions, and I touch the secret individually it may be moral with us collectively it is material gross wrongs gross hungers i am a married rebel and thereof comes the social rebel i was once a dancing and singing girl you remember the night of the dublin ball a channel sea in uproar stirred by witches flows between you are as lovely as you were then i could say lovelier said emma I was unconquerable health, and I wish I could give you the half of it, dear. I work late into the night, and I wake early and fresh in the morning. I do not sing, that is all. A few days more, and my character will be up before the bull's head to face him in the arena. The worst of a position like mine is that it causes me incessantly to think and talk of myself. I believe I think less than I talk, but the subject is growing stale as those who are long dying feel, I dare say, if they do not take it as the compensation for their departure. The bull's head, or British jury of twelve, with the wig on it, was faced during the latter half of a week of good news. First, Mr. Thomas Redworth was returned to Parliament by a stout majority for the borough of Orybridge. The Honourable Percy Dacier delivered a brilliant speech in the House of Commons, necessarily pleasing to his uncle, Lord Larian obtained the command of the rock. The house of the crossways was let to a tenant approved by Mr. Braddock. Diana received the opening proof-sheets of her little volume, and an instalment of the modest honorarium. And finally, the plaintiff in the suit involving her name was adjudged to have not proved his charge. She heard of it without a change of countenance. She could not have wished it the reverse. She was exonerated but she was not free far from that and she revenged herself on the friends who made much of her triumph and overlooked her plight by showing no sign of satisfaction there was in her bosom a revolt at the legal consequences of the verdict or blunt acquiescence of the law in the conditions possibly to be imposed on her unless she went straight to the relieving file and the burden of keeping it under set her wildest humour alight somewhat as redworth remembered of her in the journey from the crossways to copsley this ironic fury coming of the contrast of the outer and the inner 
would have been indulged to the extent of permanent injury to her disposition, had not her beloved Emma, immediately after the tension of the struggle ceased, required her tenderest aid. Lady Dunstan chanted victory, and at night collapsed. By the advice of her physician she was removed to Copsley, where Diana's labour of anxious nursing restored her, through love, to a saner spirit. The hopefulness of life must bloom again in the heart of whose prayers are offered for a life dearer than its own to be preserved. A little return of confidence in Sir Lucan also refreshed her when she saw that the poor creature did honestly, in his shaggy rough male fashion, reverence and cling to the flower of souls he named as his wife. His piteous groans of self-accusation during the crisis haunted her, and made the conduct and nature of men a bewilderment to her still young understanding. Save for the knot of her sensations, hardly a mental memory but a sullen knot, which she did not disentangle to charge him with his complicity in the blind rashness of her marriage, she might have felt sisterly, as warmly as she compassionated him. It was midwinter when Dame Gossip, who keeps the exotic world alive with her fanning whispers, related that the lovely Mrs. Warwick had left England on board the schooner yacht Clarissa with Lord and Lady Escart, for a voyage in the Mediterranean, and, behind her hand, that the reason was urgent inasmuch as she fled to escape the meshes of the terrific net of the marital law brutally whirled to capture her by the man her husband. End of chapter 14「the gods of this world's contests, against whom our poor stripped individual is commonly in revolt, are, as we know, not miners, they are reapers. And if we appear no longer on the surface, they cease to bruise us. They will allow an arena character to be cleansed and made presentable, while enthusiastic friends preserve discretion. It is, of course, less than magnanimity. They are not proposed to you for your worship. They are little gods, temporary as that great wave, their parent human mass of the hour. But they have one worshipful element in them, which is the divine insistency upon their being two sides to a case, to every case, and the people, so far directed by them, may boast of healthfulness. Let the individual shriek, the innocent, triumphant, have in honesty to admit the fact. One side is vanquished according to the decree of law, but the superior council does not allow it to be extinguished. Diana's battle was fought shadowily behind her for the space of a week or so, with some advocates on behalf of the beaten man. Then it became a recollection of a beautiful woman, possibly erring, misvalued by a husband, who was neither a man of the world nor a gracious yoke fellow, nor anything to match her. She, however, once out of the public flames, had to recall her scorchings to be gentle with herself. Under a defeat, she would have been angrily self-vindicated. The victory of the ashen laurels drove her mind inward to gird at the hateful yoke, in compassion for its pair of victims. Quite earnestly by such means, yet always bearing a comical eye on her subterfuges, she escaped the extremes of personal blame. Those advocates of her opponent, in and out of court, compelled her honest heart to search within and own to faults. But were they not natural faults? It was her marriage, it was marriage in the abstract, her own mistake and the world's clumsy machinery of civilization. These were the capital offenders, not the wife who would laugh ringingly and would have friends of the other sex, and shot her epigrams at the helpless despot, and was at times, yes, vixenish, a nature driven to it, but that was the word. 
she was too generous to recount her charges against the vanquished. If his wretched jealousy had ruined her, the secret high tribunal within her bosom, which judged her guiltless for putting the sword between their marriage tie when they stood as one, because a quarrelling couple could not in honour play the embracing, pronounced him just pardonable. She distinguished that he could only suppose, manlikely, one bad cause for the division. To this extent she used her unerring brains, more openly than on her night of debate at the crossways. The next moment she was off in vapour, meditating grandly on her independence of her sex and the passions. Love. She did not know it. She was not acquainted with either the criminal or the domestic god, and persuaded herself that she never could be. She was a Diana of coldness, preferring friendship. She could be the friend of men. There was another who could be the friend of women. Her heart leapt to Redworth, conjuring up his clear, trusty face, at their grasp of hands when parting. She thought of her visions of her future about the period of the Dublin Ball, and acknowledged, despite the erratic step to wedlock, again in having met and proved so true a friend. His face, figure, character, lightest look, lightest word, all were loyal signs of a man of honour, cold as she. He was the man to whom she could have opened her heart for inspection. Rejoicing in her independence of an emotional sex, the impulsive woman burned with a regret that at their parting, she had not broken down conventional barriers and given her cheek to his lips in the anti-insular fashion with a brotherly friend. And why not when both were cold? Spirit to spirit she did delightfully, refreshed by her capacity to do so without a throb. He had held her hands and looked into her eyes half a minute, like a dear comrade, as little arousing her instincts of defensiveness as the clearing heavens and sisterly love, for it was his due, a sister's kiss. He needed a sister, and should have one in her. Emma's recollected talk of Tom Redworth painted him from head to foot, brought the living man over the waters to the deck of the yacht. A stout champion in the person of Tom Redworth was left on British land. But for some reason past analysis, intermixed, that is, among a swarm of sensations, Diana named her champion to herself with the formal prefix, perhaps because she knew a man's Christian name to be dangerous handling. They differed besides frequently in opinion, when the habit of thinking of him as Mr. Redworth would be best. Women are bound to such small observances, and especially the beautiful of the sisterhood, whom the world soon warns that they carry explosives, and must particularly guard against the ignition of petty sparks. She was less indiscreet in her thoughts than in her acts, as is the way with the reflective daughter of impulse, though she had fine mental distinctions, what she could offer to do spirit to spirit, for instance, held nothing to her mind of the intimacy of calling the gentleman plain Tom in mere contemplation of him. Her friend and champion was a volunteer, far from a mercenary, and he deserved the reward, if she could bestow it unalarmed. They were to meet in Egypt. Meanwhile, England loomed the home of hostile forces, ready to shock, had she been a visible planet, and ready to secrete a virus of her past history, had she been making new. She was happily away borne by a whiter than swan's wing on the sapphire mediterranean her letters to emma were peeps of splendour for the invalid her way of life on board the yacht and sketches of her host and hostess as lovers in wedlock on the other side of our perilous forties sketches of the bays the towns the people priests dames cavaliers urchins infants shifting groups of supple southerners flashed across the page like a web of silk and were dashed off redolent of herself as lightly as the silvery spray of the blue waves she furrowed telling without allusions to the land behind her that she had dipped in the wells of blissful oblivion emma dunstan as is usual with those who receive exhilarating correspondence from makers of books condemned the authoress in comparison, and now first saw that she had the gift of writing. Only one cry, 
Italy, Eden of Exiles, betrayed the seeming of a moan. She wrote of her poet and others immediately. Thither had they fled, with adieu to England. How many have waved the adieu? And it is England nourishing, England protecting them, England clothing them in the honours they wear. Only the posturing, lower natures, on the level of their buskins, can pluck out the pocket-knife of sentimental spite to cut themselves loose from her at heart in earnest. The higher, bleed as they may, too pressingly feel their debt. Diana had the Celtic vivid sense of country. In England she was Irish by hereditary and by willful opposition. Abroad, gazing along the waters, observing, comparing, reflecting, above all, reading of the struggles at home, the things done and attempted, her soul of generosity made her, though not less Irish, a daughter of Britain. It is at a distance that striving countries should be seen if we would have them in the pure idea, and this young woman of fervid mind, a reader of public speeches and speculator on the tides of politics, desirous further to feel herself rather more in the pure idea, began to yearn for England long before her term of holiday exile had ended. She had been flattered by her friend, her wedded martyr at the stake, as she named him, to believe that she could exercise a judgment in politics, could think even speak acutely on public affairs. The reports of speeches delivered by the men she knew or knew of set her thrilling, and she fancied the sensibility to be as independent of her sympathy with the orators as her political notions were sovereignty above a sex devoted to trifles, and the feelings of a woman who had gone through fire. She fancied it confidently, notwithstanding a peculiar intuition, that the plunge into the nobler business of the world would be a haven of safety for a woman with blood and imagination when writing to Emma, Mr. Redworth's great success in Parliament is good in itself, whatever his views of present questions, and I do not heed them when I look to what may be done by a man of such power in striking at unjust laws which keep the really numerically better half of the population in a state of slavery. If he had been a lawyer, it must be a lawyer's initiative, a lawyer's bill. Mr. Percy Dacier also spoke well, as might have been expected, and his uncle's compliment to him was merited. Should you meet him, sound him. He has read for the bar, and is younger than Mr. Redworth. The very young men and the old are our hope. The middle-aged are hard and fast for existing facts. We pick our leaders on the slopes, the incline and decline of the mountain, not on the upper tableland midway, where all appears to men so solid, so tolerably smooth, save for a few excrescences, roughnesses, gradually to be levelled at their leisure, which induces one to protest that the middle age of men is their time of delusion. It is no paradox. They may be publicly useful in a small way. I do not deny it at all. They must be near the gates of life, the opening or the closing, for their minds to be accessible to the urgency of the greater questions. Otherwise the world presents itself to them under too settled an aspect. Unless, of course, Vesuvian revolution shakes the land, and that touches only their nerves. I dream of some old judge. There is one, if having caught we could keep him, but I dread so tricksy a pilot. You have guessed him, the ancient Puck. We have laughed all day over the paper, telling us of his worrying the lords. Lady Esgart congratulates her husband on being out of it. Puck, bien ridé, and bewigged, might perhaps, except that at the critical moment he would be sure to plead allegiance to Oberon. However, the work will be performed by someone, I am prophetic, when maidens are grandmothers, when your Tony is wearing a perpetual laugh in the unhusbanded regions, where there is no institution of the wedding tie for the reason that she was not to participate in the result of the old judge's or young hero's happy championship of the cause of her sex. 
she conceived her separateness high aloof, and actually supposed she was a contemplative, simple, speculative, political spirit, impersonal, albeit a woman. This, as Emma, smiling at the lines, had not to learn, was always her secret pride of fancy, the belief in her possession of a disengaged intellect. The strange illusion, so clearly exposed to her correspondent, was maintained through a series of letters very slightly descriptive, dated from the Piraeus, the Bosphorus, the coasts of the Crimea, all more or less relating to the latest news of the journals received on board the yacht, and of English visitors fresh from the country she now seemed fond of calling home. Politics and gentle allusions to the curious exhibition of love in marriage, shown by her amiable host and hostess, these dear escorts, who are never tired of one another, but courtly courting, tempting me to think it possible that a fortunate selection and a mutual deference may subscribe to human happiness, filled the paragraphs. Reviews of her first literary venture were mentioned once. I was well advised by Mr. Redworth in putting Antonia for authoress. She is a buff jerkin to the stripes, and I suspect that the signature of D.E.M. written in full would have cawed woefully to hear that her style is affected, her character's nullities, her cleverness forced, etc., etc., as it is, I have much the same contempt for poor Antonia's performance. Cease panning, little fool. She writes, With some comprehension of the passion of love. I know her to be a stranger to the earliest cry. Do you see, dear, that utter ignorance is the mother of the art? Dialogues, occasionally pointed. She has a sister who may do better, but why was I not apprenticed to a serviceable profession or a trade? I perceive now that a hanger-on of the market had no right to expect a happier fate than mine has been. On the Nile, in the winter of the year, Diana met the Honourable Percy Dacier. He was introduced to her at Cairo by Redworth. The two gentlemen had struck up a House of Commons acquaintanceship and finding themselves bound for the same destination, had grown friendly. Redworth's arrival had been pleasantly expected. She remarked on Dacier's presence to Emma, without sketch or note of him, as other than much esteemed by Lord and Lady Esquart. These, with Diana, Redworth, Dacier, the German Eastern traveller Schweizerbarth, and the French consul and Egyptologist Duriette, composed a voyaging party up the river, of which expedition Redworth was Lady Dunstan's chief writer of the records. His novel perceptiveness and shrewdness of touch made them amusing, and his tenderness to the beauty's coquetry between the two foreign rivals moved a deeper feeling. The German had a guitar, the Frenchman a voice. Diana joined them in harmony. They complained apart severally of the accompaniment and the singer. Our English criticise them apart, and that is at any rate to occupy a post, though it contributes nothing to entertainment. At home the Esquarts had sung duets. Diana had assisted Redworth's manly chest notes at the piano. Each of them declined to be vocal. Diana sang alone for the credit of the country, Italian and French songs, Irish also. She was in her mood of Planksty Kelly and Gary Owen all the way. Madame est Irlandaise, Redworth heard the Frenchman say, and he owned to what was implied in the answering tone of the question, We should be dull dogs without the Irish leaven. So Tony in exile still managed to do something for her darling Erin. The solitary woman on her heights at Copsley raised an exclamation of, Oh, that those two had been or could be united! She was conscious of a mystic symbolism in the prayer. She was not apprehensive of any ominous intervention of another. Writing from Venice, Diana mentioned Mr. Percy Dacier as being engaged to an heiress, a Miss Asper, niece of a mighty shipowner, Mr. Quinton Manx, Lady Esquart tells me. Money fabulous and necessary to a younger son devoured with ambition. The elder brother, Lord Creedmore, is a common nimrod, 
always absent in Hungary, Russia, America, hunting somewhere. Mr. Dacier will be in the cabinet with the next ministry. No more of him. A new work by Antonia was progressing. The summer in South Tyrol passed like a royal procession before young eyes for Diana, and at the close of it, descending the Stelvio, idling through the Valtelline, Como Lake was reached, Diana, full of her work, living the double life of the author. At Bellagio, one afternoon, Mr. Percy Dacier appeared. She remembered subsequently a disappointment she felt in not beholding Mr. Redworth, either with him or displacing him. If engaged to a lady, he was not an ardent suitor, nor was he a pointedly complimentary acquaintance. His enthusiasm was reserved for Italian scenery. She had already formed a sort of estimate of his character, as an indifferent observer may do, and any woman previous to the inflaming of her imagination, if that is in store for her. And she now fell to work, resetting the puzzle it became as soon her positive conclusions had to be shaped again. "'But women never can know young men,' she wrote to Emma, after praising his good repute as one of the brotherhood. "'He drops pretty sentences now and then, no compliments, milky nuts. "'Of course he has a head, or he would not be where he is, "'and that seems always to be the most enviable place a young man can occupy.' "'She observed in him a singular conflicting of a buoyant animal nature "'with a curb of studiousness.' as if the fardels of age were piling on his shoulders before youth had quitted its pastures. His build of limbs and his features were those of the finely bred English. He had the English taste for sports, games, manly diversions, and in the bloom of life, under thirty, his head was given to bend. The head bending on a tall, upright figure, where there was breadth of chest, told of weights working. She recollected his open look, larger than inquiring, at the introduction to her, and it recurred when she uttered anything specially taking. What it meant was past a guess, though comparing it with the frank directness of Redworth's eyes, she saw the difference between a look that accepted her and one that dilated on two opinions. Her thought of the gentleman was of a brilliant young charioteer in the ruck of the race, watchful for his chance to push to the front, and she could have said that a dubious consort might spoil a promising career. It flattered her to think that she sometimes prompted him, sometimes illumined. He repeated sentences she had spoken. I shall be better able to describe Mr. Dacier when you and I sit together, my Emmy, and a stroke here and there completes the painting. Set descriptions are good for puppets. Living men and women are too various in the mixture fashioning them, even the external presentment, to be livingly rendered in a formal sketch. I may tell you his eyes are pale blue, his features regular, his hair silky brownish, his legs long, his head rather stooping, only the head, his mouth commonly closed. These are the facts, and you have seen much the same in a nursery doll." Such literary craft is of the nursery. So with landscapes. The art of the pen, we write on darkness, is to rouse the inward vision, instead of laboring with a drop-scene brush, as if it were to the eye, because our flying minds cannot contain a protracted description. That is why the poets, who spring imagination with a word or a phrase, paint lasting pictures. The Shakespearean, the Dantesque, are in a line, two at most. He lends an attentive ear when I speak, agrees, or has a quaint pucker of the eyebrows dissenting inwardly. He lacks mental liveliness, cheerfulness, I should say, and is thankful to have it imparted. One suspects he would be a dull domestic companion. He has a veritable thirst for hopeful views of the world, and no spiritual distillery of his own. He leans to depression. Why? The broken reed you call your Tony carries a cargo, all of her manufacture. She reeks of secret stills. And here is a young man, a sapling oak, inclined to droop. His nature has an air of imploring me, que je la rose. I begin to perform Mrs. Dr. Pangloss on purpose to brighten him, 
the mind, the views. He is not altogether deficient in conversational gaiety, and he shines in exercise. But the world is a poor old ball, bounding down a hill, to an Irish melody in the evening generally by request. So far of Mr. Percy Dacier, of whom I have some hopes, distant, perhaps delusive, that he may be of use to our cause, he listens. It is an auspicious commencement. Lugano is the Italian lake most lovingly encircled by mountain arms, and every height about it may be scaled with ease. The heights have their nest of waters below for a home scene, the southern Swiss peaks, with celestial Monte Rosa in prospect. It was there that Diana reawakened, after the trance of a deadly draught, to the glory of the earth and her share in it. She wakened like the princess of the kiss, happily not to kisses, to no sign, touch, or call that she could trace backward. The change befell her without a warning. After writing deliberately to her friend Emma, she laid down her pen and thought of nothing, and into this dreamfulness a wine passed, filling her veins, suffusing her mind, quickening her soul, and coming whence, out of the yonder of air. She could have imagined a seraphic presence in the room that bade her arise and live, take the cup of the wells of youth arrested at her lips by her marriage, quit her wintry bondage for warmth, light, space, the quick of simple being. And the strange pure ecstasy was not a transient electrification. It came in waves on a continuous tide, looking was living, walking, flying. She hardly knew that she slept. The heights she had seen rosy at eve were marked for her ascent in the dawn. Sleep was one wink, and fresh as the dewy field and rock flowers on her way upward, she sprang to more and more of heaven, insatiable, happily chirruping over her possessions. The threading of the town among the dear common people before others were abroad was a pleasure and pleasant her solitariness, threading the gardens at the base of the rock only she astir, and the first rough steps of the winding footpath, the first closed buds, the sharper air, the uprising of the mountain with her ascent. And pleasant, too, was her hunger, and the nibble at the little loaf of bread. A linnet sang in her breast, an eagle lifted her feet. The feet were verily winged, as they are in a season of youth when the blood leaps to light from the pressure of the under-forces, like a source at the wellheads, and the whole creature blooms vital in every energy as a spirit. To be a girl again was magical. She could fancy her having risen from the dead. And to be a girl, with a woman's broader vision and receptiveness of soul, with knowledge of evil, and winging to ethereal happiness, this was a revelation of our human powers. She attributed the change to the influences of nature's beauty and grandeur. Nor had her woman's consciousness to play the chrysalis in any shy recesses of her heart. She was nowhere veiled or torpid. She was illumined, like the salvator she saw in the evening beams and mounted in the mornings. And she had not a spot of secrecy. All her nature flew and bloomed. She was bird, flower, flowing river, a quivering sensibility unweighted, unshrouded. Desires and hopes would surely have weighted and shrouded her. She had none, save for the upper air, the eyes of the mountain. Which was the dream, her past life, or this ethereal existence? But this ran spontaneously, and the other had often been stimulated, her vivaciousness on the Nile-boat for recent example. She had not a doubt that her past life was the dream, or deception, and for the reason that now she was compassionate, large of heart toward all beneath her. Let them but leave her free, they were forgiven, even to prayers for their well-being. The plural number in the case was an involuntary multiplying of the single, coming of her incapacity during this elevation and rapture of the senses, to think distinctly of that one who had discoloured her opening life. Freedom to breathe, gaze, climb, grow with the grasses, fly with the clouds, 
to muse, to sing, to be an unclaimed self, dispersed upon earth, air, sky, to find a keener transfigured self in that radiation, she craved no more. Bear in mind her beauty, her charm of tongue, her present state of white simplicity in fervour. Was there ever so perilous a woman for the most guarded and clearest-eyed of young men to meet at early morn upon a mountain-side? End of chapter 15「Diana of the Crossways」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter 16. Treats of a Midnight Bell and of a Scene of Early Morning. On a round of the mountains rising from Astino, southeastward of Lugano, the escort party rose from the natural grotto and headed their carriages up and down the defiles, halting for a night at Rovio, a little village below the Generoso, lively with waterfalls and watercourses, and they fell so in love with the place that after roaming along the flowery borderways by moonlight, they resolved to rest there two or three days and try some easy ascents. In the diurnal course of nature, being pleasantly tired, they had the avowed intention of sleeping there, so they went early to their beds and carelessly wished one another good night, none of them supposing slumber to be anywhere one of the warlike arts, a paradoxical thing you must battle for, and can only win at last when utterly beaten. Hard by their inn, close enough for a priestly homily to have been audible, stood a church campanile wherein hung a bell, not ostensibly communicating with the demons of the pit. In daylight, rather a merry comrade. But at night, when the children of nerves lay stretched, he threw off the mask. As soon as they had fairly nestled, he smote their pillows a shattering blow, loud for the retold preluding quarters, incredibly clanging the number ten. Then he waited for neighbouring Campanile to box the ears of slumber's votaries in turn, whereupon, under pretence of excessive conscientiousness, or else oblivious of his antecedent damnable misconduct, or perhaps in actual league and trapdoor conspiracy with the surging goblin hosts beneath us, he resumed his blaring strokes, a sonorous recapitulation of the number, all the others likewise. It was an alarum fit to warn of Attila or Alaric, and not simply the maniacal noise invaded the fruitful provinces of sleep like Hun and Vandal. The irrational repetition ploughed the minds of those unhappy somnivolent, leaving them worse than sheared by barbarians, disrupt as by earthquake, with the unanswerable question to Providence, Why? Why twice? Designing slumberers are such infants. When they have undressed and stretched themselves flat, it seems that they have really gone back to their mother's breasts, and they fret at whatsoever does not smack of nature or custom. The cause of a repetition so senseless in its violence and so unnecessary set them querying and kicking until the inevitable quarters recommenced, then rose an insurgent rabble in their bosoms, it might be the loosened imps of darkness urging them to speculate whether the proximate monster, about to dole out the eleventh hour in uproar, would again forget himself and repeat his dreary arithmetic a second time, for they were unaware of his religious obligation following the hour of the district to inform them of the tardy hour of Rome. They waited in suspense, curiosity enabling them to bear the first crash callously. His performance was the same, and now they took him for a crazy engine whose madness had infected the whole neighbourhood. Now was the moment to fight for sleep in contempt of him, and they began by simulating an entry into the fortress they were to defend, plunging on their pillows, battening down their eyelids, breathing with a dreadful regularity. Alas, it came to their knowledge that the bell was in possession, and they the besiegers. Every resonant quarter was anticipated up to the blow, without averting its murderous abruptness, 
and an executioner midnight that sounded, in addition to the reiterated quarters, four and twenty ringing hammer strokes, with the aching pause between the twelves, left them the prey of the legions of torturers which are summed, though not described, in the title of a sleepless night. From that period the curse was milder, but the victims raged. They swam on vasty deeps, they knocked at rusty gates, they shouldered all the weapons of black insomnia's armory, and became her soldiery, doing her will upon themselves. Of her originally sprang the inspired teaching of the doom of men to excruciation in endlessness. She is the fountain of the infinite ocean whereon the exceedingly sensitive soul is tumbled everlastingly with the diversion of hot pincers to appease its appetite for change. Dacier was never the best of sleepers. He had taken to exercise his brains prematurely, not only in learning, but also in reflection, and a reflectiveness that is indulged before we have a rigid mastery of the emotions, or have slain them, is apt to make a young man more than commonly a child of nerves, nearly as much so as the dissipated, with the difference that they are hilarious while wasting their treasury, which he is not, and he may recover under favouring conditions, which is a point of vantage denied to them. Physically he had stout reserves, for he had not disgraced the temple. His intemperateness lay in the craving to rise and lead, a precocious ambition. This apparently modest young man started with an aim, and if in the distance and with but a sling-stone, like the slender shepherd fronting the Philistine, all his energies were in his aim at government. He had hung on the fringe of an administration. His party was out, and he hoped for higher station on its return to power. Many perplexities were therefore buzzing about his head, among them at present one sufficiently magnified and voracious to swallow the remainder. He added force to the interrogation as to why that bell should sound its inhuman strokes twice, by asking himself why he was there to hear it. A strange suspicion of a bewitchment might have enlightened him, if he had been a man accustomed to yield to the peculiar kind of sorcery issuing from that sex. He rather despised the power of women over men, and nevertheless he was there listening to that bell instead of having obeyed the call of his family duties, when the latter were urgent. He had received letters at Lugano, summoning him home, before he set forth on his present expedition. The noisy alarum told him he floundered in quags, like a silly creature chasing a marsh lamp. But was it so? Was it not, on the contrary, a serious pursuit of the secret of a woman's character? Oh, a woman and her character! Ordinary women and their characters might set to work to get what relationship and likeness they could. They had no secret to allure. This one had. She had the secret of lake waters under rock unfathomable in limpidness. He could not think of her without shooting at nature, and nature's very sweetest and subtlest for comparison. As to her sex, his active man's contempt of the petticoated secret attractive to boys and graylings made him believe that in her he hunted the mind and the spirit, perchance a double mind, a twilighted spirit, but not a mere woman." She bore no resemblance to the bundle of women. Well, she was worth studying. She had ideas, and could give ear to ideas. Furthermore, a couple of the members of his family inclined to do her injustice. At least they judged her harshly, owing, he thought, to an inveterate opinion they held regarding Lord Dannisburgh's obliquity in relation to women. He shared it, and did not concur in their verdict upon the woman implicated, that is to say, knowing something of her now, he could see the possibility of her innocence in the special charm that her mere sparkle of features and speech and her freshness would have for a man like his uncle. The possibility pleaded strongly on her behalf, while the darker possibility, weighted by his uncle's reputation, plucked at him from below. She was delightful to hear, 
delightful to see, and her friends loved her and had faith in her. So clever a woman might be too clever for her friends. The circle he moved in hummed of women, prompting novices as well as veterans to suspect that the multitude of them, and notably the fairest, yet more the cleverest, concealed the serpent somewhere. She certainly had not directed any of her arts upon him. Besides, he was half engaged, and that was a burning perplexity. Not because of abstract scruples touching the necessity for love in marriage, the young lady, great heiress though she was, and willing, as she allowed him to assume, graceful too, reputed a beauty, struck him cold. He fancied her transparent, only arctic. Her transparency displayed to him all the common virtues, and a serene possession of the inestimable and eminent one outweighing all, but charm, wit, ardour, intercommunicative quickness, and kindling beauty, airy grace, were qualities that a man, it seemed, had to look for in women, spotted by a doubt of their having the chief and priceless. However, he was not absolutely plighted, nor did it matter to him whether this or that woman concealed the tale of the serpent and trail, excepting the singular interest this woman managed to excite, and so deeply as set him wondering how that resurrection bell might be affecting her ability to sleep. Was she sleeping or waking? His nervous imagination was a torch that alternately lighted her lying asleep with the innocent like a babe and tossing beneath the overflow of her dark hair, hounded by haggard memories. She fluttered before him in either aspect, and another perplexity now was to distinguish within himself which was the aspect he preferred. Great nature brought him thus to drink of her beauty, under the delusion that the act was a speculation on her character. The bell with its clash, throb, and long swoon of sound reminded him of her name, Diana, an attribute or a derision. It really mattered nothing to him, save for her being maligned, and if most unfairly, then that the face of the varying expressions and the rich voice and the remembered gentle and taking words coming from her appealed to him with a supplicating vividness that pricked his heart to leap. He was dozing when the bell burst through the thin division between slumber and wakefulness, recounting what seemed innumerable peals hard on his cranium. Grey daylight blanched the window and the bed. His watch said five of the morning. He thought of the pleasure of a bath beneath some dashing spray showers, and jumped up to dress, feeling a queer sensation of skin in his clothes, the sign of a feverish night, and yawning he went into the air. Leftward, the narrow village street led to the footway along which he could make for the mountain wall. He cast one look at the head of the campanile, silly as an owlish roisterer's glazed stare at the young Aurora, and hurried his feet to check the yawns coming alarmingly fast in the place of ideas. His elevation above the valley was about the kneecap of the Generoso. Waters of past rain clouds poured down the mountain sides like veins of metal here and there flinging off a shower on the busy descent, only dubiously animate in the lacklustre of the huge bulk piled against a yellow east that wafted fleets of pinky cloudlets overhead. He mounted his path to a level with inviting grass mounds where water circled, running from scoops and cups to curves and brook streams, and in his fancy calling to him to hear them. To dip in them was his desire, to roll and shiver braced by the icy flow, was the spell to break that baleful incantation of the intolerable night. So he struck across a ridge of boulders, wreck of a landslip from the height he had hugged, to the open space of shadowed undulations, and soon had his feet on turf. Heights to right and to left, and in between them, aloft, a sky the rosy wheel-course of the chariot of morn, and below among the knolls, choice of sheltered nooks, where waters whispered of secrecy to satisfy Diana herself. They have that whisper and waving of secrecy in secret scenery, they beckon to the bath, and they conjure classic visions of the pudency of the goddess irate or unsighted. 
the semi-mythological state of mind, built of old images and favouring haunts, was known to Dacier. The name of Diana, playing vaguely on his consciousness, helped to it. He had no definite thought of the mortal woman when the highest grass roll near the rock gave him view of a bowered source and of a pool under a chain of cascades, bounded by polished shelves and slabs. The very spot for him, he decided at the first peep, and at the second, with fingers instinctively loosening his waistcoat buttons for a commencement, he shouldered round and strolled away, though not at a rapid pace, nor far before he halted. That it could be no other than she, the figure he had seen standing beside the pool, he was sure. Why had he turned? Thoughts thick and swift as a blush in the cheeks of seventeen overcame him, and queen of all, the thought bringing the picture of this mountain solitude to vindicate a woman shamefully assailed. She, who found her pleasure in these haunts of nymph and goddess, at the fresh cold bosom of nature, must be clear as day. She trusted herself to the loneliness here, and to the honour of men from a like irreflective sincereness. She was unable to imagine danger, where her own impelling thirst was pure. The thoughts, it will be discerned, were but flashes of a momentary vivid sensibility. Where a woman's charm has won half the battle, her character is an advancing standard, and sings victory, let her do no more than take a quiet morning walk before breakfast. But why had he turned his back on her? There was nothing in his presence to alarm, nothing in her appearance to forbid. The motive and the movement were equally quaint, incomprehensible to him, for after putting himself out of sight, he understood the absurdity of the supposition that she would seek the secluded sylvan bath for the same purpose as he. Yet now he was debarred from going to meet her. She might have an impulse to bathe her feet. Her name was Diana. Yes, and a married woman, and a proclaimed one. And notwithstanding those brassy facts, he was ready to side with the evidence declaring her free from stain, and further to swear that her blood was Diana's. Nor had Dacier ever been particularly poetical about women. The present Diana had wakened his curiosity, had stirred his interest in her, pricked his admiration, but gradually, until a sleepless night with its flock of raven fancies under that dominant bell, ended by colouring her the moment she stood in his eyes, as freshly as the morning heavens. We are much influenced in youth by sleepless nights. They disarm, they predispose us to submit to soft occasion, and in our youth occasion is always coming. He heard her voice. She had risen up the grass mound, and he hung brooding halfway down. She was dressed in some texture of the hue of lavender. A violet scarf, loosely knotted over the bosom, opened on her throat. The loop of her black hair curved under a hat of grey beaver. Memorably radiant was her face. They met, exchanged greetings, praised the beauty of the morning, and struck together on the bell. She laughed. I heard it at ten. I slept till four. I never wake later. I was out in the air by half-past. Were you disturbed? He alluded to his troubles with the bell. It sounded like a felon's heart in skeleton ribs, he said. Or a proser's tongue in a hollow skull, said she. He bowed to her conversable readiness, and at once fell into the background, as he did only with her to perform accordant bass in their dialogue. For when a woman lightly caps our strained remarks, we gallantly surrender the leadership, lest she should too cuttingly assert her claim. Some sweet wild cyclamen flowers were at her breast. She held in her left hand a bunch of buds and blown cups of the pale purple meadow crocus. He admired them. She told him to look round. He confessed to not having noticed them in the grass. What was the name? Colchicum in botany, she said. These are plucked to be sent to a friend, otherwise I'm reluctant to take the life of flowers for a whim. Wild flowers, I mean. I am not sentimental about garden flowers. They are cultivated for decoration, grown for clipping. 
"'I suppose they don't carry the same signification,' said Dacier, in the tone of a pupil to such themes. "'They carry no feeling,' said she, "'and that is my excuse for plucking these, where they seem to spring like our town dream of happiness. I believe they are sensible of it, too, but these must do service to my invalid friend who cannot travel. Are you ever as much interested in the woes of great ladies as of country damsels?' "'I am not, not unless they have natural distinction.' "'You have met Lady Dunstan?' "'The question sounded artless. "'Dacier answered that he thought he had seen her somewhere once, "'and Diana shut her lips on a rising under-smile. "'She is the cour d'or of our time, "'the one soul I would sacrifice these flowers to. "'A bit of a blue stocking, I think I have heard said. "'She might have been admitted to the Hotel Rambouillet "'without being anything of a précieuse. "'She is the woman of the largest heart now beating.' Mr. Redworth talked of her. As she deserved, I am sure. Very warmly. He would. He told me you were the Damon and Pythias of women. Her one fault is an extreme humility that makes her always play second to me, and as I am apt to gabble, I take the lead, and I am froth in comparison. I can reverence my superiors even when tried by intimacy with them. She is the next heavenly thing to heaven that I know. Court her, if ever you come across her, or have you a man's horror of women with brains. Am I expressing it? said he. Do not breathe London or Paris here on me. She fanned the crocuses under her chin. The early morning always has this, I wish I had a word, touch, whisper, gleam, beat of wings. I envy poets now more than ever. Of Eden, I was going to say. Prose can paint evening and moonlight, but poets are needed to sing the dawn. That is because prose is equal to melancholy stuff. Gladness requires the finer language. Otherwise we have it coarse, anything but a reproduction. You politicians despise the little distinctions twixt Tweedledum and Tweedledee, I fancy. Of the poetic sort, Dacier's uncle certainly did. For himself, he confessed to not having thought much on them. "'But how divine is utterance,' she said, "'as we to the brutes, poets are to us.' He listened somewhat with the head of the hanged. A beautiful woman, choosing to rhapsodize, has her way, and is not subjected to the critical commentary within us. He wondered whether she had discoursed in such a fashion to his uncle. "'I can read good poetry,' said he. If you would have this valley, or mountain cleft, one should call it, described, only verse could do it for you, Diana pursued, and stopped, glanced at his face, and smiled. She had spied the end of a towel peeping out of one of his pockets. You came out for a bath. Go back, by all means, and mount that rise of grass where you first saw me, and down on the other side, a little to the right, you will find the very place for a bath, at a corner of the rock, a natural fountain, a bubbling pool in a ring of brushwood with falling water, so tempting that I could have pardoned a push, about five feet deep. Lose no time. He begged to assure her that he would rather stroll with her. It had been only a notion of bathing by chance when he pocketed the towel. Dear me, she cried, if I had been a man I should have scurried off at a signal of release, quick as a hare I once woke up in a field with my foot on its back. Dacier's eyebrows knotted a trifle over her eagerness to dismiss him. He was not used to it, but rather to be courted by women, and to condescend. "'I shall not long, I'm afraid, have the pleasure of walking beside you and hearing you. I had letters at Lugano. My uncle is unwell, I hear.' "'Lord Dannisburg?' The name sprang from her lips unhesitatingly. His nodded affirmative altered her face and her voice. "'It is not a grave illness.' They rather fear it. You had the news at Lugano? He answered the implied reproach. I can be of no service. But surely... It's even doubtful that he would be bothered to receive me. We hold no views in common, excepting one. Could I, she exclaimed, oh, that I might, if he is really ill, but if it is actually serious, he would perhaps have a wish. I can nurse. I know I have the power to cheer him. You ought indeed to be in England. 
Dacier said he thought it better to wait for later reports. I shall drive to Lugano this afternoon and act on the information I get there. Probably it ends my holiday. Will you do me the favour to write me a word? And especially, tell me if you think he would like to have me near him, said Diana, and let him know that if he wants nursing or cheerful companionship, I am at any moment ready to come. The flattery of a beautiful young woman to wait on him would be very agreeable to Lord Dannisburg, Dacier conceived. Her offer to go was possibly purely charitable, but the prudence of her occupation of the post obscured whatever appeared admirable in her devotedness. Her choice of a man like Lord Dannisburg for a friend to whom she could sacrifice her good name less falteringly than she had gathered those field flowers was inexplicable, and she herself a darker riddle at each step of his reading. He promised curtly to write, I'll do my best to hit a flying address. Your club enables me to hit a permanent one that will establish the communication, said Diana. We shall not sleep another night at Rovio. Lady Escart is the lightest of sleepers, and if you had a restless time, she and her husband must have been in purgatory. Besides, permit me to say, you should be with your party. The times are troublous, not for holidays. Your holiday has had a haunted look, creditably to your conscience as a politician. These corn law agitations. Ah, but no politics here, said Dacier. Politics everywhere, in the courts of fairy. They are not discord to me. But not the last day, the last hour, he pleaded. Well, only do not forget your assurance to me that you would give some thoughts to Ireland and the cause of women. Has it slipped from your memory? If I see the chance of serving you, you may trust to me. She sent up an interjection on the misfortune of her not having been born a man. It was to him the one smart of sourness in her charm as a woman. Among the boulder stones of the ascent to the path, he ventured to propose a little masculine assistance in a hand stretched mutely. Although there was no great need for help, her natural kindliness checked the inclination to refuse it. When their hands disjoined, she found herself reddening. She cast it on the exertion. Her heart was throbbing. It might be the exertion likewise. He walked and talked much more airily along the descending pathway, as if he had suddenly become more intimately acquainted with her. She listened, trying to think of the manner in which he might be taught to serve that cause she had at heart, and the colour deepened on her cheeks till it set fire to her underlying consciousness blood to spirit. A tremor of alarm ran through her. His request for one of the crocuses to keep as a souvenir of the morning was refused. They are sacred. They were all devoted to my friend when I plucked them. He pointed to a half-open one with the petals in disparting pointing to junction, and compared it to the famous tiptoe ballet posture, arms above head and fingers like swallows meeting in air, of an operatic danseuse of the time. I do not see it, because I will not see it, she said, and she found a personal cooling and consolement in the phrase. We have this power of resisting invasion of the poetic by the commonplace, the spirit by the blood, if we please, though you men may not think that we have. Her alarmed sensibilities bristled and made head against him as an enemy. She fancied, for the aforesaid reason, because she chose, that it was on account of the offence to her shy morning pleasure by this Londonizing. At any other moment her natural liveliness and trained social ease would have taken any remark on the eddies of the tide of converse. And so she told herself, and did not the less feel wounded, adverse, armed. He seemed, somehow, to have dealt a mortal blow to the happy girl she had become again. The woman she was protested on behalf of the girl while the girl in her heart bent lowered sad eyelids to the woman, and which of them was wiser of the truth she could not have said, for she was honestly not aware of the truth. But she knew she was divided in halves, with one half pitying the other, one rebuking, and all because of the incongruous comparison of a wild flower to an opera dancer. Absurd indeed! We human creatures are the silliest on earth, most certainly. Dacier had observed the blush, and the check to her flowing tongue did not escape him, 
as they walked back to the inn down the narrow street of black rooms, where the women gossiped at the fountain and the cobbler threaded on his doorstep. His novel excitement supplied the deficiency, sweeping him past minor reflections. He was, however, surprised to hear her tell Lady Escort, as soon as they were together at the breakfast table, that he had the intention of starting for England, and further surprised, and slightly stung, too, when on the poor lady's moaning over her recollection of the midnight bell, and vowing she could not attempt to sleep another night in the place, Diana declared her resolve to stay there one day longer with her maid, and explore the neighbourhood for the wild flowers in which it abounded. Lord and Lady Escort agreed to anything agreeable to her, after excusing themselves for the necessitated flight, piteously relating the story of their sufferings. My lord could have slept, but he had remained awake to comfort my lady. True knightliness, Diana said, in praise of these long-married lovers, and she asked them what they had talked of during the night. You, my dear, partly, said Lady Escort. For an opiate? An invocation of the morning, said Dacier. Lady Escort looked at Diana and at him. She thought it was well that her fair friend should stay. It was then settled for Diana to rejoin them the next evening at Lugano, thence to proceed to Luino on the Maggiore. "'I fear it is good-bye for me,' Dacier said to her, as he was about to step into the carriage with the escorts. "'If you have not better news of your uncle, it must be,' she replied, and gave him her hand promptly and formally, hardly diverting her eyes from Lady Escort to grace the temporary gift with a look. The last of her he saw was a waving of her arm and a finger pointing triumphantly at the bell in the tower. It said to an understanding unpracticed in the feminine mysteries, I can sleep through anything. What that revealed of her state of conscience and her nature, his efforts to preserve the lovely optical figure blocked his guessing. He was with her friends who liked her the more they knew her, and he was compelled to lean to their view of the perplexing woman. She is a riddle to the world, Lady Escort said, but I know that she is good. It is the best of signs when women take to her and are proud to be her friend. My lord echoed his wife. She talked in this homely manner to stop on any notion of philandering that the young gentleman might be disposed to entertain in regard to a lady so attractive to the pursuit as Diana's beauty and delicate situation might make her seem. She is an exceedingly clever person, and handsomer than report, which is uncommon, said Dacier, becoming voluble on town topics, Miss Asper incidentally among them. He denied Lady Escort's charge of an engagement. The matter hung. His letters at Lugano summoned him to England instantly. I have taken leave of Mrs. Warwick, but tell her I regret, etc., he said, and by the way, as my uncle's illness appears to be serious, the longer she is absent, the better, perhaps. It would never do, said Lady Esquart, understanding his drift immediately. We winter in Rome. She will not abandon us. I have her word for it. Next Easter we are in Paris, and so home, I suppose. There will be no hurry before we are due at Cowes. We seem to have become confirmed wanderers. For two of us, at least, it is likely to be our last great tour." Dacier informed her that he had pledged his word to write to Mrs. Warwick of his uncle's condition, and the several appointed halting-places of the escorts between the lakes and Florence were named to him. Thus all things were openly treated. All had an air of being on the surface, the communications passing between Mrs. Warwick and the Honourable Percy Dacier might have been perused by all the world. None but that portion of it, sage in suspiciousness, which objects to such communications under any circumstances, could have detected in their correspondence a spark of coming fire, or that there was common warmth. She did not feel it, nor did he. The position of the two interdicted it to a couple honourably sensible of social decencies, and who were, be it added, kept apart. The blood is the treacherous element in the story of the nobly civilised, of which secret Diana a wife and no wife, a prisoner in liberty, a blooming woman imagining herself restored to transcendent maiden ecstasies, 
the highest youthful poetic, had received some faint intimation when the blush flamed suddenly in her cheeks, and her heart knelled like the towers of a city given over to the devourer. She had no wish to meet him again. Without telling herself why, she would have shunned the meeting. Disturbers that thwarted her simple happiness in sublime scenery were best avoided. She thought so the more for a fitful blur to the simplicity of her sensations, and a task she sometimes had in restoring and toning them after that sweet morning time in Rovio. End of chapter 16「Chapter seventeen of Diana of the Crossways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter seventeen. The Princess Egeria. london say what we will of it is after all the head of the british giant and if not the liveliest in bubbles it is past competition the largest broth pot of brains anywhere simmering on the hob over the steadiest of furnaces too and the oceans and the continents as you know are perpetual and copious contributors either to the heating apparatus or to the contents of the pot let grander similes be sought this one fits for the smoky receptacle cherishing millions magnetic to tens of millions more with its caked outside of grime and the inward substance incessantly kicking the lid prankish but never casting it off a good stew you perceive not a parlous boiling weak as we may be in our domestic cookery our political has been sagaciously adjusted as yet to catch the ardours of the furnace without being subject to their volcanic activities that the social is also somewhat at fault we have proof in occasional outcries over the absence of these or those particular persons famous for inspiriting it sticks and clogs the improvising songster is missed the convivial essayist the humorous dean the travelled cynic and he the one of his day the iridescent irishman whose remembered repartees are a feast sharp and ringing at divers tables descending from the upper to the fat citizens where instead of coming in the sequence of talk they are exposed by blasting like fossil teeth of old deluge sharks in monotonous walls of our chalk quarries nor are these the less welcome for the violence of their introduction among a people glad to be set burning rather briskly a while by the most unexpected of digs in the ribs dan marion to give an example that was dan marion's joke with the watchman and he said that other thing to the marquis of kingsbury when the latter asked him if he had ever won a donkey race and old dan is dead and we are the duller for it which leads to the question is genius hereditary and the affirmative and negative are respectively maintained rather against the yes is the dispute until a member of the audience speaks of dan marion's having left a daughter reputed for a sparkling wit not much below the level of his own why are you unaware that the mrs warwick of that scandal case of warwick versus dannisburg was old dan marion's girl and his only child it is true for a friend had it from a man who had it straight from mr braddock of the firm of braddock thorpe and simnel her solicitors in the action who told him he could sit listening to her for hours and that she was as innocent as day a wonderful combination of a good woman and a clever woman and a real beauty 
only her misfortune was to have a furiously jealous husband and they say he went mad after hearing the verdict diana was talked of in the london circles a witty woman is such salt that where she has once been tasted she must perforce be missed more than any of the absent the dowering heavens not having yet showered her like very plentifully upon us then it was first heard that percy dacier had been travelling with her miss asper heard of it her uncle mr quintin manx the millionaire was an acquaintance of the new judge and titled dignitary sir cramborne wathin and she visited lady wathin at whose table the report in the journals of the nile boat party was mentioned lady wathin's table could dispense with witty women and for that matter witty men the intrusion of the spontaneous on the stereotyped would have clashed she preferred as hostess the old legal anecdotes sure of their laugh and the citations from the manufactories of fun in the press which were current and instantly intelligible to all her guests she smiled suavely on an impromptu pun because her experience of the humorous appreciation of it by her guests bade her welcome the upstart nothing else impromptu was acceptable mrs warwick therefore was not missed by lady wathin i have met her she said i confess i am not one of the fanatics about mrs warwick she has a sort of skill in getting men to clamour if you stoop to tickle them they will applaud it is a way of winning a reputation when the ladies were separated from the gentlemen by the stream of claret miss asper heard lady wathin speak of mrs warwick again an allusion to lord dannisburgh's fit of illness in the house of lords led to her saying that there was no doubt he had been fascinated and that in her opinion mrs warwick was a dangerous woman sir cramborne knew something of mr warwick poor man she added a lady present put a question concerning mrs warwick's beauty yes lady wathin said she has good looks to aid her judging from what i hear and have seen her thirst is for notoriety sooner or later we shall have her making a noise you may be certain yes she has the secret of dressing well in the french style a simple newspaper report of the expedition of a nile boat party could stir the powers to take her up and turn her on their wheel in this manner but others of the sons and daughters of london were regretting her prolonged absence the great and exclusive whitmanby who had dined once at lady wathin's table and vowed never more to repeat that offence to his patients lamented bitterly to henry wilmers that the sole woman worthy of sitting at a little sunday evening dinner with the cream of the choicest men of the time was away wasting herself in that insane modern chase of the picturesque he called her a perverted selimini redworth had less to regret than the rest of her male friends as he was receiving at intervals pleasant descriptive letters besides manuscript sheets of antonia's new piece of composition to correct the proofs for the press and he read them critically he thought he read them with a watchful eye to guard them from the critics antonia whatever her faults as a writer was not one of the order whose muse is the public taste she did at least draw her inspiration from herself and there was much to be feared in her work if a sale was the object otherwise redworth's highly critical perusal led him flatly to admire this was like her and that was like her and here and there a phrase gave him the very play of her mouth the flash of her eyes could he possibly wish or bear to have anything altered but she had reason to desire an extended sale of the work her aim in the teeth of her independent style was at the means of independence a feminine 
method of attempting to conciliate contraries and after dispatching the last sheets to the printer he meditated upon the several ways which might serve to assist her the main way running thus in his mind we have a work of genius genius is good for the public what is good for the public should be recommended by the critics it should be how then to come at them to get it done as he was not a member of the honourable literary craft and regarded its arcana altogether externally it may be confessed of him that he deemed the incorruptible corruptible not of course with filthy coin slid into sticky palms critics are human and exceedingly beyond the common lot when touched and they are excited by mysterious hints of loftiness in authorship by rumours of veiled loveliness whispers of a general anticipation and also editors can jog them redworth was rising to be a railway king of a period soon to glitter with rails iron in the concrete golden in the visionary he had already his court much against his will the powerful magnetic attractions of those who can help the world to fortune was exercised by him in spite of his disgust of sycophants he dropped words to right and left of a coming work by antonia and who was antonia ah there hung the riddle an exalted personage so much so that he dared not name her even in confidence to ladies he named the publishers to men he said he was at liberty to speak of her only as the most beautiful woman of her time his courtiers of both sexes were recommended to read the new story the princess egeria oddly one great lady of his court had heard a forthcoming work of this title spoken of by percy dacier not a man to read silly fiction unless there was meaning behind the lines that is rich scandal of the aristocracy diversified by stinging epigrams to the address of discernible personages she talked of the princess egeria nay laid her finger on the identical princess others followed her dozens were soon flying with the torch a new work immediately to be published from the pen of the duchess of stars and the princess who lends her title to the book is a living portrait of the princess of highest eminence the hope of all civilization orders for copies of the princess egeria reached the astonished publishers before the book was advertised speaking to editors redworth complimented them with friendly intimations of the real authorship of the remarkable work appearing he used a certain penetrative mildness of tone in saying that he hoped the book would succeed it deserved to it was original but the originality might tell against it all would depend upon a favourable launching of such a book mrs warwick mrs warwick said the most influential of editors mr marcus tonans what that singularly handsome woman the dannisburg affair she's whitmonby's heroine if she writes as cleverly as she talks her work is worth trumpeting he promised to see that it went into good hands for the review and a prompt review an essential point none of your long digestions of the contents diana's indefatigable friend had fair assurances that her book would be noticed before it dropped dead to the public appetite for novelty he was anxious next notwithstanding his admiration of the originality of the conception and the cleverness of the writing lest the literary reviews should fail to do it justice he used the term for if they wounded her they would take the pleasure out of success and he had always present to him that picture of the beloved woman kneeling at the fire grate at the crossways which made the thought of her suffering any wound his personal anguish so crucially sweet and saintly had her image then been stamped on him 
he bethought him in consequence while sitting in the house of commons engaged upon the affairs of the nation and honestly engaged for he was a vigilant worker that the irish secretary charles razor with whom he stood in amicable relations had an interest to the extent of reputed ownership in the chief of the literary reviews he saw razor on the benches and marked him to speak for him looking for him shortly afterward the man was gone off to the opera if he is not too late for the drop a neighbor said smiling queerly as though he ought to know and then redworth recollected current stories of razor's fantastical devotion to the popular prima donna of the angelical voice he hurried to the opera and met the vomit and heard in the crush room how divine she had been that night a fellow member of the house tolerably intimate with razor informed him between frightful stomachic roulades of her final aria of the likeliest place where razor might be found when the opera was over not at his club nor at his chambers on one of the bridges westminster he fancied there was no need for redworth to run hunting the man at so late an hour but he was drawn on by the similarity in dissimilarity of this devotee of a woman who could worship her at a distance and talk of her to everybody not till he beheld razor's tall figure cutting the bridge parapet with a star over his shoulder did he reflect on the views the other might entertain of the nocturnal solicitation to see justice done to a lady's new book in a particular review and the absurd outside of the request was immediately smothered by the natural simplicity and pressing necessity of its inside he crossed the road and said ah in recognition were you at the opera this evening oh just at the end said razor pacing forward it's a fine night did you hear her no too late razor pressed ahead to meditate by himself as was his wont finding redworth beside him he monologized in his depths they'll kill her she puts her soul into it gives her blood there's no failing of the voice you see how it wears her she's doomed half a year's rest on como somewhere she might be saved she won't refuse to work have you spoken to her said redworth and next to berlin vienna a horse would be i i don't know her razor replied some of their women stand it she's delicately built you can't treat a lute like a drum without destroying the instrument we look on at a murder the haggard prospect from that step of the climax checked his delivery redworth knew him to be a sober man in office a man with a head for statecraft he had made a weighty speech in the house a couple of hours back this opera catentrice no beauty though gentle thrilling winning was his corner of romance do you come here often he asked yes i can't sleep london at night from the bridge looks fine by the way it's lonely here that's the advantage said rayner i keep silver in my pocket for poor girls going to their homes and i'm left in peace an hour later there's the dawn down yonder by the way redworth interposed and was told that after these nights of her singing she never slept till morning he swallowed the fact sympathized and resumed i want a small favour no business here please not a bit of it you know mrs warwick you know of her she's publishing a book i want you to use your influence to get it noticed quickly if you can warwick oh yes a handsome woman ah yes the dannisburgh affair yes what did i hear they say she's thick with percy dacier at present who was talking of her yes old lady dacier so she's a friend of yours she's an old friend said redworth composing himself for the dose he had taken was not of the sweetest and no protestations could be uttered by a man of the world to repel a charge of tattlers the truth is her book is clever 
i have read the proofs she must have an income and she won't apply to her husband and literature should help her if she's fairly treated she's irish by descent marion's daughter witty as her father it's odd you haven't met her the mere writing of the book is extraordinarily good if it's put into capable hands for review that's all it requires and full of life bright dialogue capital sketches the book's a piece of literature only it must have competent critics so he talked while rayner ejaculated warwick warwick in the irritating tone of dozens of others what did i hear of her husband he has a post yes yes some one said the verdict in that case knocked him over heart disease or something he glanced at the dark thames water take my word for it the groves of academe won't compare with one of our bridges at night if you seek philosophy you see the london above and the london below round us the sleepy city and the stars in the water looking like souls of suicides i caught a girl with a bad fit on her once i had to lecture her it's when we become parsons we find out our cousinship with these poor peripatetics whose last philosophy is a jump across the parapet the bridge at night is a bath for a public man but choose another leave me mine redworth took the hint he stated the title of mrs warwick's book and imagined from the thoughtful cast of rayner's head that he was impressing the princess egeria on his memory rayner burst out with clenched fists he beats her the fellow lives on her and beats her strikes that woman he drags her about to every capital in europe to make money for him and the scoundrel pays her with blows in the course of a heavy tirade against the scoundrel redworth apprehended that it was the cantatrice's husband he expressed his horror and regret paused and named the princess egeria and a certain critical review another outburst seemed to be in preparation nothing further was to be done for the book at that hour so with a blunt good-night he left charles rayner pacing and thought on his walk home of the strange effects wrought by women unwittingly upon men englishmen those women or some of them as little knowing it as the moon her traditional influence upon the tides he thought of percy dacier too in his bed he could have wished himself peregrinating a bridge the princess egeria appeared with the reviews at her heels a pack of clappers causing her to fly over editions clean as a doe the gates and hedges to quote mr sullivan smith who knew not a sentence of the work save what he gathered of it from redworth at their chance meeting on piccadilly pavement and then immediately he knew enough to blow his huntsman's horn in honour of the sale his halali rang high here's another irish girl to win their laurels tis one of the blazing successes a most enthralling work beautifully composed and where is she now mr redworth since she broke away from that husband of hers that wears the clothes of the worst tailor ever begotten by a thread on a needle as i tell every soul of em in my part of the country you have seen him said redworth why sir wasn't he on show at the court he applied to for relief and damages as we heard when we were watching the case daily scarce drawing our breath for fear the innocent and one of our own blood would be crushed sure there he stood ay and looking the very donkey for a woman to flip off her fingers like the dust from my great-uncle's prize of snuff she's a glory to the old country and better you than another i'd say since it wasn't an irishman to have her but what induced the dear lady to take him is the question we're all of us asking and it's mournful to think that somehow you contrive to get the pick of us in the girls if ever we're united twill be by a trick of circumvention of that sort pretty sure there's a turn in the market when they shut their eyes and drop to the handiest 
and london's a vortex that poor dear dull old dublin can't compete with i'll beg you for the address of the lady her friend lady dunstane mr sullivan smith walked with redworth through the park to the house of commons discoursing of rails and his excellent old friend's rise to the top rung of the ladder and beanstalk land so elevated that one had to look up at him with watery eyes as if one had flung a ball at the meridian sun arrived at famed st stephen's he sent in his compliments to the noble patriot and accepted an invitation to dinner and mind you read the princess egeria said redworth again and again my friend the book is bought sullivan smith slapped his breast-pocket there's a bit of aaron in it it sprouts from aaron trumpet it loud as cavalry to the charge once with the title stamped on his memory the zealous irishman might be trusted to become an ambulant advertiser others personal friends adherents courtiers of redworth's were active lady pennon and henry wilmers in the upper circle whitmanby and westlake in the literary spread the fever for this new book the chief interpreter of public opinion caught the way of the wind and headed the gale editions of the book did really run like fires in summer furs and to such an extent that a simple literary performance grew to be respected in great britain as representing money End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of diana of the crossways this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Diana of the Crossways by George Meredith. Chapter 18 The Authoress. The effect of a great success upon Diana at her second literary venture was shown in the transparent sedateness of a letter she wrote to emma dunstane as much as in her immediate and complacent acceptance of the magical change of her fortunes she spoke one thing and acted another but did both with a lofty calm that deceived the admiring friend who clearly saw the authoress behind her mask and feared lest she should be too confidently trusting to the powers of her pen to support an establishment if the public were a perfect instrument to strike on i should be tempted to take the wonderful success of my princess at her first appearance for a proof of natural aptitude in composition and might think myself the genius i know it to be as little a stradivarius as i am a paganini it is an eccentric machine in tune with me for the moment because i happen to have hit it in the ringing spot the book is a new face appealing to a mirror of the common surface emotions and the kitchen rather than the dairy offers an analogy for the real value of that top skim i have not seen what i consider good in the book once mentioned among the laudatory notices except by your dear hand my emmy be sure i will stand on guard against the vaporous generalizations and other tricks you fear now that you are studying latin for an occupation how good and wise it was of mr redworth to propose it i look upon you with awe as a classic authority and critic i wish i had leisure to study with you what i do is nothing like so solid and durable the princess egeria originally i must have written word of it to you i remember the evening off palermo was conceived as a sketch by gradations she grew into a sort of semi scudery romance and swelled to her present portliness that was done by a great deal of piecing not to say puffing of her frame she would be healthier and have a chance of living longer if she were reduced by a reversal of the processes but how would the judicious clippings and prickings affect our pensive public now that i have furnished a house and have a fixed address under the paws of creditors i feel i am in the wizard circle of my popularity and subscribe to its laws or waken to incubus and the desert 
have i been rash you do not pronounce if i have bound myself to pipe as others please it need not be entirely and i can promise you it shall not be but still i am sensible when i lift my little quill of having forced the note of a woodland wren into the popular nightingales which may end in the daws from straining or worse a toy whistle that is in the field of literature otherwise within me deep i am not aware of any transmutation of the celestial into coined gold i sound myself and ring clear incessant writing is my refuge my solace escape out of the personal net i delight in it as in my early morning walks at lugano when i went threading the streets and by the lake away to the heavenly mount like a dim idea worming upward in a sleepy head to bright wakefulness my anonymous critic of whom i told you is intoxicating with eulogy the signature apollonius appears to be of literary middle indication he marks passages approved by you i have also had a complimentary letter from mr dacier for an instance of this delight i have in writing so strong is it that i can read pages i have written and tear the stuff to strips i did yesterday and resume as if nothing had happened the waves within are ready for any displacement that must be a good sign i do not doubt of excelling my princess and if she received compliments the next may hope for more consider too the novel pleasure of earning money by the labour we delight in it is an answer to your question whether i am happy yes as the savage islander before the ship entered the bay with the fire-water my blood is wine and i have the slumbers of an infant i dream wake forget my dream barely dress before the pen is galloping barely breakfast no toilette till noon a savage in good sooth you see my emmy i could not house with the companionable person you hint at the poles can never come together till the earth is crushed she would find my habits intolerable and i hers contemptible though we might both be companionable persons my dear i could not even live with myself my blessed little quill which helps me divinely to live out of myself is and must continue to be my one companion it is my mountain height morning light wings cup from the springs my horse my goal my lancet and replenisher my key of communication with the highest grandest holiest between earth and heaven the vital air connecting them in justice let me add that i have not been troubled by hearing of any of the mysterious legal claims etc i am sorry to hear bad reports of health i wish him entire felicity no step taken to bridge division the thought of it makes me tigrish a new pianist playing his own pieces at lady singleby's concert has given me exquisite pleasure and set me composing songs not to his music which could be rendered only by sylphs moving to soft recorders in the humour of wildness languor bewitching caprices giving a new sense to melody how i wish you had been with me to hear him it was the most aeolian thing ever caught from a night breeze by the soul of a poet but do not suppose me having headlong tendencies to the melting mood the above by the way is a pole settled in paris and he is to be introduced to me at lady pennon's what do you say to my being invited by mr whitmanby to aid him in writing leading articles for the paper he is going to conduct write as you talk and it will do he says i am choosing my themes to write of politics as i talk seems to me like an effort to jump away from my shadow the black dog of consciousness declines to be shaken off if some one commanded me to talk as i write i suspect it would be a way of winding me up to a sharp critical pitch rapidly not good news of lord d i've had messages mr dacier conceals his alarm the princess gave great gratification she did me her best service there is it not cruel that the interdict of the censor should force me to depend for information upon such scraps as i get from a gentleman passing my habitation on his way to the house and he is not he never has been sympathetic in that direction he sees my grief and assumes an undertakerly air with some notion of acting in concert 
one supposes little imagining how i revolt from that crape hat-band formalism of sorrow one word of her we call our inner eye i am not drawing upon her resources for my daily needs not wasting her at all i trust certainly not walling her up to deafen her voice it would be to fall away from you she bids me sign myself my beloved ever ever your tony the letter had every outward show of sincereness in expression and was endowed to wear that appearance by the writer's impulse to protest with so resolute a vigour as to delude herself lady dunstane heard of mr dacier's novel attendance at concerts the world made a note of it for the gentleman was notoriously without ear for music diana's comparison of her hours of incessant writing to her walks under the dawn at lugano her boast of the similarity of her delight in both deluded her uncorrupted conscience to believe that she was now spiritually as free as in that fair season of the new spring in her veins she was not an investigating physician nor was lady dunstane otherwise they would have examined the material points of her conduct indicators of the spiritual secret always what are the patient's acts the patient's mind was projected too far beyond them to see the forefinger they stretched at her and the friend's was not that of a prying doctor on the lookout for betraying symptoms lady dunstane did ask herself why tony should have incurred the burden of a costly household a very costly sir lucan had been at one of tony's little dinners but her wish to meet the world on equal terms after a long dependency accounted for it in seeming to excuse the guests on the occasion were lady pennon lady singleby mr whitmanby mr percy dacier mr tonans some other woman sir lucan said and himself he reported the cookery as matching the conversation and that was princely the wines not less an extraordinary fact to note of a woman but to hear whitmanby and diana warwick how he told a story neat as a postman's knock and she tipped it with a remark and ran to a second drawing in lady pennon and then dacier and me cried sir lucan she made us all toss the ball from hand to hand and all talk up to the mark and none of us noticed that we all went together to the drawing-room where we talked for another hour and broke up fresher than we began that break between the men and the women after dinner was tony's aversion and i am glad she has instituted a change said lady dunstane she heard also from redworth of the unexampled concert of the guests at mrs warwick's dinner parties he had met on one occasion the esquarts the pettigrews mr percy dacier and a miss paynham redworth had not a word to say of the expensive household whatever mrs warwick did was evidently good to him on another evening the party was composed of lady pennon lord larian miss paynham a clever mrs woolsley mr henry wilmers and again mr percy dacier when diana came to copsley lady dunstane remarked on the recurrence of the name of miss paynham in the list of her guests and mr percy dacier's too said diana smiling they are invited each for specific reasons it pleases lord dannisburg to hear that a way has been found to enliven his nephew and my little dinners are effective i think he wakes yesterday evening he capped flying jests with mr sullivan smith but you speak of miss paynham diana lowered her voice on half a dozen syllables till the half-tones dropped into her steady look you approve emmy the answer was i do true or not between us two dear i fear in either case she has been badly used society is big engine enough to protect itself i incline with british juries to do rough justice to the victims she has neither father nor brother i have had no confidences but it wears the look of a cowardly business with two words in his ear i could arm an irishman to do some work of chastisement he would select the rascal's necktie for a cause of quarrel and lords have to stand their ground as well as commoners they measure the same number of feet when stretched their length 
however vengeance with the heavens though they seem tardy lady pennon has been very kind about it and the esquarts invite her to lockton shoulder to shoulder the tide may be stemmed she would have gone under but for you dear tony said emma folding arms round her darling's neck and kissing her bring her here some day diana did not promise it she had her vision of sir lucan in his fit of lunacy i am too weak for london now emma resumed i should like to be useful is she pleasant sprightly by nature she has worn herself with fretting then bring her to stay with me if i cannot keep you she will talk of you to me i will bring her for a couple of days diana said i am too busy to remain longer she paints portraits to amuse herself she ought to be pushed wherever she is received about london while the season is warm one season will suffice to establish her she's pretty near upon six-and-twenty foolish of course she pays for having had a romantic head heavy payment emmy i drive at laws but hers is an instance of the creature's wanting simple human kindness the good law will come with a better civilization but before society can be civilized it has to be debarbarized emma remarked and diana sighed over the task and the truism i should have said in younger days because it will not look plainly on our nature and try to reconcile it with our conditions but now i see that the sin is cowardice the more i know of the world the more clearly i perceive that its top and bottom sin is cowardice physically and morally alike lord larian owns to there being few heroes in an army we must fawn in society what is the meaning of that dread of one example of tolerance oh my dear let us give it the right name society is the best thing we have but it is a crazy vessel worked by a crew that formerly practised piracy and now in expiation professes piety fearful of a discovered omnipotence which is in the image of themselves and captain their old habits are not quite abandoned and their new one is used as a lash to whip the exposed of us for a propitiation of the capricious potentate whom they worship in the place of the true god lady dunstane sniffed i smell the leading article diana joined with her smile no the style is rather different have you not got into a trick of composing and speaking at times diana confessed i think i have at times perhaps the daily writing of all kinds and the nightly talking i may be getting strained no tony but longer visits in the country to me would refresh you i miss your lighter touches london is a school but you know it not a school for comedy nor for philosophy that is gathered on my hills with london distantly in view and then occasional descents on it well digested i wonder whether it is affecting me said diana musing a metropolitan hack and while thinking myself free thrice harnessed and all my fun gone am i really as dull as a tract my dear i must be or i should be proving the contrary instead of asking my pitfall is to fancy i have powers equal to the first lookout of the eyes of the morning enough of me we talked of mary paynham if only some right good man would marry her lady dunstane guessed at the right good man in diana's mind do you bring them together diana nodded and then shook doleful negatives to signify no hope none whatever if we mean the same person said lady dunstane bethinking her in the spirit of wrath she felt at such a scheme being planned by diana to snare the right good man that instead of her own true lover redworth it might be only percy dacier so filmy of mere sensations are these little ideas as they flit in converse that she did not reflect on her friend's ignorance of redworth's love of her or on the unlikely choice of one in dacier's high station to reinstate a damsel they did not name the person passing the instance which is cruel i will be just to society thus far said diana i was in a boat at richmond last week and leander was revelling along the mud-banks and took it into his head to swim out to me and i was moved to take him on board the ladies in the boat objected for he was not only wet but very muddy i was forced to own that their objections were reasonable my sentimental humaneness had no argument against muslin dresses though my dear dog's eyes appealed pathetically and he would keep swimming after us 
the analogy excuses the world for protecting itself in extreme cases nothing nothing excuses its insensibility to cases which may be pleaded you see the pirate crew turned pious ferocious in sanctity she added half laughing i am reminded by the boat i have unveiled my anonymous critic and had a woeful disappointment he wrote like a veteran he is not much more than a boy i received a volume of verse and a few lines begging my acceptance i fancied i knew the writing and wrote asking him whether i had not to thank him and inviting him to call he seems a nice lad of about two-and-twenty mad for literature and he must have talent arthur rhodes by name i may have a chance of helping him he was an article clerk of mr braddock's the same who valiantly came to my rescue once he was with us in the boat bring him to me some day said lady dunstane miss paynham's visit to copsley was arranged and it turned out a failure the poor young lady came in a flutter thinking that the friend of mrs warwick would expect her to discourse cleverly she attempted it to diana's amazement lady dunstane's opposingly corresponding stillness provoked miss paynham to expatiate for she had sprightliness and some mental reserves of the common order clearly lady dunstane mused while listening amiably tony never could have designed this gabbler for the mate of thomas redworth percy dacier seemed to her the more likely one in that light and she thought so still after sir lucan had introduced him at copsley for a couple of days of the hunting season tony's manner with him suggested it she had a dash of leadership they were not intimate in look or tongue but percy dacier also was too good for miss paynham if that was tony's plan for him lady dunstane thought with the relentlessness of an invalid and recluse's distaste an aspect of penitence she had not demanded but the silly gabier under a stigma she could not pardon her opinion of miss paynham was diffused in her silence speaking of mr dacier she remarked as you say of him tony he can brighten and when you give him a chance he is entertaining he has fine gifts if i were a member of his family i should beat about for a match for him he strikes me as one of the young men who would do better married he is doing very well but the wonder is that he doesn't marry said diana he ought to be engaged lady esquart told me that he was a miss asper great heiress and the dacier's want money however there it is not many weeks later diana could not have spoken of mr percy dacier with this air of indifference without corruption of her inward guide End of chapter eighteen